Please be seated, everybody. This is case number 2018 CA5321, Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital versus, sorry, excuse me, Jack Kowalski, et cetera, et al. versus Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Let's uh, take mm -hmm. appearances starting with the plaintiffs, please. Uh, Greg Anderson, Nick Whitney on behalf of the plaintiffs. I'm sorry, this is <laughs> Maybe Miss Lawrence should be the one introducing everybody. Howard Hunter, Pat Crowell, Sophie Shapiro, and David Hughes, and all that. John Sopkins, all from the hospital. Just uh, for everyone's planning purposes, I have meetings at lunch today, Friday, Monday. So each of those three days that I know of right now will have to end right before noon. Your, Your Honor, we're talking um, about exhibits, right? Yes, but before we do exhibits, the defense would like to move for reconsideration of the court's ruling yesterday, allotting four additional hours to each side. Uh, the basis of the motion is the prejudice that's going to result in the defense. And to lay this out, the defense has respected what this court's admonition has been for the weeks leading up to trial, that each side was going to have 55 hours that would include direct cross and rebuttal. The court made it very clear to both parties, in fairness to this court, that that was also going to include a division of jury questions. And to the great credit of this court, this court gave the shot clock every single day to both sides about where we were so there would be no surprises. The defense, in reliance on that, did their best. We did our best to give expedited cross-examinations, including a relatively brief cross-examination of Dr. Duncan, who had four reports with underlying assessments a relatively briefer cross-examination of the economist who had multiple report, reports, a relatively brief cross-examination of Dr. Bifolco, who had two different reports and also had <coughs> categories for each relating to different illnesses that I intentionally expedited to save ourselves time on direct for the witnesses we needed. We cut down our cross-examination of Dr. Chopra, including uh, not going deep into his credentials, even though he misrepresented his connections to Harvard, we shortened our cross-examination of Dr. Kirkpatrick, and even when our case began, we cut down several designations of Bonnie Rice in order to make sure we had enough time. Uh, the, the plaintiff was well aware of the shot clock, and instead of resting when the court was looking at them to rest, they continued to call witnesses that we believe to be extraneous to their case, including multiple people from the church, Facebook friends with no real relation to this case, and at the end of their case before resting, a relative of the Kowalskis who testified through a Polish language translator. They made their strategic decisions on the order, and only after they rested did they ask for additional time. While we appreciate that the court allotted additional time to both sides, the prejudice to the defense is we cannot go back and recreate cross. The net effect of this is that plaintiff has four additional hours to cross-examine witnesses that the defense doesn't have. And due to that prejudice, we would ask the court to reconsider its ruling and go back to the 55 hours per side. Thank yeah, you. The court's going to deny the reconsideration. Certainly, the court has been, and you can sit down now, uh, the court has been um, very cognizant of the time issues. Uh, to the credit of this jury, this jury has been extremely active in asking questions, which, of course, has generated uh, additional questions from both sides. Um, I think it's appropriate at, at this time. I, I hear what you're saying. If you wish to call Dr. Duncan and some of these other folks to ask them additional questions, you are free to do it because you also got an additional four hours uh, defense. So, um, you know, I, I don't see it as any sort of prejudice. Um, I think it's appropriate given the uh, length of time of those jury questions, and uh, that's my decision. What's okay. next? And if you're on this briefly, to, because I do need to perfect the record on this. You, you've already spent five minutes talking on this issue, and, and the whole point coming early was to talk about exhibits. I'll just, I'll merely note that we have to move for mistrial as we have the time decisions are rendered, so the defense moves for a mistrial on that basis. 
you're moving for a mis. I just want to make sure I'm understanding. You're moving for a mistrial when you got additional time and you can call the same witnesses to address whatever issues. That is that what you're saying? Yes, Your Honor. Because okay, we don't. Okay. Can we go to exhibits, please? Yes. Thank you, um, Judge. We really want to get some medical records into evidence. We have not received any specific additional objections. We just gave the court our re. Uh, there's no new exhibits listed. Uh, there are the ones we've been trying to get. In. So we would like to start with 3032. 3032. Lori Children's Hospital Records. And what's the objection? Uh, before this, uh, Judge, you may recall, just one on, on the motion for cur curative or can, can we stick with exhibits? I, like I said yesterday, I need to trim our sales. We need to stay on topic. Exhibits. I understand, Judge. This is designed to do exactly what you told us to do Tuesday morning. You ask us, because of the difficulty of all of these individual piecemealing objections to hearsay within hearsay and experts that are not experts, we put together a curative instruction, and it's not even really that. It's a 301.5 evidence admitted for a limited purpose, and the purpose was we don't have to get into that. They can move these things in wholesale as long as there's an instruction so that the jury does not take a, a doctor or a nurse who may have random comments in the record and attribute to them the uh, as though they were experts on the topic. And I don't know if the court had a chance to review it or not. I have a copy of it here. I don't know what you're talking about. Judge. May I approach? Judge, they filed this late last night. We haven't filed a written response, but they want some overall arching curative instruction as opposed to doing what the court asked them to do which was to identify which pages and, and sections of this record they object to. Okay. So this was filed last night. I honestly don't think I've seen this. This still hasn't been docketed yet. specific, we need to move the Larry Child's hospital records in. What's the objection? Hearsay contains unqualified expert opinion, uh, quasi-expert opinion. Um, I think, uh, and hearsay, mostly hearsay within hearsay. Is there those comments may contain therein that are not for medical treatment. The other day, you said that you had a list of documents that you were concerned about. Is there something specific, or is it just this generalized statement? Uh, Judge, I think that we were hoping to have a, some form of generalized uh, objection based on that, or a curative instruction that would limit our only concerns, and then we wouldn't have to go through all of these. It was impossible over the course of the evening to go through every single one of them. We understand the court's position on this and we'll accept the court's ruling wherever it is. The court's going to let in the, the medical records from Lurie's, which is 3032, is that pages 1 through 249? Is that the complete? Uh, I, it is. My understanding it's the complete record, Your Honor, 3032. Okay. What's next? 3047, Tampa General Hospital, 73015 admission. And that's 1 through 1,148? That's correct. Anything uh, specific about this or just your generalized statement that you just made with respect to Lori's? Uh, in particular, the comments that Bonnie Rice contained uh, within where she was, uh, and we, we can go through it, but we need 24 hours. I, if it could be admitted with the proviso that we'd be able to come back we understand that we over our objection of hearsay within hearsay and unqualified expert opinion or opinion preparing to be expert, then what we can do is come back because there are a number of, quote, opinions by Bonnie Rice who's not a medical doctor and they're not to a regional medical probability, nor could they. I delayed from Tuesday when this issue was addressed to give you time, so I'm not going to 
further delay. So uh, court will go ahead and receive 3047, the entirety, which apparently is going through 1,448. Thank you. Going back to the first page, Judge. Um, 3023, Arnold Arnold Hospital. Is this the complete set? That's my understanding. Mr. Whitney, are you taking this one? Yes, Your Honor. We do have specific objections within this record for hearsay within the record and 403. I can point the court to the pages. Uh, the first is at 3023-0003. If we can put it up. If you want to just need to turn it on. The screens are off. Let me cycle it again, but... It's... It's, it's over to his feed. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's on. Thank you. Three zero three two. Three zero three two three. Two and then three. Page. Sorry. I'm sorry. Three zero two three. Page three. Thank you. If you could, could if you could highlight the history of present illness and pull that up to its larger clues. Your Honor, within this entry here, about three quarters of the way down, the, sense, the line begins, the pediatric intensive care unit because part of her home pain regimen consists of ketamine infusion. Our objection to this record is that this theme is throughout the Arnold Palmer record, <coughs> this mistake, this inaccuracy. There was never a home pain regimen consisting of ketamine infusions. So, with respect to this sentence, we would just redact home. It's true that her pain regimen consisted of ketamine infusions, but other than the resident and Arnold Palmer that got this wrong, there's no evidence in the record that these ketamine infusions ever occurred at the Kowalski home. Yes. <clears throat> so, we, it would be uh, highly, prejudicial. highly prejudicial to allow these records in and allow them to carry this theme forward. There, we, we have evidence in the notes, the personal notes that Mr. Kowalski authenticated on the stand where Mrs. Kowalski wrote she was giving IV ketamine at home through the court. Uh, we intend to admit that record. We have the doctor that will come and testify uh, either by video or live to these notes. We also have evidence in Dr. Hanna's records that he had Mrs. Kowalski sign a contract to not put ketamine IV through the port. So these are absolutely, this is not a, a one-off. This is part of a theme that is part of the defense's theme. They were certainly welcome to call this witness across Who the is going to testify that there was actually uh, ketamine infusion at home? Who is going to testify? Dr. Brandon Alexander. Okay. And, and who? Dr. Dr. Brandon Alexander is the resident I'm referring to, that Arnold Palmer, who had this one interaction and put this down in his record. He has no basis. As a general statement, a, the question of ketamine infusion at home has been something that's been percolating for years, and every single time I, I try to get actual direct testimony, it always seems to be a, a hearsay basis for this. So unless and until there's actually someone that comes and testifies. I, I, I am thinking I've got a 403 issue because... Um, well, Judge, well, we can then hold this back for now, this exhibit, and, and uh, after the testimony to come in, revisit. But in, unless I get somebody who's going to come in and says this... Okay, we the, understand, the, Judge. The reference to home ketamine uh, infusions is not coming in. Well, we, we will not ask that this admit, this particular exhibit be admitted at this time. What's next? Uh, we would like to put in 3001 and... Maybe we should, I'm sorry, maybe we should start with 3002 since they're related. 3002, the consent for... 
thought the consent was already in. No, Judge, uh, I don't believe 3002 is in. The, the hospital records are in, but they wouldn't agree to this part, this page of the hospital record. This was March summer. This is just Mr. Kowalski's signature. I, I mean, what is... This is the, the consent that they signed when they came into the hospital, Judge. Uh, it's part of the hospital records. Plaintiffs would not agree to be part of the joint exhibit of the hospital records. Well, well I, I have no problem in, in the consent's going to come in, but where, where's the first page that I, I would normally would see, and why isn't this all together? Well... If we're talking about the consent, it's the paragraph that talks about diagnostic treatment. Yeah, there is. It's on four pages. It's on page two, Judge. This is four pages. Okay, so the first page is the signature page. Can you go back to one? It's in reverse order, Judge. So it starts oh. out, then it goes all the way down. Oh. Number one is the signature, which would be the last page. Sorry for butting in. Okay, so 3002 is the full record. No, it goes to four. But yes, yes, it's the full record. It's four pages. Can I see three and four, please? It's, it's oh. because, and the reason it's backwards, Judge, is because the hospital, that's how they do the hospital records. They oh. come in. So, so the clerk, you're telling me 3002, page two is in. Correct. So um, what's the objection to pages one, three, and four? This has to do with a release and the stretching of something that has absolutely nothing to do with our issues, which are the photographs and the 48 hours separation. This is Mr. Kowalski's signature on it is an correct. admission document. I believe so. Yeah. I, this is relevant. It's coming in. Um, so the court will receive the totality of 3002. Your Honor, please uh, note we would like at some point argument on uh, the terms of this agreement because those would be within the purview of the court as the construction of the contract and its applicability to these circumstances given the fact that they're not <laughs> medical Jansen, records. I think I've said if you're asking for a instruction as to the, the contract, that seems like a jury instruction and you... Your, your side can ask for a special jury instruction on it. I understand that. Uh, 3001. What is this? It's the notice of privacy practice referenced in the 10716 consent. And it's four pages. Can I see pages two through four? Haven't we already seen this in heaven? I feel like this is already. I don't know, Judge. They all look alike at this point. I don't. I don't uh, have a call. This going in. Is there any? I, I mean, anything from the plaintiffs on this one? Well, Your Honor, we would just reserve on having a, an additional instruction here. It, the the purpose of this, from the defense's point of view, is. They believe this gives them carte blanche to bring in Sally Smith outside of any uh, investigation, and so that's that's how they're going to try to use this. So we'll try to craft an instruction. Was this document given to your client? <laughs> the signature on the page would indicate it was on the previous exhibit. It's relevant. It's coming in. Court receives three zero zero one, which I understand is just pages one through four. 3027 Elmhurst Memorial Hospital Records. What were the dates of admission or service? 20, it's, uh, 2013 to 2014. And this is before the Kowalskis moved to Florida? Yes. yes. So our objection would be relevance. And this is before the CRPS diagnosis well definitely before the diagnosis but before the first instance of CRPS uh, more than a year before a year and a half before 
What, 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 is, what is this for? Bag, one second here. Sure. Your Honor, these are related to the asthma and uh, prednisone that's been referenced throughout this trial. Well, there's really no dispute over prednisone. I mean, Johns Hopkins also is hospital for administered prednisone and prescribed prednisone. So it, it really it doesn't bear any issue in this case. Judge, it has to do with her medical history, including her asthma, which has been an issue in the case. Well, do these records say she didn't, did not have asthma? No. That, that's my knowledge. So, so we're putting in documents to further confirm the asthma that no one's disputing? Judge, we'll pass on this one for now. We'll come back. 3028. This is a record from Dr. Hanna, dated 10 5, 2016. It's a he's a nutritionist consult that he has referred her for two days before our admission. It says a uh, nutrition consult needed due to patient being malnourished. Malnourished? Is that the word? Yes, sir. It's so body So this was two nutrition. days before the admission? Yes, sir. Plan. 403, they did not know about this. It wasn't a basis for any of their opinion. It's hearsay, and until such time as Dr. Hanna, who they have recently subpoenaed, and I guess we're planning to call Monday, testifies as to the context of this, it gives the jury a complete misrepresentation. Uh, for the record, that uh, the record shows that Maya Kowalski was in Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital on October 1st. Uh, because she was, again, dehydrated based on the fact she was having a relapse and she had the stomach issues, which uh, pair up, uh, I forget, it, the di diagnosis as part of CRPS. And then this is the day before, two days before she comes back to Johns Hopkins. This, taken out of context, uh, they purports to show that she was somehow uh, being abused because she wasn't being given enough nutrition. That is a completely, obviously, from the record the court has seen, false premise given the testimony of her and everyone else. So, as to 403, we, we object as to hearsay, but more importantly, 403 out of context until such time as Dr. Hanna, who they just subpoenaed to appear Monday, uh, can talk about this. Sure. Do I need to say anything, Judge? No. Thank you. Of course, receiving it. What's next? 3031, Dr. Mendez's records. <coughs> okay, give me a, a, a time frame that we're talking about. He's testifying, Your Honor, at November 2015. Yeah, October through December of 2015. Oh, thank you. October to December of 2015, and Dr. Mendez will be testifying. So this is uh, around the time of Maya Kowalski's trip to Mexico. That's correct, Your Honor. And there has been testimony about the Lee Memorial. <coughs> yeah, I best believe so. Plaintiffs? This alone is the only page? Apparently it's 39 pages. This is uh, Dr. Right. Um, no objection to the document other than a, quote, diagnosis, or it wasn't even that. Dr. Mendez is the one who uh, met very briefly with the Kowalskis um, and then came up with the Munchausen as a possibility. That's not, and so we move to exclude any, the quote, opinion by Dr. Mendez contained within there, uh, but the document itself we don't have a problem with. We are just 
uh, moving to exclude and redact anything having to do with a quote diagnosis. He had completely no qualifications whatsoever to make that. That would seem like you can cross examine him on. Well, the problem is if it's taken out of context, uh, Your Honor, then it would be, I think, a 403 issue. And so until such time as there was sufficient uh, uh, record, predicate in the record for the court to determine whether or not the jury should be seeing random comments by physicians who may or may not have liked to be out of Kowalski and may or may not have any possible qualifications to throw these things out. Let me ask the, the defense this. Yes, the, I have been excluding Chapter 39 matters yes. at the defense's request. How, why does this not go to a Chapter 39 issue? Because we're not, this, what, what does this go to? What, what cause of action does this go or defend against? Mr. Shapiro is going to respond to that, sorry, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. The, the, this goes to confirm uh, he is an independent treating provider that noticed irregularities between the relationship between the mother and suspecting whether this was actually CRPS or some other underlying psychological factors. That's been a very important theme for the defense to be able to say that all children saw inconsistencies and irregularities in their record so did other providers as well. It, it doesn't go to Chapter 39. It goes to exactly to confirm that a lot of what all children saw was also the same. And there's an allegation in this case for medical malpractice, mistreatment, and the plaintiff saying, you know, you got this diagnosis wrong in the record, you mistreated her in the record. So this is a, a prior physician that made a very similar or same observation and diagnosis. So we go to that. Assume for the sake of argument it goes to medical malpractice. What does that, how does that help the jury as to what Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital should have done or did do with respect to treating Maya Kowalski? Well, if, if, the, if the court is going to exclude the plaintiff from alleging that the diagnosis of Munchausen by proxis is medical malpractice, then perhaps this doesn't come in. But if the court is going to allow the plaintiff to insinuate or argue, as I believe they've argued repeatedly, that this diagnosis of Munchausen that was on the Morse transfer is so far out of left field and you came up with this and this was wrong, you have no support for this, we have another physician who a year earlier made a very similar or same observation slash diagnosis. So it goes to that exact issue. Now, if the court is going to say, I'm not going to allow this jury to consider any of the diagnoses made at all children's as part of a medical malpractice claim, then, the, then we could possibly reconsider this. But at this point, the jury's heard this. They've heard that the Kowalskis were floored by this. This came out of left field. And here we have a doctor, an independent physician, making the same observations and diagnosis. So it goes directly and as a defense to the claims that the Kowalskis have raised in their case in chief. Is this, Doc, you meant for purposes of today? I think I'm going to need to think about this more. I, I mean, obviously there's been discussion of Munchausen and by proxy as well, but I'm still trying to wrap my head around the concept of, sure, the, the All Children's was aware of that as a possibility, but how does that talk to us about what all Children's Hospital should have done or did do uh, as far as its treatment of Maya Kowalski. Be because I mean, because I mean, fr from a 30,000 foot view, can, can a medical provider say, oh, well, look, uh, there, in this record from somebody else a year or two ago has this thing, therefore, I don't have to do um, I don't have to provide treatment for the patient in front of me that I've got my hands on right then and there. That's not the argument, Your Honor. The, the standard of care defined under Florida law is what a reasonable health care provider would do under same or similar circumstances. So the plaintiff has introduced to this jury that the re, part, of, part of the big defense for the reason for not consenting to the transfer is this diagnosis code that came out of nowhere. Part of the defense of that is for us to be able to tell the jury 
that this diagnosis that they say was the impediment was, was out of left field. They're saying it's out of left field. It's not part of the standard of care. For us to be able to tell the jury what would a same or similar reasonably prudent health care provider do, we absolutely need to be able to say same or similar health care uh, physicians now in Naples, in Tampa General, at Lurie Children's, made the same observations. I, I feel you're misconstruing what I've heard. Maybe I misheard. But I heard the plaintiffs say that they did not want to sign documents that had that diagnosis on it, and they felt that there might have even been criminal liability if they were to sign a document, so they're basically making a declaration against their own interests, which is different than what you just argued. Right, but so, it, so did I misunderstand the plaintiff's yeah. position? I, I, respectfully, I think they've said they have said that, but they've also said to this jury that that diagnosis was incorrect. They, they, they're implying to this jury that that diagnosis came out of left field, that it wasn't made in good faith, and and if Dr. Neuberger specifically said in his testimony that that was an incorrect diagnosis to the prejudice of the family. <clears throat> this goes directly to observations. That's our entire theme of the case that there were other providers at the time raising these red flags and, and making diagnoses and observations that were exactly similar to this one. I, I, I think I need more time on it, and I think we need to right. perhaps and, a memo on this one. Okay, and I'll just, one, one other thing while, you're, while your honor is considering it. This also goes to doc, the, the, the issue with Dr. Wassenauer. This, Diagnosis, suspicion of Munchausen by proxy went back to Dr. Wassenaar as a letter to him raising this. And part of the direct and cross-examination of Dr. Wassenaar was, did you see this in the record? What did you do to intervene on this point? What did you advise the Kowalskis? It also goes to their awareness as a, as a potential in the record of somebody else telling the Kowalskis, we suspect there's a psychological factor. Perhaps you don't need to go to Mexico. Perhaps this is not a course of treatment that is being recommended. So it's an incredibly important note to the defense for a number of different reasons. What's next? Okay. So, Judge, um, it's not on the list, but I'd like to revisit um, the uh, exhibit and put it up, 31980001. The court sustained the hearsay objection to this document. It has to do with... Charlotte Laporte being the one on the call. So my response to the hearsay is that this is a document that the witness was essentially accused of uh, not being truthful about this and uh, making it up. This is a prior consistent statement consistent with the testimony offered to rebut an express or implied charge against the declarative improper influence motive or recent fabrication. She specifically states in the second paragraph, or third paragraph, I'm sorry, yesterday when you were on the phone, I had to redirect you. And that is a prior consistent statement, therefore it's not hearsay. This is the exhibit that continued with the Otto Kowalski's email, if I'm not mistaken, if we go to page two. Well, that's correct, Judge. But and that was the problem, is that we pointed out that this continued and there was previous exchanges that were relevant. And, and this is the one where I basically said, it's all coming in or... Exactly. And they withdrew it. There was no... Well, okay. I don't. I think that was a different one we went through, Judge. But well, it was a different number, but it was the complete well, that, email exchange. But Judge, the purpose of putting this in is not to put in all of the conversation. It's to put in the prior consistent statement. The rest of the email will delete all about you know, as, you know, everything else. It's about yesterday when you were on the phone. I had to redirect you. It's a prior consistent statement. 
due to, and, and we believe we have the right to put it in, it's not hearsay, because of, of all the attacks on Ms. Laporte, uh, with his, whether or not she was the voice on the phone. I'm going to stick with our discussion in the comments I had two days ago or whenever it was. Uh, one other comment, Judge, please, briefly. If, if you do consider it hearsay, it's not being offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted, but that she was present. And I believe that that is an acceptable exception. We're proving that she was present on the call. That's truth. That's fact. I will put the whole, yeah. I, will, I will put the whole thing in, Judge, if that's the issue. We we object at this point. She's gone. We can't we can't cross examine Shadow Port on on the missile port on this email. And she was released. And it's a prior inconsistent back. statement. If if they want to take a position that this proves she was on that phone call. She says here, I did not get my authorization to record a phone call. She did not object at the time, so it suggests it wasn't her. Judge. It's yeah. hearsay any way you look at it. I don't Judge, we'll bring her in. back if that's the issue. To, they want to cross the camera. So what's next? I'm sorry, did you sustain it? I, I didn't rule. I said uh, I thought you were going to try to put the whole one in, and I wasn't. I don't remember the number, so until I can look at it. Because remember, there was like four pages of this email. All right, we'll, re we'll revisit it tomorrow, Judge. Okay, moving on. Um, we would like to put in uh, 3033. These are dental records, Judge. The, the relevance is that the, these are uh, procedures that uh, Maya Kowalski went through subsequent, uh, well, before and subsequent, I guess. So the dates are from 2015 to when? Um, well, definitely into 2016, Judge. I'd have to, can you go to the next page? 2017, next page, please. 2018. So is there, there's nothing before 2015, is that correct? That's correct. Objection, relevance. Overruled. Yes. Court will receive 3033, and it's pages 1 through 20, is that the complete series? That's my understanding. I, I'm asking the clerk, because oh. I, I want to make sure when I admit the whole document that there's not 85 pages in yes. Oh, no, we, that's... Thank you. What's next? Uh, same, 3034, page, 15 pages, similar. What, what dates are we talking about? Um, I believe these are all after. Can you go to the next page, please? Um, 20, 2022. <coughs> Anything besides relevance? Mm -hmm. Nothing besides relevance. There's no okay, dispute that she went to the dentist. Court's going to overrule uh, the objection on 3034 for relevance and admit it. 3035, the Moores Children's Hospital Records. Now, what dates are we talking about? Is this for an actual admission or is this the attempted admission? Or is it both? One second here. Here regarding ear, nose, and throat. 
It's not, a, I, this is not for asthma, this is not for immunology, and so I'm sure not for the CRPS. Well, it's during a CRPS episode, so it is relevant. I disagree on 403. And I'm wondering, what, what, what we wonder with, with a lot of these, Judge, is the actual doctors at Johns Hopkins didn't have these documents, and many and many of these at the time of admission and what was going on there. So how, if, if it's coming in to show their state of mind for treatment, how are things that they never knew at that time relevant? You can always point out the absence of these from the Johns Hopkins if you feel that that's something that you need to argue to the jury, but this is a provider who saw Maya Kowalski during uh, the CRPS issue, and so it's relevant. I don't see how there's a 403 issue. So it's, unless you can point to me for some specific passage in here, it's coming in. There really isn't much to it, is there? Well, there's 14 pages. Uh, so you know. okay. Is there diagnoses? I... Can we scan the pages? Yeah, I, I, would, I would like to just see that. to see at this point the relevance of my Kowalski and having this exam and procedure. Okay, the court's overruling the relevance. The court receives 3037, looks like it's pages 1 through 14. 3038. What are the dates of these? Uh, I believe 2015, 2016, oh, looks like 2016, can't read that actually, 15. Yeah, October 2015 to November 2016. Who's representing this? I'm sorry. Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition of Florida. Let me go to the next page. She's in there for abdominal pain, constipation. RSD. Next page. Next page, please. So it talks about uh, ketamine, coma, and you're okay now? Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay. it, it, it. 
things like this, we've been spending a lot of time on the question of relevance, of medical records of providers concurrent to the specific time frame. I'm, I'm just pointing it out that we spent a lot of time on that. The court, the court receives 3038 pages 1 through 9. All right. Your Honor, do you want to wait on the rest? Give them time or what's your preference? Let's do the one that's 11 pages, uh, 3039, and then okay. that'll probably be it. <clears throat> Next page. Seem to be duplicative, Your Honor. I mean, I think we just saw this note in the previous record. That's not sure why it's coming in twice. Well, it's a different. Uh, it's a different uh, facility, right? That's. I think it's the same, the exact same procedure and the exact same page we saw before about she was brought in the operating room in place. I don't know if this was in the other, you know, a, a lot of these doctors' records have got records from other doctors because they've been forwarded to them. I don't know if this specific one was in the previous one, Judge. Yeah, and, okay, I think it's it's fine. Question is it in the Johns Hopkins records? I don't know. We'll see. Good. Court receives 3039, pages 1 through 11. All right. Okay, anything else before we bring in this jury? Um, just a matter of scheduling, Your Honor. Could I understand we're staying until 6 tomorrow night? Good. We're going to keep going through exhibits. Yeah. Okay. We're trimming our sales, and our days are going to get longer. We have two issues, but I think they can wait until the next break. And, and I highly encourage, since I'm telling you our days are going to get longer, that you all need to be better at communicating and not fighting every single issue. But if you want to, we will stay longer and longer. If we need to start coming in on Saturdays and Sundays, we're going to do that too. We're going to finish this case. Let's bring in the jury.
Please be seated. Good morning. Were you able to enjoy that lovely weather yesterday? Yes. I'm glad. A little too cold for the beach, huh? Okay. Uh, I want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and you received no information about this case. Is that correct? And that you have not been approached by anyone about this case. Is that correct? And you've not seen any media accounts of this case. Is that correct? correct. Mr. Hunter. Madam Clerk, if you can swear in Dr. Michelle Smith. Tell us your name, please, ma'am. Michelle Smith. And what is your occupation? I'm a critical care physician at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. I'm sorry, we're not going to catch you. We've got a mic problem. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry, I'm a, I don't usually speak very loud. <laughs> I'll do better. Okay, there you go. Um, you, you said you were employed at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital? Yes. And what is your uh, job at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital? I'm a critical care physician. Okay. Now, uh, the jury has heard a lot about Dr. Sally Smith, your Dr. Michelle Smith. Correct. What's the difference? I'm a critical care physician, so I'm trained to provide care to children in an intensive care unit, and Dr. Sally Smith is a general pediatrician who also specializes in um, child care. <coughs> okay. Now, uh, would you give the jury the benefit of your background and training, please? So I went to medical school at Georgetown University. I then did my general pediatric training at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. I then went and did a pediatric critical care fellowship at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. Okay. And are you board certified? I am board certified. Okay. Um, how long have you been at... All Children's Hospital, and I'm going to ask you to break down its different iterations at All Children's and then Johns Hopkins All Children's. Okay, so when I first started, it was All Children's Hospital, and I started in 2002. And I have been there since 2002 and went through the transition with the acquisition with Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. Okay, and uh, what is your primary role at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital today? I'm a critical care physician. Okay. Um, have you have you had occasion to contribute to the literature in your profession from time to time? 
I have done mostly quality projects. Um, I have presented at um, a conference most recently in um, Portugal on simulation use in the ICU for cardiac arrest. Okay. And do you work purely in the, the so-called PICU? I work both in the pediatric intensive care unit and in the cardiovascular intensive care unit. Okay. Um, did there come a point in time at which you became involved in the care of Maya Kowalski? Yes. And, and when was that? I believe the date was October 9th. It was a Monday. Um, I took over the care on a Monday. Okay. And if that were to be uh, October 10th? Okay, is it the 10th? Okay. Would that be, would that uh, comport with your recollection? I believe so, yes, okay. if that was Monday. I'm going to ask our faithful tech folks to put up. Have you, did you bring your notes with you this week? I did not bring my notes with me. You did not? I okay. did not. Would you uh, put up 1001-78? Is it This is in evidence, Your Honor. It's part of the All Children's Hospital record. And I'll ask you to put... Uh, that's not the page I was looking for. Go to the next page. There we go. Okay. Let me ask you to take a quick look at, at what's on the screen before you and tell us whether this is the note of your taking over the care of Maya Kowalski on Monday morning, October 10th, 2016. I don't see anything. Is that your note? I don't see anything. Oh. Help. <coughs> your screen's not uh, plugged in. Oh, your power's plugged in? Yeah, let me try. Hey, I need a mic. <coughs> It's up. It's working now. Okay. Thank you. Our assistant IT. <laughs> <laughs> Man, many times. Yeah. Now, one second. Um, and, and Mike, if you're listening, you don't need to come right now. Oh, thank you, sir. Um, so, you took, you came in that Monday morning, October 10th. Tell us a little bit about what your routine is when you take over a patient's care on a Monday morning like this. Okay, so it's not unusual for us to start a service on a Monday, and so typically we would contact the physician who was on service prior to us, and we get sign out on all of our patients. So that usually would occur on a Sunday. So I spoke with Dr. Tepa on Sunday, and she would review all the patients that would be on my team the following day and review, you know, the current plan of action and prepare me for the for taking over on Monday. Okay. And, and was it your understanding this patient had been admitted over the weekend? Correct. And you were taking over from Dr. Tepa Sanchez? Yes. Okay. So when you took over, when you came in and saw the patient on Monday morning, what did you do? What, was, what, what did your routine consist of and what did you do to, to, to assess this patient? So our typical day starts with a, another handoff. So the person who's on call that evening in the hospital, the physician, provides a handoff to us and so we meet and again get a handoff on all the patients in the ICU what occurred overnight so that then I have all the information from my handoff from Dr. Tepa um, so what you know what she may have not included in that handoff that she was unaware of and then we would move from that to another huddle where we have a multidisciplinary huddle that involves our charge nurse our respiratory therapist um, the both medical team physicians, residents, um, sometimes a social worker, and we kind of get a feel for what the ICU is like that day. It's kind of obtaining a shared mental model so that we know what patients in the unit are sick, who's going out of the unit, who will be discharged, who, what type of admissions we'll be getting, and it really just kind of brings us all together so that we're all aware of all of what's going on in the unit. It's a large ICU, and so it's important for all of us to know all of the, you know, goings in and out of the unit. Okay. In this particular case, what did you learn about 
Ms. Kowalski that morning. Objection. Hearsay. Did you take a history regarding Maya Kowalski that morning? We would, um, my first interaction with her would have been on rounds, and so after we finish our huddle, then we start rounding and we go through all of the patients on our team. And during that, the nurse would also give us another update of any issues that came up overnight, and then we would present all of the current data, including vital signs, laboratory studies, or anything that would be available for us to review. And at that point in time, we would interact with the family. Now, um, and let me just clarify with referring to my note. Is there a particular part of your note you need to refer to, Doctor? I was just looking to see whether or not um, where I discuss what we, our discussions with the family. Okay. Well, let me direct your attention to the paragraph at the bottom of the page you're looking at, I think it's 79, and um, it says social. Could I ask the, our support here to bring that paragraph up? And it continues over to the next page so you can see, you can refresh your recollection of what's there. I, rem I remember that. So um, I did meet with the father. One of the um, pieces that was signed out to me by Dr. Teppa was the family's interest in potentially being transferred to Nemours Children's Hospital. And they had reached out to their ICU physicians over at Nemours about a transfer. Um, and so I spoke to father and I told him that I would reach out to them. And I did speak to an ICU physician at Nemours who had reviewed the information that they had been provided over the weekend. They had discussed it with their pain team. And at that point in time, they did not feel like she was a candidate to be transferred to their hospital. Um, that Dr. Santana, who is their pain specialist, felt that this would... Objection, hearsay. It's not offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted, Your Honor. It's offered to prove what she was told. What did you learn, if anything, from Dr. Santana about what they wanted to do or not do at the time? Objection. Hearsay. Sustained. Got to move. Approach, Karen. Had uh, Dr. Tepa Sanchez attempted to begin the process of transferring this patient to Nemours the, pre the previous day, to your understanding? Correct. And on the morning of October 10th, did you attempt to, to continue the process of arranging transfer? It probably would have been in the afternoon after we concluded rounds, but yes. Okay. Did you have any discussions with the father beyond what you have told us about? regarding uh, transferring the patient to Nemours at that time. In regards to the transfer, my conversation would have been relaying what I Objection. learned when Here's I spoke. Say, with Mr. Kowalski? Uh, I, is it with Mr. Kowalski? That's what I thought until I got interrupted. It, I thought okay. the question was to Mr. Kowalski. It, it was. If it is, okay. I was told that the family wanted to be trans was interested in a transfer to Namor, so I spoke with Namor's and then I went to Mr. Kowalski, who was present in the room, and I spoke to him about the pot the potential of transfer and that at this point in time she was not a candidate for transfer. Okay. Uh, did you have any conversations with Mrs. Kowalski, the mother? Um, the father had requested that I call Mrs. Kowalski and I did call her and left her a message, but I did not speak to her that day. Okay. On that Monday, what, what did the treatment plan for Maya Kowalski consist of? 
So the treatment plan was um, brought together with our pain team. They were helping coordinate the care of the management of her, her pain infusions. And so um, if you could just please go back to the neurologic section. So Dr. Elliott was the pain team um, physician that was on that day. And so every day we met with him and we coordinated our care together and developed our plan and then we um, discussed it with the family. And so um, that day we had discussed with the father the weaning plan for the ketamine and the dexmedetomidine infusions that she was on. Okay. And did you conduct an examination of Monica Walski that day? Yes. And what were the results? Um, everything, um, she that day did not really want to be examined, um, and so I was able to get some exam, but she, because of her discomfort, did not want a complete exam, so it was a limited exam, and it's documented in my note. What did, let's go back for a moment to the um, transfer issue. What did you tell Mr. Kowalski about why the uh, transfer was not being uh, approved by Nemours at the time? So as I documented in my note, um, they, Dr. Santana wanted to have her on, a di on an outpatient basis. Her, um, her treatment plan is an outpatient treatment plan and that they really wanted us to wean her off of the medications. And then Objection, she, motion strike, that's not the record. Excuse me, I think it is. Sustained. Instruction of the jury, please, Your Honor. You'll disregard the, the comment as to what the doctor in Orlando allegedly said. Okay. Um, Well, let's, let's continue. Uh, can you recall any other interactions that you had with uh, the Kowalskis on Monday, October 10th? No. Okay. And then did you also take care of Maya Kowalski on that Tuesday, October 11th? Yes. Okay. And uh, when did you arrive at the hospital that morning? We typically arrive at 7.30 in the morning. And when you, did you conduct rounds that morning in much the same way you've described our, before? Our day would be the same. Okay. Did you have occasion on that Tuesday, October 11th, to speak with Mrs. Kowalski? Yes. Okay. And what did your conversation with Mrs. Kowalski consist of? Mrs. Kowalski was um, concerned that the information was not appropriately provided to Nemours um, and that there was potentially, you know, f facts of Maya's um, history that were not provided. And so she was, really wanted to arrange a conversation with them so that she could tell Maya's story. Okay. And were, were there some particular uh, therapies that Mrs. Kowalski expressed to you that she wanted to obtain at uh, Nemours? Yes, she wanted an intrathecal infusion pump. And what what was the after you had this discussion with Ms. Kowalski about her concerns, what did you do? I then reached out to Nemours and spoke with um, the physicians there and organized a meeting with Dr. Santana and the IC physician. I'm not sh sure what their name was, what their name was. Okay. And does your do you have you have a note of that day, October eleventh? Yes. 11th? yes. And that would be, I believe, uh, starting on page 1,176. That's in evidence, Your Honor, as part of the All Children's Hospital record. And I would uh, direct attention to the last paragraph on that page that begins with, I contacted Nemours. And did you, in fact, contact Nemours and arrange for a telephone conference? Yes. And who was a party to that telephone conversation? Um, it was Dr. Santana and Dr. Torres. Um, we also had Mrs. Kowalski present and the bedside nurse. We met in the, IC, 
the ICU physician office. Okay. And before we go into those details about the conversation, tell the jury what an intrathecal pain pump is. So an intrathecal pain pump is um, a pump that is inserted underneath the skin and there's a catheter that goes into the, um, the space around the spinal cord and it can infuse various medications, usually pain medications, to help treat and manage chronic pain. To your knowledge, was that something that was recommended at, at all children's? No. Why? From the literature on CRPS. Um, Objection? Sustained. Don't, don't talk about the literature. Okay. Just tell what your experience is. The only time that we, I have ever had patients with intrathecal pain pumps are usually um, patients in compassionate care, usually with significant um, pain from cancer. Are there risks to a pain pump at this measure? There are definitely risks to having a pain pump. Okay. Um, tell us, if you would, what you learned from the discussion that took place, that, that you arranged with Nemours. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yes, I'll try again. That was probably a bad question. Um, was there a conversation, a telephone conference that occurred involving Mrs. Kowalski, yourself, and some folks from Nemours Children's Hospital? Yes. And, and who was on the phone, to your knowledge? Dr. Santana, Dr. Torres, and then also present in the room with me was the bedside nurse. And what was Mrs. Kowalski told during that conversation? Mrs. Kowalski told her story, and then Dr. Santana told her that she has a lot of experience with CRPS. She trained in Boston, and that was where she had learned her management and was re reproducing that down in the Orlando area in her own clinic, and that she had very good success with treating patients with this diagnosis using physical therapy, occupational therapy, and cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, did, was there an indication that this outpatient program would be available? Yes, did, yes. And did you have a discussion subsequently with Mrs. Kowalski about that program and about transferring her child to Nemours for this outpatient program? I did. I actually was very encouraged after speaking with Dr. Santana and thought that she was very well educated, very well experienced, and had good success. So I was actually really optimistic and excited that we would be able to make the connection for the Kowalski family to get care there. Did you have an impression regarding whether Mrs. Kowalski would agree to such an outpatient transfer? Initially, I Yes, I thought that she would be interested in it. She expressed that she was interested in pursuing it. Okay. Now, your note that we have up here, uh, which we're going to publish to the jury uh, when we, we finish this, your note um, seems to make reference to continuing to the next day. Is that correct? I'm sorry. Where are you referring well, to? Let well, me, let me just ask this. When you left the hospital on October 11th, did you have any impression regarding whether or not this outpatient transfer would be workable? Soon after our conversation with the physicians at Nemours and my, my understanding that we were going to hope to get her there as an outpatient, the mom um, told me that she really wasn't interested in wanting an intrathecal pump and wanted to explore other um, other places to have this, and I believe it was Cleveland Clinic that she um, thought that they could potentially be transferred to to get an intrathecal pump. Okay. And um, was there, did you attempt to arrange that, or did you attempt to contact Cleveland Clinic? I did not. I told her that we needed to have somebody to reach out to and put that kind of on her to let us know who to reach out to. And then was the last day that you cared for Maya Kowalski on October the 12th? Wednesday, yes. Okay. And did, did you have any further conversations with Mrs. Kowalski that day? I did have conversations with her. We um, 
again, every morning we met with the pain team and we discussed what our plan for the day would be and how we would wean, you know, progress with our weaning. And so we reviewed that with her and she agreed with our weaning plan. We also, um, at that point in time, the GI team had looked at Maya. They had also looked at um, the CT scan that had been done over the weekend, and they felt that because of this abdominal pain that she had presented with that it was worth doing an endoscopy. They had reviewed her records and did not feel she had ever had any endoscopy performed, and so this was discussed with Mom, and she agreed with um, having that, which was scheduled for Friday. She would require a go lightly clean out in preparation to have the endoscopy on Friday. And, and during this three day period that you were taking care of, of Maya Kowalski, uh, was the pain team also involved in her care? Every single day. Okay. And, and what was the weaning plan, if you can describe that briefly? We'll hear from Dr. Elliott about that, but what was your, your perspective on it? It was, uh, with the, in reference to the ketamine, it was a gradual wean in the ketamine um, where we were going down like a milligram per kilo a day. I think maybe towards the end it was a little bit faster. Um, and then with the dexmedetomidine infusion, um, that's given to an IV. Clonidine is an oral medication that acts very similarly, and so we had transitioned her to a clonidine patch. And as when we put the patch on, often we'll give some oral doses of clonidine because it takes the patch a little bit of time to absorb and get to steady state drug levels in the body. So we'll use oral doses of the medication to help get to that level in the body where she's actually getting the full effects. Okay. And over this this period of three days and this, this weaning process, and so you used a drug term that I can't pronounce, mm -hmm. and I'd like to get you to explain, dexamethyl? Oh, dexmedetomidine, Presidex. Okay. And, and what is that? It is a uh, um, alpha agonist, and so we use it often in the ICU as a sedative and also an analgesic. It um, is actually a really nice medication because it has less respiratory depression, and so we can provide sedation um, to patients that aren't on any respiratory support and not have as much concern that they would stop breathing. Okay, and during this three-day period that you took care of Maya Kowalski, did it appear to you that, that the weaning process was going smoothly? It seemed to be going smoothly. Um, we weren't having discussions about stopping the wean every day. We were progressing with our wean. I wasn't called frequently to the room that there were break, break out, breakthrough episodes of pain that weren't being controlled. Um, so it seemed like we were being successful in weaning her off. Okay. And did it appear that she was generally comfortable during this process? I, I think intermittently she probably had complaints of pain, but we were, I think, well controlled. Uh, and did you ever have any contact with the Kowalskis after you went off duty, so to speak, on October 12th, no. 2016? No. Okay. Um, someone going? Did you ever hear from the Kowalskis during the time that you were taking care of them that they wanted to leave the hospital against medical advice? No. Did you ever have a conversation about that with Mrs. Kowalski? No. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, ma'am. Your witness. Thank you. So you're aware then that the Kowalskis were told not two days prior, that if they left, security would come and escort them back into the hospital and call the police. You were aware of that, right? No. Nobody ever told you that? I was told on the morning, on Monday morning, that there was, that they wanted to go out of the hospital and there was conversations in regards to leaving against medical advice. AMA, right? Correct. And is it, to your knowledge, AMA a force of law? I mean, do doctors through AMA, are they able to retain people and hold people in their rooms just because they disagree with the diagnosis? Yeah, it's possibly it's the same. Hey? Ma'am, Mr. Anderson, it's the same. I'm going to change. 
So was the reason AMA? I'm sorry, can you clarify that? Against medical advice. Against medical advice is AMA. And doesn't that mean that you disagreed with the treatment that the non-Johns Hopkins doctors had for Maya? You need to identify the doctors to which you refer. Hannah, Kirkpatrick, Chopra, Wassenauer, Barr, Spiegel. Can you rephrase the question, please? The yes. beginning of it, I, not the names, but if you could please rephrase the beginning of the question. Against Medical Advice talks about your medical advice. The Kowalski's Correct. disagreeing with your medical advice. Correct. Right? Yes. And to that point, they had been counseled by multiple experts in CRPS, right? Mm -hmm. You had no CRPS program at the hospital, did you? Correct. Right. So, you said that when you spoke to, excuse me, spoke to Beata, she was cooperative and knowledgeable, right? Yes. And you explained your plan about weaning off and the dosages, and she was agreeable, right? Correct. And throughout the entire conversation, she was polite and, although expressed her opinion, was acting fairly normally for a parent of a sick child. True? She was polite to me. Um, huh? She did ask for therapies that were unusual for, for families to ask for, um, but she was always polite to me. So isn't the reason that, not necessarily you, but the hospital were keeping them there was that there was a belief that somehow Beata was a harm to her child? Isn't that true? Overall. So I think that there were red flags in her history. I, I'm not talking about that, ma'am. I'm just asking you a simple question. Was the reason that you were keeping her there because you and other doctors feared what Beata Kowalski would do? I don't is that think true? That is not true. So they could have left at any time without any problem. And Johns Hopkins would have let them just walk, sorry. They could have left at any time with no problem. Is that right? We have a process for against medical advice. And so we would have followed that process. And what would that entail? So when a family asks to leave against medical advice, we contact the nursing supervisor and we contact social work. Um, we go and we talk to the family, we explain to them why we feel like it is not in the child's best interest to be discharged. Um, and in this case, she's still on significant doses of sedation. And we would have that conversation if we couldn't come to an agreement with the family, then if we felt that it was an unsafe situation, then we would um, contact the Department of Child and Family Services. But at no point in time would we restrain the family or force them to stay. So, it would be against your policy, for instance, to tell the Kowalskis that if they did try to leave, security would be called to keep them there. If a child is under DCF custody, uh -huh. then I am just explaining the mm -hmm. policy. Go ahead, if, please, please. If the patient is under a shelter, then we would call security, but we would we would not intervene. We would, if the family was leaving, we would call the Department of Child and Family Services. But from October seventh, twenty sixteen, to October thirteenth, twenty sixteen, there was no DCF hold, Correct. was there? Correct. And so, to your knowledge, did anybody ever go to the Kowalskis and say, "Remember when we told you that if you tried to walk off, we were going to have the guys from security come here?" and force you to stay? I never said that to the family. Okay. And your reason, medically, mm -hmm. was she needed to be weaned off of ketamine. Is that right? 
She was on several medications that we were weaning her off of, yes. Well, wasn't the primary one you were worried about the ketamine? We were worried about the ketamine, but she also was on dexmedetomidine, which was also a different medication than she had been on before. We also were, we had not resolved her, the concerns of abdominal pain, and at that point in time, she was not eating and drinking enough to sustain her hydration level and was requiring IV fluids. And so we would not typically discharge a patient that we were uncertain of their ability to maintain their hydration status. And so typically we would discontinue our therapies and make sure that the patient was in a state where they would be able to maintain themselves without needing all these things that were being done in the hospital. Anything else? Was it or was it not the ketamine that was one of your primary concerns? I think that there was a concern of the ketamine as an outpatient, and that's why other people were involved, but my concern was what I was being faced with at that moment in time when I was taking care of Maya. So now, how much uh, experience do you have with ketamine infusion? I have a lot of experience with ketamine infusion. Okay. Um, are you an anesthesiologist? I am not an anesthesiologist. Uh, psychopharmacologist? I'm sorry, repeat that? Psychopharmacologist? No. Psychologist? No. Did you prescribe for Maya during this time, by the way, an antipsychotic? Haloperidol? Haloperidol? Yeah. Haloperidol is an antipsychotic, and it was a recommendation that was provided by the pain team um, with mom in advance. So you wanted to take her off the ketamine and put her on an antipsychotic. Is that right? It was as a PRN as an as needed to help transition her off of the infusions. All right. And your belief about the weaning of the ketamine was you thought, I don't know if it's just you, but you thought that ketamine had physical withdrawal symptoms. Is that right? When you review ketamine, it's, it's uncertain, but we do know that it does have um, psychological withdrawal. And so patients who are abruptly taken off of ketamine who have been exposed to it over time can have a psychological withdrawal, um, like other psychedelic medications. Uh-huh. Psychedelic medications, right? Okay, so now, um, during this time, in reviewing your records, I don't see a single note, and correct me if I'm wrong, there is not a single note about any physiological signs of withdrawal by Maya Kowalski. True? Again, usually you do not see physiological withdrawal with ketamine, and she was still on the infusions, and so usually you will see withdrawal once you have removed the medications from the patient. Mm -hmm. Well, she was eventually removed, right? She was, she was off of the ketamine on Wednesday, which was my last day taking care of her. Do you know how many times she had been on and off ketamine in the preceding year? I know that she was receiving ketamine infusions on a regular basis, yes. And did you go back before testifying here and review any of the records going back the past year? Not in regards to how often she was getting ketamine, but I knew that she was getting it on a regular basis. Was it true that they had been seeking, the Kowalskis had been seeking um, advice and treatment from Johns Hopkins going back to even before the July 4th onset of the CRPS? I know from reviewing the medical records that are in our electronic medical, medical record that she had been seen at our hospital, yes. Yeah. And through that period of time, after Dr. Kirkpatrick's diagnosis in September of 2015, uh, Johns Hopkins records uniformly stated CRPS as a primary diagnosis. Objection. Up until this point, anyway. True? What's the legal basis of the objection? Foundation, organized. Overall. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Mm -hmm. After Dr. Kirkpatrick first identified this as CRPS, mm -hmm. September 23rd of 2016. In every visit after that, up to this point, Johns Hopkins physicians had identified uh, this 
CRPS as the primary diagnosis for Maya Kowalski. True? The mother provided that as a diagnosis, and so when we take a history, we ask families about their past medical history, and when a family member tells you that their child has something, we believe them. We don't, on every diagnosis, go back and re-diagnose it. Well, There's a trust within a relationship that you develop with a family and a physician. I thought my question was simply that was that the primary diagnosis over that period of time? Is it that true her, or false? It was one of her diagnoses. Well, if the jury were to look at these records, would they not find out that CRPS was the number one diagnosis by each and every doctor over that period of time? I don't know how everybody writes their list of diagnoses. And so you went back through the records. So certainly you must have seen that she'd been to Dr. Kirkpatrick. And, and then Dr. Wassenauer was her uh, treating, ongoing, I guess you all called it, attending uh, pediatrician. It's a primary care provider. Primary care provider. Uh, and then she'd been to Dr. Hannah. Mm -hmm. All right. What in-depth conversations did you have with any of them about uh, the need for the ketamine to treat CRPS? I did not have any conversations with them. I'd like to talk for a moment about intrathecal pump. By the way, is that FDA approved, intrathecal pump? I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. And isn't it true that Beata Kowalski learned about intrathecal pumps in a CRPS chat room as a possible alternative? Didn't she tell you that? I don't believe she told me that. Did she? Overall. Did she tell you that she was looking for ways to reduce the amount of medications in Maya? She did not say that specifically. Isn't it true that an intrathecal pump, one of the main advantages of it, is that it reduces the amount of medication in the child's system? It can. Well, isn't it just the idea here, putting a tiny amount, amount into the spinal cord as opposed to having it run through the whole body? It, again, I'm not an expert in intrathecal pain pumps. I'm not a chronic pain medicate or chronic pain physician. I'm a critical care physician. Um, but the hope is that it would provide better control of the pain at lower doses, correct? Okay. And you'd had uh, parents with children in extreme pain ask you about that previously, had you? No. But you weren't a pain management specialist, right? Yeah, I'm a critical care physician. Uh, and um, so I want to talk for a moment about Nemours, if we could. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever get a chance to look at the form that the Kowalskis were asked to sign in order to transfer Maya to Nemours? No. Is it true that Beata Kowalski wanted an inpatient CRPS program. I was just told that she was interested in the Moors. Mm -hmm. The difference between inpatient and outpatient, I don't know the specifics of what she was. It reading. turns out that the Moors, after you talked to them, you found out that the Moors did not have an inpatient CRPS program. It was outpatient, true? Correct. Mm -hmm. But they did have an inpatient psychiatric pediatric psychiatric program, didn't they? I do not know. Do you know whether the codes on the release authorization the Kowalskis were asked to sign were coded for psychiatric problems such as Munchausen by proxy? No, I don't know. If they had signed on to that, wouldn't they have been agreeing that A, their daughter had psychiatric problems? If they had signed on to that and it said psychological psychiatric problems, do you think that would have posed problems? Same I'm, Honor, it's on that. I'm not aware of the form that you're speaking to, and so I don't feel like I can answer the question appropriately without understanding the form that you're referring to. Mm -hmm. 
do you know whether a nurse uh, who uh, agrees that uh, she th that she was involved with abuse of her own child, Munchausen by proxy, would be able to stay in that profession? Objection. If you don't know, she doesn't know. Can I overrule the objection? I don't, I've never been involved in a case of, of Munchausen by proxy. I've never met any families like that, so I can't speculate on how, how they would feel or how a nurse would feel. But a pediatrician wouldn't be able to continue to practice if there was a record of child abuse, would they? Same objection, Your Honor. Sustained. So, again, what steps, strike it, you had also said on interthecal pumps that you mostly knew of them for children with cancer, pain from cancer, right? Correct. Do you know any of the pain scales, such as the McGill pain scale? I'm familiar with pain scales that we use in the hospital, and off the top of my head, I don't remember the name of the pain scale. What is the disease or the disorder that ranks above cancer and at the top of the McGill pain scale? I don't know. Is it CRPS? If you I'm know. not sure. I've not seen a listing of diseases based on a pain scale. I know you're not. You don't, I understand. But, um, you understand the CR you did understand the CRPS was one of the most painful conditions known to medicine, did you not? Yes. Um, and again, does did Johns Hopkins have an inpatient CRPS pain treatment program? We do not have an inpatient CRPS pain program. Mm -hmm. So again, um, if there was no hold and Beata Kowalski, to you, was acting like any other concerned mother. Why not just let him go? She never asked me to leave. That was never brought up to me. But had it been brought up to you, you would have said, fine, go ahead, walk out of here. I would have had a conversation with them that I did not think that she was ready for discharge. Okay. And because there was a current DCF involvement, we would contact them to let them know. But if I felt that she was safe to be discharged, I would have discharged her. If you felt she was safe, Correct. you as a doctor yeah. felt she was safe? As the person that's currently in charge of her medical care, yes. Well, at this point, you had absolutely no indications that Maya was, I'll strike it. At this point, you had not done an extensive review of Maya's records, had you? I had reviewed what was in our... Back then, did you review? At this point, as of October 10th. Dr. Tepa had done a very thorough review in her h &P, and I had read her h &P, which summarized all of the encounters that she had had when she was at All Children's Hospital. I simply asked whether you had. And I told you what I reviewed. Okay. And is it true that while you were weaning Maya off of ketamine, you also were giving her, or putting her back on certain narcotics? There were medications that the pain team was using um, and had recommended with discussions with the family to use as an as-needed basis. What is uh, butorphanol? Butorphanol. Butorphanol. Sorry mm -hmm. about the pronunciation. Okay. But what is butorphanol a narcotic medication? It is an um, opiate agonist and antagonist, I believe. And from your admittedly a brief review, uh, did it come to your attention that narcotics had never worked for Maya previously? 
I wasn't aware of it, but all of our um, plan with King management was discussed with the family, and so there would have been an opportunity for them to tell us that they did not work. But they agreed with what our plan was. And who all else was on the pain team? This, you, you testified to on direct examination that there was a team that were making these decisions. Who, who all was on that team, if you could name them for us? The individual that I interacted with at that time was Dr. Elliott. Okay. And then there is a nurse practitioner that is usually rounding with them during the day, and I do not remember who, who that was at back then. Just Dr. Elliott? And his nurse practitioner, but I'm not sure who that would have been back then. But Dr. Elliott would be the physician who was rounding those three days in the ICU. So the team was three people? There are several pain team, pain team doctors at the hospital. Um, Back then, I believe the pain team was Dr. Elliot, Dr. Dolan, Dr. Patel, and I think Dr. Chin, um, I'm totally blanking on the other person's name. I apologize. But in this meeting, but usually one of them is on service at a time, and they're the one who is rounding and seeing the patient on that day. Thank so you. they all would not. All the physicians would not come on every single day. It would be the person who was taking care of the pain team. Anything else you'd like to have? Just on that day, the people we're talking about that you testified to on direct, were there just three people? I told you it was Dr. Elliott and his nurse practitioner, then I don't remember her name. I understand. So and you? Two. I'm, I'm not One, sure One, two, the three. You, the nurse practitioner, I'm and Dr. Elliott. I'm on the pain team. I'm the critical uh, care uh, physician. Yes. Getting argumentative with the witness sustained. Well, who was the leader of the team? The, as the um, critical care physician for a patient that's in the ICU, we are the one that directs their care and coordinates with all of the consultants. The person who was on the pain team that day was Dr. Elliott, and he would have been the leader of the pain team rounding on Maya that day. In that little team you had put together, who was the leader of the team? Who made the ultimate decisions? The ultimate decisions are made as a team. So as the team leader, the critical care physician coordinates that care, but I do depend and rely on my experts. And so when it comes to pain management in a chronic pain patient, Dr. Elliott, who is our pain team doctor that day, would have led that care. So he would have made the decisions? He would make the pain care decisions. All right. Now, are you um, in any, or at this point, at, at that point back then, were you in any uh, executive position at the hospital? At that point in time, I was the chair of the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee. I'm sorry, chair of? Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee. Okay. So based on everything you saw about Beata Kowalski, there was no need, I'm just talking about what you saw, mm -hmm. there was no need to consider keeping Maya there. Like I explained to you, she was cooperative with our plan of care. She did ask for things that I did not feel were indicated and we would have a discussion about that. You've had multiple parents, maybe every day, ask you for different treatments for their children that you may not agree with. Is that true? Correct, yes. That in and of itself would not be a basis to take her away from her little girl, would it? Sustained. Would that be enough to keep them there? Can, can I see the attorneys, please? Sure.
members of the jury, please disregard the last question that was asked. Anything else, Mr. Anderson? Uh, no, Your Honor. Based on that. Any redirect? Very briefly, Your Honor. Uh, you were asked, uh, Doctor, if all children had a CRPS program at the time of this in 2016. They did not, correct? Correct. And was the reason you were attempting to facilitate transfer to Nemours was because they did? It was both because the family had requested to transfer to Nemours and they have a program that could actually take care of my and her CRPS, yes. No further questions. Anything further? No, Your Honor. Members of the jury, do any of you have any questions? Of our presence, Dr. Smith, if I could have you wait outside as we go over these questions outside your presence. Michelle Smith is outside of our presence. The first question, at the time you saw Maya, you just testified their, quote, red flag, end quote, did, quote, you, end quote, call the child abuse hotline to report your, quote, red flags, end quote, or did the hospital just reach out to Sally Smith off the record first to come in and give guidance on the case first as an expert? Here's the page. Sustains the objection. You will not ask that question. Red page number two. As the treating uh, physician in the PICU, what diagnosis were you treating Maya for? We have seen her admitting and discharge diagnosis on her discharge paperwork as conversion or factitious disorder. And or question mark. Can you tell us what your diagnosis was as the treating physician? Uh, if you meet as a team to hear about the weekend to take over, uh, would the physician you are taking over for tell you they considered leaving AMA? Page number three, when signing discharge papers, does that admit the patient to agreeing 
with the diagnosis or does it only acknowledge receiving the discharge information? Next question. Do the same answers apply with transfer orders? Someone's objecting or not? We're objecting. To the first one? Yes. And your position, I guess it would be with both of them. Do you object or not object? Object as well? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I sustain the objection that those won't be asked. Next question, red number four. How much IV hydration was Maya receiving at the time in the PICU? Was she taking any oral intake? When Maya stopped ketamine in your hospital, did Maya show any withdrawal symptoms in your hospital? I'm sorry? Okay. No objection. Okay, red page number five. Dr. Smith, you referred to ketamine as being or being like a psychotropic medication. This, to my knowledge and remembrance of testimony heard in these proceedings, is the first time the words ketamine and psychotropic drug have been used in the same sentence. Is ketamine in a medical... Uh, prescription description listed as a psychotropic drug or is ketamine listed as a drug and only the or possible temporary side effects could be brain fog or hallucinations. Okay. Anything else? Or can we bring in the jury? Nothing. Uh, let, let me ask you this. Since we have just, since they're on a break and we're going an hour now, do you want to just take a five minute and then as soon as this witness is over, call the next witness? I can do that, I guess. Whatever the judge would like. Well, I'm just trying to think from an efficiency standpoint so we, we don't have to take a break in 10 or 15. Let's take five minutes and then we'll bring the jury in. Let the jury know we'll be back.
everybody. Any issues we need to address before we bring the jury back in? No, no, no the sure, Your Honor. Your Honor. Let's bring in the jury, please. A moment, okay. Sounds like it's going to be a moment. Can someone get Dr. Yes. Uh, Michelle Smith, please? Okay, please be seated. Members of the jury, I want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and received no information. Is that all correct? Correct. And while you were on break, did anyone approach you about this case? No. Did anyone review any media accounts of this case while on break? And uh, members of the jury, I have re reviewed the questions uh, outside the presence of Dr. Michelle Smith uh, with the attorneys. I'm going to be able to ask some, but not all of them. Uh, Dr. Smith, as the treating physician in the PICU, what diagnosis were you treating Maya for? So we were um, treating her for an acute pain exacerbation, and we, at that point in time, had the um, CRPS diagnosis, but this was an acute pain exacerbation that we were treating and managing with the pain team. We also were evaluating her for the abdominal pain that she came in, and so the GI service was also evaluating her at the same time. Uh, we have seen her meaning Maya Kowalski's admitting and discharge diagnosis on her discharge paperwork as conversion or factitious disorder. Can you tell us what your diagnosis was as the treating physician? I took care of Maya for the, the three days, and that was my only ex time with her. And at that point in time, we were treating her for an acute pain exacerbation and abdominal pain um, with the diagnosis of CRPS. Okay. Next question, if you meet as a team to hear about the weekend to take over care, would the physician you are taking over for tell you that they, meaning the Kowalskis, are considering leaving uh, AMA? Yes, that would have been discussed with, um, with me during any handoff. Next question, how much IV hydration was Maya receiving at the time in the PICU? The exact amount I am not, I'm not certain, but what we would normally do is put them on normal maintenance fluids that is, would be the requirement for a person who's not eating or drinking anything at that time. Was Maya taking any oral intake in the PICU? I think she was drinking a little bit and not eating much solids. When Maya stopped ketamine in your hospital, did Maya show any withdrawal symptoms in your hospital? We discontinued the ketamine on Wednesday, and that was my last day taking care of her, so I would have only been involved with her for several hours while she was off the ketamine. Next question. Uh, you referred to ketamine as being or being like a psychotropic medication. This, to my knowledge and remembrance of testimony heard in these proceedings, is the first time the word ketamine and psychotropic drug have been used in the same sentence. Is ketamine in a medical uh, diagnosis description listed as a psychotropic drug, or is ketamine listed as a drug? 
and only the or possible temporary side effects could be brain fog or hallucinations. Um, ketamine is a dissociative agent, and so um, that is what we typically talk about it as a dissociative agent, and it's used for anesthesia. Um, when I use it, it's used for sedation. I'm not sure if that exactly addressed that question. Well, I'm sure if there's further follow-ups, they will ask. <laughs> Please. Uh, defense, do you have any further follow-up? Uh, just a couple, Your Honor, I think. If I might. Uh, first of all, uh, to be clear, Dr. Smith, you were taking care of this patient in the time frames we just talked about, December, uh, excuse me, October 10th through 12th of 2016. Yes, Monday through Wednesday. And the only transfer effort made at that time was to Nemours, correct? Correct. And, it, and that transfer was based on the diagnosis you folks had at the time? Correct. Did you have an understanding or did you express, did you have an understanding as to why the family did not wish to have the transfer done at that time? Nemours wouldn't accept her in transfer. Um, so the plan with Nemours was that she would be enrolled in their outpatient program. Okay. Was there, did you ever have an understanding as to, to why, if they did, the family did not wish to, to transfer to the outpatient program? Mom wanted to go somewhere where she could get an intrathecal pump, and Dr. Santana had explained that that was not part of their their program. Objection. Hearsay. Going to let it stay. Um, you you were asked some questions about the uh, the extent to which uh, Maya was getting IV fluid. Yes. On the unit. I'm going to ask that uh, 1001 73 and 74, that's an evidence judge as part of the joint exhibit. If it's in, in you can put it up. Uh, I'd ask that it be put up. And there's a section there on the second page of that note entitled Fluids, Electrolytes, and Nutrition. Um, would that end? Well, first of all, were you folks tracking? Uh, Maya's intake and output. Yes, every patient that is in the intensive care unit, everything that goes in them, whether it be through their mouth or through an IV, gets recorded, and anything that goes out also gets recorded. Okay. And was the patient at the time, at the, at the end of your tenure here, had the patient been placed on something called TPN? Yes. Um, the mother had asked for her to be put on TPN. TPN is a uh, IV formulation of nutrition um, that includes the basic um, requirements for nutrition. Um, my initial conversations with mom was that typically we do not use TPN in patients when we can use their GI tract. So if, you're, if you can tolerate enteral feedings, that's the most natural way to be fed. Um, Mom raised concerns that the placing of a nasogastric tube to give her the feedings would be distressful for Maya, and she requested TPN. We also don't usually start TPN um, for short-term nutrition, um, and so we would not be providing it at the time of discharge. Mom had said, Mom had instructed me that she would be able to find somebody that would be able to prescribe the TPN as an outpatient. Um, once we had GI involved and we knew that she was not going to be eating for probably several more days, we did start her on some TPN, okay. but not with the plan of discharging her on the TPN. Right. Okay. Um, that's all I have. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Plaintiff? No questions. Members of the jury, anything further? And may Dr. Michelle Smith be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Defense, call your next witness, please. All right, Your Honor. Um, I'd like to call Dr. Beatrice Teposanchez.
Thank you, Dr. Smith. Absolutely. I swear, yes. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Could you tell us your name, please, ma'am? Beatriz Tepa Sanchez. Okay. Dr. Tepa Sanchez, where are you from? I'm from Venezuela. Okay. Um, what is your job today? I'm a critical care physician at All Children's. Okay. And how long have you been at All Children's Hospital? Probably close to eight years. I started in 2016. Okay. Uh, would you tell the jury... Uh, how you received and where you received your, your education and training. Sure. Um, I went to medical school in Venezuela, um, and then right after medical school, um, I did all my uh, requirements, testing, and everything to be able to come to the United States um, to do my residency. Um, so I got married, um, left the country because of the situation of, our, of Venezuela, and um, came to Texas where I did my pediatric residency at Driscoll Children's Hospital. Uh, that was for three years, and then uh, I was accepted at Emory University in Atlanta for my critical care fellowship. After that, um, I was able to find my dream job. Also, my husband's a physician, so uh, that's at St. Petersburg, all children's, um, and that was my first um, job as an attending. Okay, and you've been, you said, with all children since 2016? 16, yes. Okay. Uh, and are you board certified? Yes, I am. Would you tell the jury what you're board certified in? I am board certified in pediatrics and also in pediatric critical care medicine. Okay. Uh, I keep trying to remember to ask this question, and I haven't done it, so I'm going to ask you. What does board certification mean? What do you have to do to be board certified? So basically you have to study a lot um, and present uh, the exam. So. Um, the boards, the pediatric, American Academy of Pediatrics, um, have boards for general pediatricians. And then they also have boards, the American Board of Pediatrics also has boards, which is just a big, big test um, that goes, it's like four hours or sometimes even more, um, through all the general requirements that a person that is um, trained on that uh, profession should be able to you know, pass those testing. And uh, you've maintained your board certifications? Yeah, and it also includes not just the test, um, for that. Um, you have to do maintenance of certification. So basically throughout those years you have to accumulate points with going to conferences, taking extra trainings, um, you know, like two or three days seminars and things like that. Um, and each of those have specific points. So you have to reach an, a certain amount of points to be board certified. Now, uh, have you brought your notes from your uh, care of Maya Kowalski with you today? Yes, I okay. have them in front of me. I, I need to know that so I know what to, <laughs> to, to uh, what you got there. I have my HMP, which is my history and physical on the day of admission on the 7th. I have my progress note from the 8th and my progress note from the 9th. Okay. So let's start by your telling the jury, if you would, what it was that you were involved with Maya Kowalski's care. So my involvement with her care was uh, basically on the day of admission to the ICU. Uh, that is on the 7th, that during the afternoon. So I understand she came to the ER first and was there for several hours as you know the evaluations were being done, but then she actually arrived to our ICU that afternoon. I believe it was somewhere probably around 4 p.m. or so. Um, it's kind of my recollection, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. And did you just happen to be the, the the pediatric ICU intensivist on duty that day? Yeah, there's usually two of us during the day and one at night. So mm -hmm. during the day, the call about presenting the, the patient uh, was given to Dr. Farhan Malik uh, because he was the admitting doctor that was taking care of all those admissions that were coming. And then he would have, be the person that would assign either to his team or to my team, and um, based on number of patients and acuity. Uh, and at that moment, it, it came to my team. Okay. 
And had you ever met or heard of the Kowalskis before? No. Okay. Had, 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 you, had you ever ever had any contact with them? No. Okay. And so just for purposes of clarification, when we refer to the pediatric ICU, that's frequently referred to as the PICU, right? Yes, the okay. PICU. So I'll, I'll try to <laughs> remember Easier. that. Okay. So tell us uh, what happened when you first encountered the Kowalskis. So um, as usual, my usual practice is um, in the unit, they'll let us know when the patient arrives. Of course, it's an ICU, so the first thing we do is actually go to the patient to make sure that the room, sorry, to make sure that the patient's stable and doesn't need anything right and then. Um, at that moment, um, I recall the nurses were, as usual, as our usual practice, putting like the stickers for the monitors, um, checking the IV, that's our usual practice, getting another weight um, on our patient and things like that. But there was, it was, it was very chaotic at the time. Um, there was, um, you know, the nurses were trying to do, put their stickers and for, put her on the monitors. Um, and there was just a lot of very loud um, environment um, and a lot of screaming. Um, so my initial encounter was to just try to calm everything and try to take what I was seeing and see if I needed to do something right and then uh, or if the patient needed anything. I needed vital signs. I needed to make sure I could examine her. Um, so there was a lot of screaming from Amaya and then there was a lot of kind of loud um, discussions from with mom between mom and the nurses. Okay, and, and what was the source of all the hubbub, if you, if I can say, if I can use that? Sure, um, I think uh, at that moment, uh, as the nurses were trying to put the monitors in Maya, the concern was that she was in pain, um, and that everything that was being done was causing pain. Um, so Maya was saying that you know she was hurting and there was a lot of pain that she needed her medica her anesthesia medications. She, I remember her saying those words, um, and then Mom also saying you're hurting her. You, you don't know how to treat this patient. Um, you know you need to listen to me. Um, and it was kind of like a you know discussion between them. So were you able to to take a history of what was going on here? I eventual, eventually was. Um, at the beginning, I think, you know, my interaction was more, okay, let's calm down. We really need to get her for vital signs. I want to, you know, she was clear, Maya was clearly suffering. Um, so I wanted to make sure I had at least the minimal information I needed so I could choose the right interventions for her. Okay. And what, uh, what interventions did you choose? What did you do? So at that moment, um, after at least we had some basic vital signs, um, I, I recall um, that we did give her a benzodiazepine to try to just kind of get the, um, the anxiety and um, the nervousness and stress kind of calm down so we can at least do a physical exam and have more effective communication between the family and me. Okay, so what's a benzodiazepine? It's a medication that's a sedative. Uh, mostly, it doesn't really take care of pain, um, it, depending on the dose. Um, you can do it more for like anxiolysis, um, may take the anxiety down, but if you do enough of it, um, you can make somebody just kind of go to sleep. Okay. What, uh, what diagnostic studies, if any, did you consider conducting at that time? So um, at that time, I knew that the, the ER had done some basic laboratory studies, um, blood work. Um, and they had suggested doing some type of imaging studies to the belly, uh, to the abdomen. And at that time, uh, on my limited physical exam, the family's concern, main concern, was not only like pain everywhere, but mostly abdominal pain. That's what they brought, why she was brought to the hospital. So um, after obtaining just very basic information, um, I did consider that, you know, kind of discussing how we can get some type of imaging uh, to her belly. Um, my concern was, um, even though, you know, we have a reported chronic pain diagnosis, that you could still have a pathology that is causing the abdominal pain that might be exacerbating the pain, like, you know, appendicitis or something else. And I didn't, I didn't want to miss that. I, I wanted to make sure that while honoring all of her history that we still also look to see if there is something else going on which might need different interventions. 
So what? Let, let's let's make sure we're clear on this. What complaints did did you hear uh, Maya voicing at this time? So she just kept saying it's hurting. Um, she would call out like any other kid to her mother, and mom, please, I'm hurting. Um, the things that um, developmentally, you know, kind of stuck to me and still after all these years is she was saying things like, I need my anesthesia medication, I need my medications. Um, she would tell the nurses, give me my medicine. Um, she would say, I need you to push the medicine. I mean, those are things that I have heard between us, you know, in the medical field. Um, and that kind of stuck in my head as a 10 year old, you know, kind of requesting very specific things. She would, she would say the names of the medications that also kind of stuck in, in my head a little bit. Um, but, you know, we had the pain team had already been contacted in the ER and I had also put another call that let them know that she was in the ICU. Um, so I really, you know, they came very promptly. Um, so I really wanted, she was suffering. She was clearly suffering. And, you know, while we were getting all our information, I wanted to get her in a place that she was at least a little bit alleviated from that suffering. Who was the pain, when you say the pain team, who was yeah. the pain team that, that, that responded? Sure, yeah. It's um, an anesthesiologist, as you've heard. Um, that day, I'm pretty sure it was Dr. Jenny Dolan, uh, who was... Um, the anesthesiologist covering, uh, representing the pain team. Okay. Now, what, uh, what, let me get, let me go back for just a minute. Mm -hmm. You've talked about abdominal pain and you're concerned about that. What other sources of pain were you hearing expressed? Yes, um, at that moment, um, you know, Maya, like what I was seeing, Maya was saying it, it was hurting. Um, and it was mostly related to, like I said, the nurses trying to put the stickers on the chest so we can get the telemetry, which is that monitoring, um, and also evaluate the respiratory rate and things like that. Um, Mom was on and off, kind of like on the bed with her or off talking to me. Um, and it, it really struck me that um, the stimulus to the pain where she would like, I was trying to kind of gather what was making her hurt. Um, you know, it deferred to whoever was doing it. So it was the nurse putting the stickers. It was like, oh, that hurts, that hurts so much. Please don't do that. Um, and, but, you know, mom would hug, hug her and, you know, rub her back. But that didn't seem to be hurting. Um, so at the time, I was trying to just gather what was hurting uh, in the kind of chaotic moment. And it just, to me, it was hard, obviously, doing a physical exam with me putting my hands on her, I tried to kind of defer to where she was a little bit more calm to try to see exactly what was hurting. Um, so it wasn't terribly clear um, what specifically was causing her the most pain. Um, so did you have the opportunity to gather a history of, from the patient or from her mother about what brought them to the hospital and what had gone before? Yeah, I think once, um, you know, we gave her the benzodiazepine, the pain team came, we started talking about a plan. Things kind of simmered down. She was already on some of the monitors. Um, and then I did, you know, our rooms have the bed for the patient and then there's a couch uh, where usually the family sits a little bit on the side. Um, so I tried to, Maya seemed to be a little bit calmer and I did sit down on the couch and just kind of like my usual technique in any patient is, um, you know, we work in a high stress environment. So there's not uncommon the families sometimes are, there's a lot going on. So I let the families kind of just vent out, talk, um, and that way, you know, they can get out of the way anything that they want to say and then we can actually have a more effective communication. So at that time, yes. Um, we we started going back, like, let's just go back from the beginning, tell me, you know, what, what her admissions have been in the past, has she ever had surgery, you know, the usual questions. And we went through as much as she told me, um, and as I was taking notes, um, all of, like, probably the prior year uh, is where most of the focus was on all her ER presentations and admissions. Okay. Now, when she came to the PICU from the ER, had you had the opportunity to speak with anyone from the ER? Not personally, no. The call was directly uh, from the ER to the admitting physician in the PICU, which at that time, that day, was Dr. Farhan Malik. I see. 
And did you have any understanding about whether the patient had already received any kind of pain medication? Yes. When Dr. Farhan uh, told me th this patient... Did you receive any information regarding whether or not the patient had had pain medication in the ER? Yes. Okay. And what was your understanding? That she had received a ketamine uh, dose, um, and I believe a benzodiazepine and magnesium, okay. I, I think. And did you administer any additional pain medication? I did. And what, Later. what, what did you get? So after discussing with the pain team, we did administer starter on a Presidex infusion, which is the dexmetomidine, even it's hard for you to say it, so I say Presidex. Um, we started a ketamine infusion with a specific dose um, uh, of three milligrams per kilo per hour. Um, and then we prescribed a benzodiazepine volume, uh, just as a PRN, just as needed basis. And were there any diagnostic studies that you were attempting to get at that time? Yeah, and sorry, I forgot to mention. On Propofol, we did um, prescribe that for the evening time so she could sleep. Okay. Um, your question was based on diagnostic studies. Um, the order had already been placed for a abdominal CT scan, um, but at the time, you know, we still kind of kept that within our plan of what we wanted to achieve. Um, but um, the family at the time, specifically mom, um, said that we could not do the study unless she was completely sedated. So we had kind of held on performing the study. Okay. And, and was that study eventually performed? Yes, that was performed. I believe it was Saturday night. So the admission was a Friday afternoon. Okay. So let me clarify that. You were... You saw her on a Friday afternoon. What what did your shift? Excuse me. I'm sorry. What did your shift consist of on that Friday? So my shift on the Friday usually I end at 5 p.m. is when we do our sign up for the night team. So if you can say she got to our unit about 3 or 4 p.m. So it's towards the end of my shift. My shift consisted of coordinating, getting as much information as we could, coordinating and making sure that the right people were involved in her care and created a plan for specifically the, mo the most immediate plan, which would be that evening and night, um, to get her s stable during that time. And when you say you, you developed a plan, who did you develop it with? Um, the pain team, which was Dr. Jenny Dolan, um, and um, the ICU team. Um, I believe Dr. Dolan spoke with other members of the pain team uh, during that time okay. as well. And uh, what was the plan at that so the plan was to stabilize Maya and make sure that she wasn't at the level of suffering that we were seeing um, and included the medications that I just um, stated, which are the infusions of ketamine and Presidex, Propofol during that first night for a specific amount of time. I believe we said four to six hours. Um, and then if able, if there's still significant concerns of her abdomen, at some point getting uh, the CT scan. Uh, during all this discussion with the mother and, and the view of what had gone on, did you, did you receive any information regarding what ketamine or what other drugs the patient had been taking? Yes. Um, the mom informed me uh, of the medications that she was taking at patient. Um, not all of them, there was like vitamins and things like that, but um, mostly the ketamine treatments that she was receiving. Um, she did mention that she was a patient of Dr. Kirkpatrick and, I, and Dr. Hannah, and that um, she would go regularly to get, um, depending on where her, you know, exacerbation of her pain was, to get these infusions of high doses, um, she told me all the doses, um, of the ketamine um, to kind of, in her you know, kind of explanation was to try to break that pain. Um, she also mentioned that she had been to um, Mexico for a, I believe was a week, um, where they did an, an infusion um, of high dose ketamine and that she was intubated during the time. Um, and that at this, you know, on our admission, she was asking me to please uh, start those medications, uh, the ketamine at those doses and that I needed to intubate her, that we had to intubate her and do the whole, you know, kind of a week or whatever, how many days um, it would require because that's the only thing that would take her pain away. 
during all this exchange, were you given any indication of what the diagnosis of this patient had been at Lurie Children's Hospital? No, she did mention that she went to Lori's at some point within the last year uh, to Chicago um, for um, a second opinion, and it's, I believe it's in my HMP as I try to summarize everything. Uh, but that she went there, she didn't really tell me what the diagnosis was. Okay. And, and with respect to, to Tampa General Hospital, were you told of her being evaluated there or what the diagnosis may have been? She also said that she went to Tampa General. Um, I don't believe she told me in details. Um, I don't recall that, and I didn't, it's not in my records. What, to what were you told regarding what the patient's diagnosis was? She said that her diagnosis was uh, CRPS, um, but that it was all in her entire body. Um, manifestations were in her entire body. Um, and then she also said that she had a history of asthma, um, for what she went into all the details of prior asthma or coughing visits to the ER, um, to the pulmonologist, uh, which I then went to the records to, because some of them were in our institution. Were there, uh, now this was in addition to the, the abdominal pain that she was In addition, with. yes, sorry. And um, did you arrive at any under, well, let me, let me back up now, just ask a question this way. Who was it that was undertaking to manage the patient's pain medications? During our admission or before? During our admission? At this point in time. It was, uh, I seek guidance from the pain team. Um, and uh, they would tell me the plan with the medications. And then I, my job is making sure that, like the rest of her organs and everything else is stable. So I would look at their plan from the, from the pain standpoint and just make sure that I was monitoring the right things for the medications that were being utilized. Did you call for any other consultations besides the, just the pain team? That first day? Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, Consultations? I don't be. Oh yes, uh, we did. Um, I talked to the, uh, mom about you know she expressed a lot of level of stress um, and um, you know as as part of my basic knowledge of chronic pain, we always know that there's a psychological stress that probably needs support with counseling and so I did offer um, and told her that we were going to consult our psychiatrists. Okay, and what was there? Were there other? Consultations ordered as well. Uh, not that the that day we did not communicate to the family of any other consultations. And, and was the psychiatric consultation conducted? Conducted now. Why? Um, the mom didn't feel like she needed that. Okay, okay. so when I you believe actually the psychiatrist came. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. But the mom didn't want it. Okay. So what was the diagnosis upon admission to the PICU as far as you, you were concerned? Yes. Let me just refer to my notes for a second. So in, in the ICU, we have chronic diagnosis and acute diagnosis. The chronic is pretty much relating to the history. So um, it's um, complex regional pain syndrome. And the second one is mild persistent asthma. But our acute diagnosis at the time were acute generalized pain exacerbation and abdominal pain. Okay. And there was a notation of uh, constipation uh, seen in the x-ray that was obtained in the, for the belly. Okay. And um, did you... Let me direct your attention to your note. Mm -hmm. Now, instantly, you, you wrote... What's called a history and physical? Yes. Okay, would you explain to the jury what that is? So that is basically the initial note that does a summary of the presenting, like the uh, HPI, which is the story of the acute event uh, that brought the patient to the hospital. And then it goes very systematically and organized into all the elements of the history, being process hospitalizations, surgeries, any medications that the patient usually takes, any prior diagnoses any social exposures, um, developmental, especially in pediatrics, we like to talk about you know, where they are developmentally. Um, then we go into um, the review of systems. Then we go into any labs that are available uh, that are pertinent to that admission, any imaging studies. And then we go into our assessment, which include our, you know, we call it problem list, like our diagnoses, and then our plan. 
by systems as well. Okay, so I'm going to ask that um, 1001 uh, dash uh, 31 to 38 be put up. And Your Honor, that's in evidence as part of uh, the All Children's Hospital chart. And that begins on the bottom of this page, I believe. Uh, and let me ask to scroll over to the, um, and we're, we're going to publish this along with the uh, Dr. Smith's records in a few moments here. But I'd ask for um, the this to scroll over to the plan portion of this. And I'll ask you, Dr. Tepa Sanchez, um, what was the plan for this patient upon the patient's admission? So the plan was to closely monitor, as we do in all our patients in the ICU, um, that we had consulted the pain team and we would continue communication with them based on the complaints of pain. Um, we created that plan, which is detailed there in number three of the medications that we were going to utilize and what doses we were going to start at the medication on. And uh, later um, in that paragraph, um, we had already discussed uh, that that treatment would go over for at least three days to make sure that we have her under you know, a much better um, control of her pain for those three days before considering any type of weaning. Um, we explain all this to the family as well. Um, I do put a notation in there. We like to anticipate in the ICU so that if for some reason she required uh, higher doses and that our team decided to do higher doses that we expressed to the family that at that point the risk of um, respiratory failure or any type of cardiac um, you know, pathology could arise and that she might need to be intubated. Um, then I did consult social work um, I also consulted psychiatrists, so that's part of the plan. Um, as a multidisciplinary team, we wanted to evaluate all the possible causes of um, suffering for Maya. Um, and uh, at some point, um, mom, you know, had kind of agreed, uh, but then once the physician came, she denied it. Uh, we were continuing to do neurological checks based on her mental status, depending on her, the doses of the medications. For that night, we did not want to let her eat. We did put her on IV fluids to make sure she was hydrated. And the reason was because we don't ever want to, if we have to intubate a patient, we don't want any food in their belly because they can vomit and then aspirate. Um, and then we did prescribe um, things like Sofran, which is for nausea. Um, and the... Uh, we knew that there was a concern of constipation, so we were just going to closely monitor that for now. We didn't want to give any medications for that because we didn't want to put anything in her belly just in case. Um, I have the abdominal CT uh, still within my plan to be performed at some point to obtain a urine analysis to make sure she wasn't having like a UTI that was causing her the pain. Um, SCDs um, that basically are like um, these compression uh, devices on the legs to prevent any type of clots. Um, we do that a lot in our ICU, and I think that's it. Okay. Now, before formulating that plan, had you gone back and looked at the records of All Children's Hospital for the patient's previous admissions and encounters? Yes, as much as with the time, you know, that I was there, um, I did as much as I could uh, to look at notes from before, um, especially to create this document because I wanted to make sure um, everything was coherent. Okay, and, you, and, and in doing that, how many records did you review? It looks like there's several pages here. Yes, um, I went through mostly what I recall is going through um, like the prior ER visits to our ER uh, there were notes from consultations and follow-up visits with the pulmonologist as well. Those are the ones that I recall um, the most. Okay. Now, um, was there any, any issues that you had with Mrs. Kowalski regarding the amount of medication that was being given? Um, you know, the, her initial requests were of really high doses. So I don't know if when you mean issues, like more of that discussion that we had, um, that I was not comfortable given uh, those amount of doses. I had never, I think, gotten anywhere close. Um, and that was gen definitely out of my wheelhouse. Um, 
So I did mention to her that I did not feel comfortable doing that, that I was consulting with the pain team as the anesthesiologist that um, deal with this type of um, kind of chronic pain type of patients. Um, so it was a back and forth on the dosing. Like we would come and create a plan and like we're gonna start the ketamine. At, I usually start at like 0.5 milligrams per kilo or one milligram per kilo, uh, but for a different reasons, not specifically for pain. With the painting, we came up to three milligrams per kilo is where we were going to start. Um, the doses that we've been requested were more like 10 milligrams per kilo. So there was a back and forth on the dosing of what we were going to do. Was the pain team taking primary responsibility for taking care of the uh, pain medication and yes. pain management? Okay. And um, what was, did, did you have any exchange with Mrs. Kowalski about her level of stress and, and Maya's level of stress at that time? Yes, um, I recall during that time when we sat down and kind of were able to have more effective communication. Um, she did uh, express how stressed she had been. I, I believe I also note that on my HMP, on the HPI part. Um, she was saying that she, this, this had been, you know, a really rough year for them um, and that she had been very stressed. Um, and um, she did mention that at times she just felt like she just couldn't do it anymore um, and that she, either her and Maya um, as well, were very stressed and thought that, you know, that at times she just wanted to die. Um, she also said, um, and I put it in quotes, um, that she just wanted to go to heaven. Okay. Now, did you offer to assist Mrs. Kowalski about that? Yes. Um, you know, after that was said, um, and, you know, we continue our discussion, you know, I asked her if she had a support system that, you know, that we could definitely consult our psychiatr psychiatry department for Maya and that with the social work we can get uh, counseling for her and kind of get her resources at this moment. And she, um, when I said that, she said, no, no, well, I'm okay, I'm okay now. I don't, I'm not thinking about that right now. Um, so then I, I told her, I offered, like, if she ever needed, you know, help to try to find resources, uh, or if she needed, you know, if she was having more trouble, that we could help try to find people that could take care of her. Um, but definitely for Maya, that um, even more reason to get psychiatry involved. So you couldn't take care of Mrs. Kowalski, but mm -hmm. you were offering to do so for Maya. Yes, but I did offer to get her resources and, you know, kind of names and where to go for her. Um, do you have any other recollection of what occurred on this Friday, uh, October 7th, 2016? No, my recollection is more um, of personally, I wanted to make sure that there was a consistent plan that we would all follow um, with all of our team. Um, I usually, like I said, I usually sign out to the night team about 5 p.m. We start our sign up process is about like an hour because it's about all the patients in the ICU. Um, but that day, you know, because of all the coordination, I actually probably end up leaving the unit uh, or the hospital about 8, 8.30 p.m., um, which is way past <laughs> the okay. usual time. Um, at the time, well, now you were seeing the Kowalskis the following day, is that right? Yes, yeah, so then um, I took care of uh, them for Saturday during the day. Usually a day starts at 7, 7.30, and then ends at 5, and Saturday and Sunday. Um, I believe on Sunday, because it's a weekend sometimes, if there's not, like, a lot of, like, critical patients or we're not getting a lot of admissions, during the weekend sometimes one of us leaves early. So I believe uh, I left a little bit earlier than five uh, on Sunday. On Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, what about on Saturday? Did you, were there any do, new developments on Saturday when you took care of Yeah, so during the Saturday um, we basically just continued our plan. Um, at that point, you know, I had, I had um, kind of like the sign up from the night team and some of the more events from the exposure of be taking care of Maya from nurses. Um, and after reviewing the, the, you know, all the notes that I had, um, yeah, I had some questions in my mind um, that were not clear. Um, you know, I would have questions about a lot of like the home therapies um, that Mrs. Kowalski had mentioned that she was doing like IV um, fluid infusions at home, that she would do them herself, and also IVIG. 
And so when I went into a lot of... Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Um, did there come a point on that Saturday? Well, we approach on. So, Thank you, Your Honor. Um, on Saturday, October 8th, did there come a point in time at which you, you, call, you called Dr. Sally Smith? Yes. And did you call Dr. Sally Smith as a consultant? Yes, I called her to ask her questions. Okay. Thank you. The, um, you had questions, just answer this question yesterday, you had questions in your mind so you called her? Yes. Okay. Um, did you continue to see uh, the Kowalskis on that Sunday, uh, October the 9th? Yes, main, mainly um, Saturday and Sunday, it was um, Dad that was there, mostly. Okay. Um, I did communicate with Mom uh, over the phone. And what, would, what, if anything, about the treatment plan changed on Saturday and Sunday? Not much, um, to be honest. Um, during the night, we did the propofol only the first night. Um, so the only thing, we continued the ketamine infusion. It had gone up on the dose a little bit by that Saturday, um, from 3 per milligrams per kilo to 5. It's my understanding after reviewing my records. Um, we did not do any more propofol. Um, during the night, um, and I believe that Saturday night she got the CT scan, which we didn't have the results yet by the time I was there during the morning um, on Sunday. 
So by Sunday, was there a plan made to wean Maya off these medications? So there was starting the discussions that um, on Monday we would start the weaning process, I believe. Um, during that weekend, were the, the, the pain team continued to see Maya? The pain team continued to see Maya, yes. And did they continue to monitor her pain medications and her pain level? Yes. Did it appear to you over that weekend that they, you, were able to make Maya comfortable? Yes. Um, uh, she was not uh, anywhere near the state that she had been on that Friday when she came to us. Um, and then I believe on my note from the Sunday, the 9th, um, after a sit down with uh, dad and then mom was on the phone, um, dad did express that she was uh, at a better state that Sunday and a, and a better control of her pain. Okay. And I documented that on my notes for Sunday. Okay. Um, on Sunday, did it come to your attention that the family wanted to transfer a mom? No. Uh, up to the time I was in the unit, they did not tell me. Oh, transfer, yes. Sorry. Okay. Um, transfer, yes. Okay. They didn't say that they wanted to leave. But yes, what did, you, did you attempt to facilitate a transfer? Yes. Um, the process, especially during the weekend, can be a little bit, um, you know, kind of complicated, but I did call Nemours. Um, and started that process um, to be able to get connected to the physicians that um, would be able to accept Maya and transfer. Yeah, were you able to reach anybody on that Sunday? Not just the transfer center uh, from Nemours. Not, I did not personally speak with uh, any of the physicians at Nemours. So were you able to do anything in terms of facilitating the transfer that weekend? Uh, I just initiated the process, but I personally wasn't able to do anything okay. past that. Okay. Now, um, you were on, we talked about October 7th, the Friday, October 8th, the Saturday, October 9th, the Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, who did you hand over to, so to speak? So that Sunday evening or early night time, I uh, contacted Dr. Michelle Smith, um, who was taking over for that Monday. And, and then at whatever time I left the hospital, I signed out to the doctor that was staying. And, um, and who, who was the pain team that you would be working, that you worked with over that weekend? Mostly Dr. Jenny Dawn is who I recall with her nurse practitioner, um, <coughs> it's who I had my direct interactions that I recall. Give me a smoke, Next. Two other matters. Um, during the weekend, mm -hmm. during this weekend, um, was the diagnosis CRPS from an out from an outside physician? Yes. Okay. And you also had concern about pain all over and abdominal pain. Correct? Yes. Um, The, uh, the protocol that was being used for pain control over the weekend, did you and the pain team discuss that with the parents? Yes, several times. And were they, did they indicate to you they were in agreement? Yeah. Okay. Um, after October 9th, mm -hmm. did you have any further contact with the Kowalski family? No. Were you, were you ever involved in, in Maya's care after that date? No. Okay. Thank you.
No questions. Members of the jury, do any of you have? Jury's out of our presence. Dr. Tepa Sanchez is out of our presence. Uh, first question. In your testimony, you mentioned, quote, die, end quote, and, quote, go to heaven, end quote. One, may you please clarify who made these statements? Two, said within the same interview or over different meetings slash conversations? Three, are these observations clearly recorded in the J. Hatch medical records? Four, are the records that would document these statements entered in evidence? Four, you testified you communicated with Dr. Sally Smith. What date and time? What documentation of, quote, contact was it in an email or medical notation in paper files or verbal with a written follow-up. So all those are okay? Next one, red number two, Dr. Tepa Sanchez. To a patient entering the ER can appear confusing when in fact it can be a highly orchestrated flow of events by many staff members to assist in the best care for the patient. One, how long did Maya spend in the ER before being transferred to the PICU unit? Two, when Maya was transferred to the PICU unit, was the uh, mode or the mood of Maya and parents a more even slash calm level, or was there still a flurry of confusion? Okay. Yeah, we, we don't object to the two questions, Judge. To the my partner says we agree. That sounds like a. I think that's what two agreements today. Three. So I will not ask the introduction. One. Okay, red number three. Did you discuss with Dr. Michelle Smith that the family wanted to leave AMA? Why was the family not able to leave AMA? Isn't it protocol to chart in your charting the end of your chart? being discussed with family or parents. Uh, red number four, 
if someone tells you they want to go to, quote, heaven, end quote, or, quote, die, end quote, did you report that to anyone to see if she needed to be placed on a psych hold if she is threatening that she wants to die? Could you have not called the police or security if you had concerns she was going to harm herself? That's read number four. Red number five. Did the ER doctor, Behar Posey doctor, mention to you or the admitting doctor her concerns of possible child abuse that she testified about in her testimony? Do you have that documented of the back and forth of the ketamine dosages of compromising the one milligram per kilogram to the three milligram kilogram? Will the jury get to see that? Okay. Hang on. I think the first question is dangerous. It invites a chapter 39 response. I think, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have to object to number one, two. Seems okay to me, but number one is going to get us into. It's going to open up me having to ask questions. <laughs> for this call, Your Honor? Because if we do, I think it obviates the question if we don't have immunity for this call. It might be some of the well, the first question is the statement um, by the ER doc to the PICU. And so it's just a question of knowledge. If, if I, don't I, any, I don't have any problem with it. I don't, I don't, I don't think we're going to get in trouble with it, but I don't want to be held to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think I know what you're nice. <laughs> that ain't on my problem. Is, is this something that I could preface it with, uh, with a yes or no answer? Sure. Sure. Did, yeah. did the ER that doctor... The thing to do. Yeah, I guess you could say that. And otherwise, we're okay? I guess so. Okay. Red number six, on October 8th, why did you call Dr. Sally Smith as a consultant and not call the child abuse hotline? Did you not feel you had enough evidence for child abuse? Correct me if I am not correct. You could have just made a call to the child abuse hotline and not call Sally Smith to get started with CPI. Yikes. <laughs> we all know that the reason is that there was a previous call screen on October 7th. So, again, she it's a dangerous know. question. She knew that a call had been made. She didn't know the outcome. Oh, okay. Well, um, inviting her to speculate what the outcome was. She was does, what she no, she, she, she doesn't know. She yeah. feels, feels yeah. she okay, so she doesn't know what the status was. I think it's dangerous. Oh. I think Danger Will Robinson is in order here. Yeah. <laughs> Not that we're lost in space. But but there's, all those. there's a brand new uh, episode about five years ago on Netflix. I just told you about that. The, the robot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What do you watch on Netflix? Take care of my. <laughs> Actually, I watch <laughs> Darkest Hour. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the robot. It's the international sign for flailing. Okay. Uh, so I hear there's an objection to this, uh, this set of questions. Is that correct? Yes, yes Your Honor. I think okay, that's I'm going to sustain. Okay, so we'll not ask that one. 
Next question, red number seven. Was Maya dehydrated prior to arrival? Did you identify her nourishment level? Please describe, quote, SCD, end quote, for pre prevention of blood clotting. Was this from Beata or without Beata's mentions? Right. Your uh, administration of ketamine sounds incrementally or incremental moving slowly and methodically up from there. Yeah, methodically up from there, period. Identical to Dr. Cantu in his, what is the reason dosing of ketamine is done this way? Titration. I think the phrase identical to Dr. Cantu and his, I can strike that out, but then leave in the question, what is the reason of dosing of ketamine is done this way? So I will strike that clause and then ask the question. Okay. Uh, from a timing perspective, we're at 11.30. Remember, I've got to... I'm sorry? Probably get 10 minutes. Well, okay, so do you want to just take lunch when we finish? Okay, welcome everyone, please be seated. Members of the jury, I want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves, you did no investigation and received no information. Is that all correct? And while you were away, you watched all sorts of media accounts about this case, isn't that correct? And uh, did you talk, or did anyone approach you about this case? No. Okay. Uh, and just to let you know, as you saw Dr. Tepa Sanchez walking in, I went over these questions outside of her presence with the lawyers. Um, we're going to be able to ask most, but not all of them, but most of the questions we can. Uh, Dr. Tepa Sanchez, in your testimony, you mentioned, quote, die, end quote, end quote, go to heaven, end quote. May you please clarify who made these statements? The mother. Okay. Um, were these statements said within the same interview or over different meetings slash conversations? That was on the first day, on the 7th, um, when I sat down with her on the couch to get all the history and just kind of try to bond with her. Are these observations clearly recorded in the Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital medical records? I'm going to quote my note and read. Mother states that she is extremely tired and is very stressed and at times feels like she wants to die, unquote. She also express, expressed that when Maya is in so much pain, she has also expressed she wants to go to heaven, unquote. The next question, are the records that would document these statements entered into evidence? The answer to that is yes. Uh, member, uh, the next question, uh, you testified you communicated with Dr. Sally Smith. What date and time? 
I communicated with uh, Dr. Sally Smith on the Saturday, I believe was the 8th. Um, and that was, I don't recall exactly the time, but it was probably after my morning rounds after seeing all the patients. Okay. What documentation of this contact, was it in an email or medical notation in the paper file or verbal with a written follow-up? It was a phone communication. The next question, how long did Maya spend in the emergency room before being transferred to the PICU? I honestly don't know. Okay. When Maya was transferred to the PICU, was the mood of Maya and her parents on a more even slash calmer level or was still there or was there still a flurry of confusion? It was, um, the mood in the room was very chaotic in the PICU. Um, there was a lot of screaming um, and words that I won't say here, <laughs> uh, but just very kind of aggressive at some point. Okay. Now, this next question changes this, Dr. Smith. Um, did you discuss with Dr. Michelle Smith mm -hmm. that the family wanted to leave uh, against medical advice? No, because up to the time I was there on that Sunday, that was never brought up. The transfer to Nemours um, was what we were focused on, but I was never told by the family that they wanted to leave the hospital. Okay. So I didn't communicate that to Dr. Smith. Michelle. So, so the next question, if you know... Why was the family not able to leave AMA? I don't know, because I wasn't there. The next question, um, isn't it protocol to chart in your charting at the end of your charting discussions with family or parents? Yes, usually if there's a sit down, um, we do do a little bit more detailed um, charting, and it's um, on my note from the 9th, my progress note from the 9th, there is a summary of my discussion um, that we had, we call it family meetings, where we sat uh, with, Dr., uh, with uh, Mr. Kowalski. Uh, Ms. Kowalski was uh, in the meeting over the phone on a conference uh, call type of thing. The pain team was there and all the ICU team, and it's recorded in my note. If someone tells you they want to go to, quote, heaven, end quote, or, quote, die, end quote, did you report that to anyone to see if she needed to be placed on a psych hold if she is threatening that she wants to die? So I definitely consulted the psychiatry uh, that we have available at All Children's for um, Maya. And when I started going into with mom about, you know, a little bit more questions of how she was, she said, right now, I'm okay. Um, I have my family. I, I'm okay. I don't have those thoughts right now. So I said, you know, we have counseling. Please communicate to uh, any of us if you're struggling. Um, so I did. That's what I did. Could you have not called the police or security if you had a concern she was going to harm herself? Um, at that point, I would have probably contacted our social worker or, and um, kind of asked what the proceedings would be um, if we had significant concerns on mom if she needed to be baker acted, which is what usually we would do. Um, but she was not my patient. She was the mother of my patient. So, you know, my involvement on how to proceed with that, I would have to seek guidance. Okay. Now. This next question, if you can answer with a yes or no answer. Sure. Did the emergency room doctor, Dr. Behar Posey, mention to you or the admitting doctor her concerns of possible child abuse uh, that she testified about in her testimony? No. Next question. Do you have the document or that documented of the back and forth of the ketamine dosages of comprising the one milligram per kilogram to the three milligram per kilogram. I'm gonna check my records.
from my HBI, I do say she states that at this point she's having a crisis and needs to be placed on an induced medical coma in order to break the pain. And then on my plan, I just state um, the final doses of what we had agreed on to actually give Maya. And, and for the attorneys, uh, these records are in evidence, right? Wait, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Okay. So there was a, a next question is, are these, are the jury going to be able to see it? And yes, these are in evidence. Okay. Um, next question. Was Maya dehydrated prior to arrival? By the time I saw her, um, she had already received some therapies in the ER, so um, I did not appreciate like severe dehydration. Did you identify Maya's nourishment level? Um, I did see um, kind of on my initial impression that she looked very thin. Um, and, you know, we kind of follow the weight. I did consult, I believe, well, it's standard of care. All of our patients get a nutrition evaluation. I honestly don't recall if that was done that day or the next several days. Okay. Please describe, quote, SCD, end quote, for preservation of blood clotting. So, was this from Beata or without Beata's mentions? Um, we all, most of our patients that are a significant size can get this, they're like a pneumatic, almost like socks. They compress your legs, uh, to prevent blood clot. So almost all of our patients that are in the ICU, we discuss every day if they need any type of blood clot, um, prevention. Um, these are the least, um, invasive. There are medications that you can get for preventing. But these are the least invasive that are most effective. Um, and they, some patients actually like them because it's like a massage um, on their legs, especially for the patients that are mobile and things like high risk, like having a central line or a port uh, would put you at a higher risk. Um, so we have our quality list that we go through every patient when we do rounds in the morning. And we go through all of this list to make sure that we discuss this with every patient that we round. And then here you would see that that was initiated because she was at a higher risk. Your administration of ketamine sounds incrementally moving slowly and methodically up. Uh, what is the reason of dosing of ketamine is done this way? So initially, like I said, what I'm used to prescribing ketamine are lower doses. So we started at the three milligrams per kilo per hour. Overnight, the night team, because of whatever concerns and pain, um, they actually did go up to five milligrams per kilo per hour. So usually we, we go by how the patient's responding as we had gone up, make sure the vital signs and everything, all the organs are stable. Um, and I believe that was the highest dose we provided her, um, at least during the weekend. Okay. That completes the jury's questions. Uh, Mr. Hunter. You, Dr. Tepper Sanchez, uh, let's start with the last one. Uh, you said that you had gone up, that, that, that's over the night, they had gone up to five milligrams per kilogram per hour. How long was that in place? Do you remember? The five? Yes. Um, I believe by the time I got there in the morning, um, that Saturday was still at five. Okay. Um, and I did not titrate it. Low, lower or higher for that Saturday and the Sunday, so the whole continuous time. Okay, and did it, did you have an understanding about whether they were weaning down after that from that point? I have an understanding that after that point we agreed, and it's on my notes, um, that that would be the max we would do, and then by Monday it was um, going to start being weaned. Why was that the max? Well, it was at least way above what I was comfortable. We were really concerned about any side effects. And at the time, she seemed to be calmer. So we didn't feel like there was a necessity to go up and up um, and get closer to that risk zone if she was calmer. 
Um, you mentioned that there was um, that there were uh, SCDs, and I can't remember what the acronym means. Honestly, I can't either. <laughs> something compression, compression something. dressing. These are basically compression socks. Yeah, well, okay. yeah, they're they 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 are mechanical. Okay. So they compress. And 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 tell us why that was necessary, or why you did that. Um, like I said, um, you have like a scale that we evaluate, uh, for risk. Um, and because she's in bed, not really walking, that's what they do. Our muscles make sure that the vessels are always being squeezed. Um, and she's not walking. Um, she's been in bed, she's sedated. And the fact that she had a central line, all of that adds up into the risk of having clots. So we start that routinely on a lot of our ICU patients. Is that because of the risk of... Deep vein thrombosis yes. or pulmonary embolus? Yes. Okay. To prevent. Um, there was mention made of the, the exchange you had with Mrs. Kowalski regarding suicide mm -hmm. and her feeling. Did you question her about that? Yes. Okay. I asked her, you know, a little bit, like, if she can elaborate more, if she was in distress right now, that we could help her. Um, and then she said, no, no, you know, I've had these thoughts kind of on and off. Right now, I'm okay. Okay. And did she express to you that she had a support system available? Yes. She talked a lot about um, her family and her church, that she had a lot of friends that were, you know, supportive for them. Okay. Um, so you, did you have any concerns at that moment in time about her mental well-being? Um, not at that moment. Okay. Uh, there was a question asked about the... Um, the patient of the family's behavior when they came up to, to pick you. Yes. And you mentioned some aggressive mm -hmm. uh, speech. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? Um, it was um, Maya um, being 10. It just, it just really stuck with me because um, she would curse, um, saying the F word, um, and just kind of towards me or the nurses. Um, screaming. Um, at one point, she actually was spitting. Um, so that was not something that we, we see in okay. pediatrics. Okay. Um, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Any... Uh Questions, Mr. Anderson? That must have been pretty amazing to you that uh, a 10 year old would drop an F bomb and other things, right? I mean, it was surprising, yes. Okay. How come you didn't put down any of the specifics of that in any of your notes? I don't tend to put. Um, Course words in my notes. I do think at some point, I don't recall where, probably Eden. in my HMP, I did say that there was aggressive language. Well, now you're saying that it involves a 10 year old little girl talking about uh, F bombs and so forth. You didn't think that was significant enough to describe in your notes? Can I have a moment to find it? Because. Okay. It's um, after the abdomen on the physical exam. Very difficult to examine as patients refuses to be touched and mother does not want us to evaluate further unless she's placed an anesthesia medication. Then neurologic. She's very agitated. Eyes are open with intact extraocular movements. No focal weakness. Um, the next period. Very aggressive with staff not able to evaluate deep reflexes. I think I just kind of summarized it. I'm very aggressive with staff just because I don't. 
But you said nothing tended. about what you testified here in front of this jury, did you? I just said very aggressive to staff. Oh, well. And to summarize all that, I don't tend to put specific bad language on my notes. Uh, really? It's a document, so I don't... That, that's like offensive to you. It is offensive to me. Can we... Yes, I'm sorry. Did you finish your answer? Did you finish your answer about it being offensive to you? It is offensive to me. Okay, can we bring up 2175-004? Is this in evidence? Yes. It's in evidence. <laughs> It's uh, an exchange of texts. Judge, beyond scope and relevance, Your Honor, we do our objection to the relevance of this. Overall. Okay. Um, if we could, uh, you had just found out in this. Can you see it there in front of you? Yes. Okay. And, and you just found out that uh, ketamine girl's mom committed suicide, right? Yeah, I believe that was a text that uh -huh. um, let me know about that. Right. Months later. And uh, then you say, I know we did the right thing, but this is really F and then yes. ellipsis, ellipsis I, or star, 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 whatever you call it, up. I feel bad. Yes, I put the little starts going to put in really text that. But isn't it true you testified you don't have any remorse for any of this? Objection, objection, Your Honor. Maybe approach? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm going to sustain the objection and the jury is to disregard the question. All right, but you seem to be okay with texting the F word. To a friend. Right? To a friend. I even put the little stars because I don't like to. Well, and you talked about venous thrombosis. Uh, that's a blood clot in the legs? Yes. Uh, Where they usually initiate in the legs, so that's why we target and these are like the silent killer that can, uh, in children, break free and travel to the heart? So actually in children, um, there's a lot of, you know, kind of studies going on. But there is um, blood clots do originate in legs, um, adults or children. Um, but we have had patients that they can break and go to the lungs. The lungs are like sponges. And a lot of the children actually tolerate that. But we still don't want that happening. We, we try to prevent them. But they can, if they go to the wrong place, be fatal. Can they not? They can. So if Beata Kowalski was concerned about her daughter staying in a uh, laying down supine, I guess you call it laying down situation, and blood clots going to Mai's heart, that would, that would be medical knowledge you would agree with? Um, anybody, including us, would be concerned, yes. And the protocol includes SEDs, we do physical therapy, anything that encourages movement um, prevents. Okay. Um, and insofar as the amounts of ketamine involved, you have no particular expertise in ketamine, especially at that time, right? I had expertise, but for different indications. We use it a lot. Mm -hmm. How many years were you in practice as of this date, October of 2016? Uh, for critical care. So pediatrics, uh, by then I had probably been off residency for about four years. Off and residency? For pediatrics, yes. And then for critical care, that was a year. 
but I did three years of fellowship. Mm -hmm. All right. this time. Anything further, Mr. Hunter? Very, very briefly, Ron. The uh, text messages that council showed, were those from your private phone? Yes. As opposed to the medical record? Yes. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Anderson? <coughs> you have another question? Okay. For the reference to text messages we talked about, were those about three months after you had last seen this patient? Yes. Thank you. Brother Ron. Okay. Any further jury questions?
Dr. Tepa Sanchez. Uh, is it normal between coworkers at Johns Hopkins Alterons Hospital to discuss patients as nicknames such as ketamine girl or other nicknames? Uh, we don't. If it's we're doing it over our personal phones, if we have to uh, or we do, uh, we don't like to put their names. Um, it's an identifier. So uh, we would maybe use a diagnosis um, or something that would make we make sure that the other person receiving the text um, could recall who the, per the patient is without having to go into much detail. Next question. Did you observe dystonia in uh, Maya's feet? To be honest with you, um, I don't recall um, seeing dystonia. It was a lot of movement um, of her legs, um, and maybe there was some inward deviation that I might have um, kind of described on the physical exam, but it was very hard to do a full physical detail exam. Um, so I can't tell you with certainty if I recall exactly what I saw. Uh, did you apply SCD? Yes, I ordered them, and the nurses is actually the, the ones what, that apply it. What date and time? Um, let me recall. I'm sure you can go back and see at some point in the records what the orders were, but um, I believe it was on the 8th. This sounds excruciating for CRPS. What was Maya's reaction? I don't recall if they were actually placed, and I didn't recall having a discussion of how that she was feeling with them. It was ordered. Next question. Did you document uh, Beata's comments of death and going to heaven? Or sorry, you did document Beata's comments of death and going to heaven. Did you also point this out clearly to Dr. Sally Smith during your October 8th after your rounds phone call to Dr. Sally Smith? I don't recall talking to Sally Smith about that a specific point. Okay. Are you the one that said, quote, learned today, end quote? If not, um, do you know now who said it? On the text messages, I'm assuming? I believe that's what it's referring to, yes. No. I didn't. I received that text. Okay. You testified after Maya left your care about October 8th. You had no further contact. But it appears by private text messages you were, quote, keeping up, end quote, on patient Maya. Is that correct? No. First of all, I took care of her un until the 9th. That's the Sunday. Um, and I would have to see the messages because I don't, I don't, I never took care of her and I don't, re I don't think on the messages it says anything of that sort. Would, would seeing the messages help? Yes. Okay, go ahead and put it up, please. So I'm the one on blue if you guys are seeing. So I don't say anything there that I okay. saw her again. Thank you. Mr. Hunter. Very briefly, Your Honor. I'm about to have a text message up again. Is this going to go more than like a minute? One minute. Okay. okay. So I'm trying to find the text message. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the entry learned today is not you, is that correct? Learned it? No, that's not me. That came to you. Not that came to me. Okay. I am on blue. Very good. Thank you. Any follow-up? Did you say that doctors at Johns Hopkins are not allowed to use the patient's name outside to protect their identities? We don't like to use our patients. Well, like, at least me. <laughs> well, I think you said doctors, didn't you? I don't like to. There. I think, you know, I'm trying to use my common practice and say, you know, I can try to generalize, but I'm not, I don't know what others people, or others do. I'm saying the reasons of why. I'm sorry. Can we bring up 2116001? Do you know Dr. D's? 
I do not, Dr. Deese. And she was on... Was... You're on object to him asking this witness about what other doctors are doing. It's the same. I'm not asking a judge. It's just for the use of the name. Well, Dr. Tepa Sanchez isn't a part of this text exchange, right? No. It okay. was uh, directed to so, all doctors. Sustained. Anything further from the jury? Okay, seeing none, members of the jury, I hope you have a wonderful lunch. I'm going to ask that they be back at 1.30. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. Juries out of our presence will be in recess until 115. 115. All right, we're in recess.
Everyone's back from lunch. Uh, what's the next issue? Your Honor, we, we need to uh, make a motion based on the question from plaintiff's counsel through uh, the last witness. Question from Mr. Anderson was, isn't it true you testified you don't have any remorse for any of this? The question was timely objected to. According to the law in the state of Florida. And Mr. Hunter asked me to instruct the jury to disregard the last question, which is what I did. Yes, Your Honor. We, and we appreciate the instruction. The law requires us to make the timely motion for mistrial at the time of the statement, which we would have done after lunch, but I know Your Honor had to go. Just to make the record on this, Your Honor, State Farm Auto versus Thorne at 110 Southern 3rd 66, a Florida 2nd District case held that it was improper and mandated reversal for new trial, where plaintiff's counsel suggested in closing argument that the defense was never taking responsibility and shame on these defendants. Again, in Intramed v. Guider at 93 Southern 3rd 503, the 4th District found the plaintiff's argument that the defendants never took responsibility and never apologize was grounds for a new trial. And again, in Cohen versus Philip Morris at 203 Southern 3rd, 942, the Florida 4th District also said that counsel's comment during closing argument that the defense never took responsibility and failed to apologize were, were egregious, unacceptable, and grounds for a new trial. Based on the comment made from plaintiff's counsel, in the prevailing case law in Florida, we believe we're entitled to a new trial. Uh, we, we're moving for a mistrial on that basis at this time. Defend, uh, sorry, plaintiffs, what do you want to say? This is a punitive damages case and the issue of whether or not the defendants are uh, ratifying. Yeah, ratifying the behavior, approve of the behavior, and otherwise have uh, – decided that, and, and actually what her statement was, I was getting to, was at the end she says, I did everything fine. I don't believe uh, I did anything wrong to that, uh, to uh, my question about have you checked back with her and then do you have any remorse over this? And so in a punitive damages case, it's a little different situation. I haven't studied the defense's case to see whether any of them were punitive damages cases, but the court made... A, an instruction at that time, and we certainly don't believe that it rises in any, I'm not sure it's error but on my part, from what I've read, I would have to study it, but it certainly doesn't rise to the level of a mistrial. Well, one, the court already instructed the jury to disregard the, the question. There wasn't an answer to the question. The court has previously and will in the future again instruct the jury that uh, uh, they're not, that Johns Hopkins Children's Hospital is not responsible for the, let's call it the chapter 39 stuff, just because it's probably the easiest shorthand to, to say at this time. Uh, so, you know, I don't think that there's any need at this point for a mistrial on a, a question that was asked that was never answered. Your Honor, the second issue we would like to address briefly is we prepared a special instruction uh, that we'd like the court to deliver now regarding um, suicide. May I approach with it? Sure. Has this gone to Mr. Elegant? Uh, it's gone to Mr. Anderson today. It was based on the jury's questioning today, and it goes to the fact that the uh, court has already dismissed on summary judgment the duty owed to Beata Kowalski to prevent her suicide. There were a number of questions from this jury, and I thought it would be the defense's requesting, mm -hmm. based on the timeliness of it, that, that a short statement be read to the jury to make it clear that we do not have a duty to prevent Beata's suicide based on the questions that they're asking. You know, this is kind of, if anything, I guess I would characterize as a self-inflicted wound. <laughs> we ask no questions on cross-examination of Dr. Tepa Sanchez before the jury's questions. The defense brought out from her several statements allegedly made by Beata Kowalski to Dr. Tepa Sanchez about being exhausted, being overwhelmed, and then further statements that later on she stated she was okay <coughs> with her family. And then uh, stepping into territory we've been prohibited from entering. Then there was discussion on direct regarding 
the propriety of Baker acting someone and those types of issues. So to give an instruction based on their own questioning, we feel would be unnecessary and improper. I, I agree that Mr. Hunter asked the question that elicited this issue and I don't think there was an objection because I was thinking there would be because this is not an issue in the case because it's already been summary judgment and out. I don't think there's a need for a jury instruction at this time. There you go. What's next? Do you want to talk about uh, Mr. Grand? Um, well, Mr. Anson brings up we learned just before lunch that the defense plans on calling Detective Graham tomorrow. I think uh, Ms. Carls and I discussed this briefly. We'd like to discuss this after the jury's gone for the day. Uh, our objection having Detective Graham testify. We do have a motion for a curative instruction as well that was filed yesterday. And it, it deals with the... All signs. All signs. It, it's within the motion you looked at earlier. So there were two proposed curative instructions in there. And the one that we'd like to discuss now had to do with the argument concerning Dr. Richard's testimony and the suggestion that the Kowalski's, suggestion by defense counsel, that the Kowalski's had moved for a continuance of the dependency proceeding. And for that reason, and, and then that there was a final hearing scheduled in February. Does this have anything to do with the witnesses this happening? It does not. It does not. We can wait talk about that this evening. Anything else about... What's going to happen over the next few hours? No, you're on. Okay. No, you're on. We have five minutes. Why don't we use that for exhibits? relevance hearsay. I'm not even sure who wrote this note, and we can't read it, and it doesn't seem the defense can either. Uh, well, it's coming from a, a doctor's office? Yes, it's Dr. Gondor. Okay. Court's going to overrule the, the relevance, and <coughs> I don't think legibility is a basis to keep something out when we're talking about doctor's handwriting. Okay. <laughs> 3041 is the... Or my handwriting, for that matter. I'm sorry. 3041 is the surgery center for the pinky fracture that's been discussed. For the pinky fracture, okay. The and one in... This is... 2020. Uh, 2020, okay. Now, how many pages is this one? It's 26 pages, but I don't know what the objection is. I don't know how they... could say it's not relevant. There's been testimony about her visit, when she went, when she delayed... 
point. Uh, it seems like maybe perhaps the amount should be redacted, but no objection otherwise. The amount? The bill? I mean the bill? Yeah, the ten thousand two hundred dollars. We can we can we I'm not can sure if that's that reflected on other pages here. Can you scroll through the other pages real quick? Keep on. Keep on. These are just normal medical records? Yeah. That's my understanding, Judge. I haven't personally looked at each page, but it's not my understanding. If, if the parties agree to, to take out the, the sure. money, that's fine. But otherwise, uh, this the court will receive All right, 3041, so and I'm assuming it's pages 1 through 26 is the complete. Right. I believe page 1 was the uh, bill. So it will be 30412 to 26. Okay. What Ms. Corliss just said. Three zero four two. This looks like Dr. Kirkpatrick stuff. It is. Why don't, why don't we? Want to delay that? Yeah, and and sure. we're now at one thirty. So sure. Let's go ahead and bring in the jury. <clears throat> everybody. Members of the jury, I want to confirm while you're away, you did not uh, discuss this case amongst yourselves. So you did no investigation and received no information. Is that all correct? And did anyone approach you while you were away? And did you see any media coverage of this, about this case while you were away? Did you have a good lunch? Yes. Okay, good deal. Did I hear always? I'm glad. That's a very strong statement. <laughs> it's like, I just want to know what plan that is on because I, I don't always get that. So, I'm sorry, who, who is the defense calling? The defense calls nurse practitioner Joanna Klink. <laughs> Stand here, face the clerk, and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, right this way. Yeah, good morning. Have a seat in that witness stand. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Good afternoon. Can you, can you please state your name? Johanna Clink. And what is your current occupation? Um, I'm a nurse practitioner. Can you please give the jury the benefit of your education and training beginning with college and any degrees or licenses you obtained over the years, please? Yes. Um, I have a bachelor, bachelor of Science degree in biology. And then um, I went on to become a nurse, so I have a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing. Um, then I was a nurse. Um, for some years, and then I went back several years ago and became a nurse practitioner, and I'm a family nurse practitioner. 
And when did you uh, first become a registered nurse? Uh, 2001. When did you become an advanced practice registered nurse? 2021. Can you explain the difference between a registered nurse and an advanced practice registered nurse? Yeah, so a registered nurse is most typically a bachelor's degree. Sometimes it's an associate degree, but for the most part, it's a bachelor's degree. Um, the nursing, um, with a, a, a registered nurse does as follows the orders that would be given by a nurse practitioner. Uh, which was considered a mid-level or a physician. So we follow the orders, we monitor um, vital signs, we monitor the patient, and then we report to the physician. A nurse practitioner is one who works between, is like a, considered a mid-level, and will write orders and um, uh, make a diagnosis. And registered nurses don't make diagnosis. They follow the orders of a physician or a nurse practitioner or physician assistant. Now, before you became an APRN, can you describe your work history as a pediatric intensive care nurse? Um, as a pediatric intensive care nurse, I started in Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. I was there for two years, and I was in the pediatric intensive care. Um, I was for several months in a respiratory care floor in the acute care, and then I went straight to the pediatric ICU. After that, my family and I moved to Seattle, and I worked in the pediatric intensive care in Seattle. Um, while I was in the pediatric intensive care um, in Seattle, I also had experience in cardiac ICU, um, some of, and then neonatal ICU, but predominantly it was in the pediatric ICU in Seattle. Then my family and I moved from Seattle to Florida, and then I worked at Johns Hopkins starting 2010 until I believe it was 2021, 20, something like that. And uh, when we say PICU today, you understand that to be the pediatric intensive care unit? Right, we call it PICU, but it's PICU, pediatric intensive care unit, yep. Can you give the jury an idea of what a PICU nurse at All Children's Hospital, or, or anywhere for that matter, does on a daily basis? Well, the um, pediatric ICU, like I said, we follow the orders of the doctor, um, nurse practitioner. Um, we're there for monitoring vital signs, patient um, status changes. We report to them when we see changes in status. We administer in the pediatric ICU and in the ICUs very specialized drugs that are not given on like acute care floor. So patients come there for those specialized drugs. They come for advanced therapies. They come to be, if they're on ventilators, they have to be in the ICU. It's, um, that's pretty much what we do. We take care of the patient. We give them, we, we, look after their skin, we turn them, we help them, we, get, or we give them their medications as did there, per order. Did there come a point in time that you came to be involved with the care of Maya Kowalski? Yes, I did. And, and I'm, am I correct that you served as Maya's bedside PICU nurse on October 7 of 2016? Yes, I did. And in addition, I, I believe that you also served as a PICU charge nurse at All Children's Hospital at a few points uh, in, in Maya's admission as well. Is that correct? Yes, I was. Can you please um, describe for the jury what it is, what role a PICU charge nurse serves? Well, the PICU charge is more of a supervisory um, role. We um, control kind of the, the flow in and out of the ICUs via admissions, transfers, discharges. We're there for staffing. We um, assign patient assignments to the bedside, um, to the bedside nurse. We also go to um, rapid responses on the floor, and that's where, in another unit outside of an ICU, if a patient is having some type of a respiratory or cardiac decompensation, the charge nurse will go there and assess the patient if they need um, advanced um, treatment, if they need any kind of CPR. We're also there for the code blue. If you all know the code blue is when somebody's in a cardiac respiratory arrest, we're there for that. Um, and we monitor patient uh, flow. We, we keep an eye and make sure that the nurses have what they, they need for their job that day. We go to the staff meetings and we also go to 
uh, like care conference meetings to, to oversee what's happening with each patient in a big picture. When you encountered Maya Kowalski at Old Children's Hospital on October 7 of 2016, how many years of nursing experience did you have to that point, approximately? Um, I had about 16 years of pediatric intensive care. No, yeah, it was about 16, 16 years. I'd like, in yeah. I'd like to take you back in time to the afternoon of October 7 of 2016 and pick you at Old Children's Hospital. Um, on that date, you served as Maya's bedside PICU nurse, correct? Correct. Do you remember the afternoon of October 7th? I do. Okay. And, and why is it that you remember that afternoon? It was, it, was a, a, it, was a, it was an unusual day. It was a very stressful day. Um, I remember distinctly um, when the admission came in, it was, it was challenging. Um, there were many things that had happened that day that stay out, stay in my mind as, as the day progressed. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but do you have anything else you remember specifically about that day you want to tell the jury about? Um, I got the report from the ER nurse and said that this patient was coming to me in the, in the pediatric ICU. She gave me a brief history of, of Maya's um, medical history. Um, what was most likely what she the plan was for her that she was needing to, to have they said that she was having pain and that she had a a, a pain diagnosis and that um, she was going to come to the ICU and um, am I correct that when you first encountered Maya and her family you performed an admission assessment in the PICU I did can you please tell the jury what an admission assessment is an admission assessment is a complete, like it's a profile of the potential needs that the patient is going to have when they're in the ICU. Um, the admission assessment will be things about um, pain history, if there's any spiritual needs that they may have, um, their regular diet, any safety issues. Um, uh, but who lives with them, their whole background. We do and keep that profile of the admission assessment. And part of that assessment is obtaining a, a history? Yes. And, and who was it that provided you with Maya Kowalski's medical history during your uh, admission assessment that day? Mrs. Kowalski was at my side right here. I was at the computer like right here and Mrs. Kowalski was uh, reading the computer with me and she was giving me all the information, like answering the, the information with me. Did you observe any language barriers when communicating with Beata Kowalski? No, there, there was none. Mrs. Kowalski was a, a nurse herself. She knew medical terminology. There, there, was, there was no, she was proficient in English. There wasn't any communication. Now moving a little past the admission assessment, do you have any <coughs> recollection about difficulties with obtaining vital signs? For Maya Kowalski on October 7th? Yes. Um, when a patient comes into the ICU, um, we get a full set of vital signs. We get their height, we get their weight. If it wasn't done in the ER, sometimes we'll do it again. But um, Mrs. Kowalski would not let me take a blood pressure on, on Maya. Um, she said it was going <clears> to <throat> cause her pain. And I said, well, we need to have a blood pressure done on her and she said well if she has blood pressure taken that she needs to have to be premedicated for the blood pressure I'd never heard that in all those years I had never heard that I, and I knew that they said that she had pain but I'd never heard and I've had patients with pain issues kids with cancer and things but um, she needed to be premedicated and so we held off on it for a little bit. I was able to put her on the monitor. I was able to see her heart rate and her respiratory rate, her <clears throat> oxygen um, saturations, that's how much um, oxygen her blood had. Those were really, um, that was critical to have that part. And we deferred the blood pressure for a little bit until I can talk to the doctors and see do what, what do we do to give her pain medication for the blood pressure. So we held off on that for a little bit and we're gonna revisit that. 
Now, am I correct that you had the opportunity to observe Maya Kowalski at various points on October 7th? Yes. Do you have a recollection about Maya's mobility within her bed while she was in the PICU? Mrs. Kowalski um, told me that Maya can't walk because of her CRPS. And I took her at her word for that. I mean, that was, that was okay. I, I understood she had um, some issues medical issues in the past and, and now, except then I saw Maya was on her knees on the bed and she was moving around on the bed on her knees. And I was like, Maya, you're, you're moving on the bed. You're, you're, you know. And in the hospital, it, it's hard to move on your knees on a bed, on any bed. It takes a lot of strength to do that on a bed. But this was an ICU bed that had an air mattress. So with these air mattresses, you sink into the bed. And to be able to move like that while you're sinking, I thought was, was a little bit suspect. Like, how did you do that when you can't, you can't walk? You had no, your legs were, you know, were, were so profoundly weak, but she was able to do that. It's like walking on a moon bounce on your knees. It's, it's hard. So I said to, I did mention to Maya, like, Maya, look at it, you're doing good. You're doing good. You, maybe, maybe you could do something. You, you could walk. Maybe we can. Maybe you can try. So I, I did notice that that was, that was unusual. And and at various times from your vantage point, while observing Maya Kowalski, were there times that she appeared agitated? Yes. Okay. Were there times that she appeared upset? I'm sorry. Were there were there times that she seemed upset? Yes. Um, did she appear withdrawn at times? Yes. Um, were there times, though, that you observed her that she didn't appear upset, agitated, or withdrawn? This happened. This happened most often. It happened very often, and this was strange too. Is because Maya's behavior did change when she was alone with me, or even the other. As I was charged, and the nurses would give me a report, they would say the same thing. And, and I saw this that when Maya's mother was when Maya was with her mother, it was a, she was a different girl. She was when when she was alone, she could be a very sweet, age appropriate, ten year old, and she would she would be a nice little kid. And when Maya's mother came in, the whole demeanor changed. Things changed, and she shut down. She became withdrawn. <clears throat> And that happened consistently. When you say consistently, can you approximate how many times over the afternoon of October 7th you observed this change in demeanor based on who was present? So on October 7th when that happened, that happened a couple times. Um, there was one time when I was having a conversation with Maya and she was talking to me and then her mother came back in the room and everything just stopped. She shut down, and it happened then. I, I don't remember how many times that day that happened, but I remember distinctly that happened, and it, it happened again at other on other days in the ICO. And did you have the opportunity to observe Beata Kowalski's demeanor and behavior in the PICU on that day, October 7th? Yes. And, and how did Beata Kowalski behave in the, in the PICU? Ms. Kowalski, when she came in from the beginning, I, I don't know why, Mrs. Kowalski was very agitated as soon as she came in. Um, I felt like I was starting to walk on eggshells, like she was demanding, she wanted this, she wanted, it. she, even, even when she was, when I was doing that medical assessment, or the, 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 the hospital intake and assessment, she was right there answering the questions, and I, I was thinking, okay, maybe that's all right. People don't usually do that, but okay. But she did control the whole thing as I'm going through checking, and it was, I, I could have said, hey, why don't you just answer all of this? So she was very demanding, and I just felt like um, she became agitated, and if I didn't do what she wanted, then she would be agitated. At any point, do you recall any swearing or yelling in the PICU that day on October 7th? 
There were a lot of F-bombs that had happened in that day. I don't remember all the specifics, but I remember the swearing started. Yeah, I do. I remember actually with both, both actually with both of them, with Maya and her mother, um, that there were a few F-bombs. Do you recall at any point Maya using profanity directed at, at any of the staff members at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital? I do. Tell, why don't you tell the jury about what you recall? So it was, I was charge nurse on, on that day um, when it was directed at the staff that I, I, I witnessed. Um, so in the hospital, in the ICU, we have like a morning rounds and you have the team together and there's the residents and dietary is there, pharmacy's there, nursing's there, everybody is there. And we go to the patient into the room and then talk about what happened that night and then what the plan is for the day. And I was the charge, so I, I um, go along with the rounds to each patient. And we walked into Bea's, or we walked into Maya's room and, and Bea uh, Tepa, Dr. Tepa, was the attending that day. So we had just walked in and I think she says something like, hi, good morning. And she's like, well, you know, we're something along the lines of like, we're gonna have a new day or we're gonna, you know, talk about your plan of care, which is what she normally says. And then, um, Your Honor, is it all right if I say it? First, objection to hearsay. Second, narrative sustained and not responsive to the question. Let's strike the last 10 lines. Just ask your next question. Why don't you tell the jury about the incident where Maya Kowalski used profanity in your presence? Well, in my presence, so she was saying the F bomb, I want my F in, um, I want my F in sedation, I want my F in sedation. Um, <clears throat> then she called Dr. Teppa, she called, the, I was there, she called Dr. Teppa an F and um, F and A H. She said, shut up, you F and A H. Was that but something, she, was that something that you found unusual in your experience as a PICU nurse? Yes. And why was that? Well, here's this 10-year-old little girl. Um, it, she, and it was unprovoked. Like, it was a morning. We just walked in. I, I don't know why that happened. I don't know where that came from. But, but she said the whole word, and we were shocked. I was shocked. I saw Dr. Teppa's face. It was like, I don't think anybody had ever said that to her. She gasped, and we all looked at each other and were in shock. Objection, non responsive to the question. Overruled. Ms. Clark, I'd like to now go through some of a few of the entries that you made in Maya Kowalski's medical chart uh, the afternoon and evening of October 7th. Okay. Uh, Clay, can you please put up joint exhibit 1001 2722? It is in evidence. Uh, and I'd like to draw your attention specifically to um, the note here uh, from 1700, uh, it's under the text note T900. It says, um, I want my sedation, I want to eat, I feel like I'm having a heart attack. Mom replied, well, honey, if you have a heart attack, at least the doctors will treat you. Do you see that, Nurse Clink? Yes, I do. And, and is that a note that you entered on October 7th? Yes. Uh, why is it that you put uh, that entry into Mike Kowalski's medical chart? Well, I, there were a couple reasons why I, I put that in. First of all, she said that, and that's why I put it in quotes that way. Um, secondly, I thought it was I thought it was unusual that she said I wanted my I want my sedation. She didn't say, I'm, I'm in pain, you know, nurse, my, my, my arm hurts, mom, my leg hurts, my back hurts, I'm in pain, I have an owie, somebody help me because it hurts. She said, I want my sedation. And she, I, I thought that that was unusual for a, a 10 year old. Kids don't ask to be sedated. They, they ask for something because they have, a, something hurts, they have an owie, they have, something bothers them. They'll say that, but they don't ask for sedation. So 
that I thought was very strange, so I put that in. And then the other thing is, um, and I was gonna, I was going to get to the next one, Nurse Clank. There's a there's a second note here, T nine oh one, from five p.m. on the seventh. It it says, um, well, can you see it? We've got it highlighted here for you, I believe. Yeah. Uh, quote: I'm tired of all these lies. My life is a lie. End quote. Clay, yes. can you highlight that, please? Session, Try not to read the, the records. Nurse Clint, do, do you see the entry here that's highlighted yes. before you? Um, can you tell me, um, or describe for the jury rather, uh, what was going on around the time that this statement that you quoted from Maya occurred? Um, I was alone with Maya in, in the room when this, in her hospital room when this happened. Um, she was saying that she was hungry and she wanted a donut, but um, she said about the sedation part, and then she said, um, I'm tired of all these lies, my life is a lie. That struck me, that struck me very hard. I was, I, I, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it. When she said that, she was, it, it sounded to me like it was a cry for help. Like there was some, she, she was desperate. She said those words to me, and I said, you know, Maya, what do you mean by that? And M Maya's, um, before that happened, Maya said to me, where's my, where's my mother? And I said, well, I think your, your mom is with the doctors. They're, they're having a meeting. And then she was saying, I want my donut, I want my sedation, and then she said that. So Mrs. Kowalski and I believe Mr. Kowalski were in a meeting with the doctors. When, this was right after she was admitted. I think this was like soon after she was admitted. I didn't have any background. I didn't really know that much about my. I certainly didn't know anything along like now that I look back on this. But that struck me as very, very unusual. It was, it was like a cry for help. I, I don't know. So I put it in there. And uh, as soon as, she, it looked like she was about to answer me, and I remember distinctly, she paused when I asked her, Ryan, what do you mean by that? She paused, and then she looked like she was about to answer, and then Mrs. Kowalski came in the room, back from the meeting with the doctors, and then that was the end of it. And this was the first day, this was right after she was admitted to the ICU, and I thought it was... I thought it was unusual for a 10-year-old to say, I'm tired of all these lies. My life is a lie. What do you mean that this was the end of it? I think you just told the jury that when Ms. Kowalski came back in. Well, that was the end. Maya became withdrawn again and shut, kind of shut down. And I went back and did my the rest of my work, and checking on meds or whatever. But um, that was the end of it. That was the end of the conversation. She said that. I asked her to explain more. It looked like she was about to, and then her mom came back. In your almost 20 years of nursing experience now, have you ever had a child tell you that their life was a lie? Never. Were you concerned by that statement? Yes, I was very concerned. I mean, that's, I don't know anybody, any kid, any child, that would say such a thing. And she said that, exactly that. And that did strike me as, what, like, why, why would you say that? What does that mean? That meant something, and I could see she, she, she said it. Going back to your entry here about Maya requesting sedation, do you recall the tone of her voice when she was asking for sedation? Maya was agitated. Um, she was angry, she was yelling, she would say, I want my F in sedation. Um, she, yeah, she was, she was upset, she was agitated. In your years of nursing experience, have you ever had a 10-year-old ask you for sedation? I've never had any child ask me for sedation to say, I want to be sedated. Now, now moving forward, uh, after you were the bedside PICU nurse on October 7th. Um, am I correct, you were the charge nurse on the PICU for a series of days? 
after October 7th? Yes. And, and you were a charge nurse for a few days while Maya Kowalski was in the PICU, is that correct? Correct. Can you please describe for the jury some of the, the recollections you have um, serving as a charge nurse during those days while Maya was in the PICU? Um, Objection calls for narrative answer specifically. Sustained. Okay. During the period of time uh, that you were a charge nurse on the PICU, did you have any interactions with Maya Kowalski or her parents? Yes. Okay. Can you please tell the jury what you recall about this? Um, Objection again. Narrative. Overall in time. You can answer. Can you repeat that last part? Of yeah. So during the period of time that you were a charge nurse in October in the PICU, can you please describe uh, some of your interactions with Maya uh, and her parents? Um, I was in. I was. I was in a. a, a again. I was in one of the comp care conferences. And let me stop you. There, there was. A, I'll represent you. There was a care conference on October 11 of 2016. Does that sound about right to yes. you? Yes. Okay. And why don't you explain for the jury what a care, a family care conference is? Uh, a family care conference is, is when you get the different teams together and sometimes there's discharge planning. You get the different teams. Sometimes if it's a child with lung issues, then the pulmonologist would be there. The charge nurse is there. The physicians are there. Um, the parents are there. And that's a care conference. This is where you get everybody together all on the same page at the same time and figure out a plan of care. And what do you recall about that meeting? Um, I remember it was in the morning. I was charge nurse that day. I was there as an observational. It was the physicians were there with Mr. and Mrs. Kowalski. And um, they, uh, the, the, I remember that the ICU team were talking with the parents about um, the, the plan of care, what they were going to do with Maya's, you know, Maya's care. And I know that they were working towards trying to um, trying to get Maya into some type of a, a, a stable medication or st stable regimen where she wasn't on a lot of these um, ICU meds. And these, some of these meds are dangerous meds. And to try to wean her off those meds and get her into some other type of like a therapy, cognitive therapy, maybe just some um, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and um, try to get her stabilized on that and take her down from a lot of these these ICU meds that were like ramping up. And what do you recall about uh, Mr. Kowalski and, and his position about what the doctors were requesting and, and recommending during that care conference? Mr. Kowalski and Mrs. Kowalski were sitting kind of on this corner. I was right here. And he said to her, he's like, you know, I, th I think this makes a lot of sense. I think we should do it. I think it's reasonable. Why don't we give it a try? What, what, you know, it's, what they're saying, it's, it's okay. We should just try it and, and, and just see it. They, they seem like this is, it seems like it's a reasonable plan. Narrative answer. During this conversation, the, the care plan conference, what do you recall Ms. Kowalski saying in response to Mr. Kowalski's request to stay at the hospital? Say that again? At this care conference we've been discussing, what do you recall about what Beata Kowalski was saying in response to Mr. Kowalski's suggestion that we listen to what the doctors at All Children's wanted to do? Mrs. Kowalski did not want to entertain any other plan other than continuing with the ketamine and the propofol and the ICU drugs. Did it appear to you as though Mr. Kowalski wanted to have Maya Kowalski stay at Johns Hopkins? Yes. Um, and at the end of the care conference, do you recall if the Kowalskis agreed to stay or not? Um, 
I believe they did. Um, that would you'd have to check on with, with the physicians to find out the final, but I believe that yeah, they they stayed. They chose to stay. Do you recall during this family care conference on October 11 of 2016 any threats to the Kowalskis that they would be arrested if they didn't stay at All Children's Hospital? No. Have you ever, in 20 years of nursing, heard any hospital staff member threaten a parent with arrest if they wanted to leave against medical advice? Hospital. Objection, foundation, predicate, and sustained hearsay. And welcome to come forward. Was there ever a time that you saw Mrs. Beata Kowalski request the anesthetic propofol? Yes. Okay. What is propofol? Propofol is um, it's a, a sedation agent. Um, it's used usually for procedures. Um, it gives it, you become it's a deep sedation. Um, and it's used in ICUs, it's used in ORs, we'll use it. N not really, uh, sometimes in an ICU for procedures, for doing a procedure at the bedside, some, a significant procedure. And what do you recall about this incident where Mrs. Kowalski was requesting propofol? Um, Mrs. I don't remember all the specifics. I know that she wanted propofol. I don't know why. She, I mean, it's, it's usually a sedating agent, and I remember thinking it's for sedation, um, and I don't know why Maya would be sedated, but I, I, she, want, she kept insisting she wanted propofol, and I thought that that was, um, that was unusual to have to, to, for propofol in, an, in that situation. Were, were there ever times that you recalled Mrs. Beata Kowalski requesting sedative drugs around the time that Maya was about to go to sleep? Yes. Did that strike you as unusual? Yes, and there were there was a couple. Foundation predicate knowledge of that. Overall, you may answer. So there were there was a, a a couple times when Mrs. Kowalski wanted me to give Maya some pain medicine, and one time she said to me, she's "Like my well, for one one time, my was my was almost asleep. Her eyes were drifting off." She was resting comfortably, and 
Maya or Mrs. Kowalski went to Maya and but to wake her up and said, Maya, are you in pain? And I thought, oh, you don't wake her up. She's she's sleeping. And that was one time that she she did it. Um, another time she was saying, she's in pain. She's in pain. You need to give her pain medicine. And normally, I, I mean, I normally I, I will work with the parents 100%. I had been in ICU for a long time, pediatric ICU for a long time. And I work with the parents if they think that. But this time this was this was different. She was saying she's in pain, she's in pain. And I I really didn't want to get involved. I didn't want to answer because I I, could, I just thought she was not in pain. And then Mrs. Kowalski said to me, "Don't you see she's in pain?" And then I thought, "Okay, she actually asked me then and, and then I and I looked at Maya. Maya was completely calm. She was quiet. She was laying in bed comfortably. And then I looked up at the monitor and I see she has the low resting heart rate. She had a low respiratory rate. And I said, no, I don't see she's in pain. And that, that was unusual for me because like I said, I, I, I'm, I don't want to be stingy. I treat pain very seriously. I especially treat children's pain very seriously. But it was obvious that Maya was comfortable and I could tell not only was she sleep resting, but you can see on the monitor her heart rate and her respiratory rate were low. And if I give her pain medicine, that can bring her respiratory rate down too low. And yeah, that struck me as, as very, very odd. That was, I was nervous to even go ahead and do that because if somebody's really in pain and their heart rate comes down from 150 to 120, that's okay. But if the heart rate is 70, 80, and now I'm bringing that heart rate down because of the pain medicine or the respiratory rate. Now we're in trouble. So, yeah, that that kind of stuff was happening. And then, yeah, that was that what that was distinctive to me. That stuck out. Nurse Clank, from your vantage point as a PICU nurse, were you concerned for Maya's care and well-being when she came into the hospital on October seventh? Of course. Thank you. Your witness. Wow, with all that experience, you must have been really good at charting everything that was important, right? I chart what, what, I, what I can get in there, yes. And what's important, right? Mm -hmm. Really, if something astonishing happens, you're going to put it in there, right? N nurses chart as much as they can get, as much as they can chart, as long as they're doing their, is their patient care as well. Well, why is it that, and I can approach and show the witness, from in all of your charting here over a few days, most of what you said about all the words and all the actions is never charted. Why is that? Well, First of all, we chart, we do chart all the vital signs. We chart the meds. We chart what goes in the patient. We chart what comes out of the patient. Those are things that we, we for sure, we, 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 we chart. We get in there from the medical point of view. The other stuff, if we can get some time to put the things that some of them are glaring. The incident with Dr. Um, Tepa, where she called her that name and she said the whole words, the whole thing. I only gave the initials, but she said everything. The reason I didn't chart that is because most of our charting that we do for that is a communication tool in the hospital. Like I wanted, if we chart that the patient got out of bed, because when physical therapy comes, they will look at the, the child's chart and says, oh, okay, the kid was out of bed today. So something like that is what I would convey to the ICU team, specifically to the attending that's there. And Dr. Teppa was in the room. So this was during rounds. Everybody was there. Anybody that needed to know about what that kind of those expletives, anyone was already there. There would be no reason for me to chart it. If I thought that I was going to be here where I am now, yeah, maybe I would have charted it. But Dr. Tepa knew. They, they all, we all knew. I, I'm not gonna. 
it, it was, it's more, th that kind of stuff is for the purposes of communication in the hospital. Not, I, I didn't think I'd be here. Anything else? That's it. Find your explanation. Sir? Yeah, I, I chart what I can chart. I mean, there's 12 and a half hours that we are there in the bedside. We are running. We're, we're monitoring the patient. These kids are critically ill. I can't, I can and I, I we don't chart every, everything that's a communication that comes out like that. And like I said, the thing with Dr. Tepa, yeah, maybe I should have, in retrospect, if I knew I was gonna be here, but at the time, anyone who needed to know was there. Aren't you allowed to have either your phone or a cell phone from the floor on you as you make your rounds? I believe we are, where we were. Why is it, after 12 hours of all of this, there isn't a single photo or video or surveillance or anything else that confirms what you're saying? Well, there's no cameras in the room. This happened in the patient's room, right? They, we, they don't have, unless they need to put it up for a specific reason, but there's cameras in the halls. And we're not allowed, I, I don't take pictures of any patients. I don't, I don't, we're not allowed to um, take pictures of the patients. I don't videotape the patients. I, I don't do that. Uh, I see. So you nurses are not allowed to take pictures of the patients, right? And that would you just testify to? Yeah. Okay. So I guess taking her into a room and stripping her down to her bra and her shorts and taking about eight to ten pictures of her, that would not be appropriate, would it? Objection form. Overall form. Foundation. Um, there are times when there are pictures taken, absolutely. They are taken for purposes, for medical purposes, 100%. And um, that's un undeniable. But to, for me to just do it on my phone to take a picture of the patient, I don't have any reason to do that. If it was a medical reason, that somebody needed to do that, that does happen. That I know happens. Um, people do that. I know different entities will do that. But as the nurses, no, I'm not going to take, I don't take a picture of a patient on my phone. Maybe unless somebody else has a reason to do that, possibly. But I, I don't. I'm answering for myself. What other people do is you'd have to ask them. Anybody, anything else? No. You'd like to add? Okay. So if somebody were, say, to take a child and put them in a room and videotape them without their parents' consent or their consent, that would also be something that would be against your policies. Agreed? I disagree. So it's okay to videotape children without the parents' consent or anyone's consent but you, correct? That's not what I said. Well, if it's not the parent's consent, and it's not consent from another authoritative source, that leaves you, right? So, so, so do you or do you not have the authority to do what you what I just described, take a child into a room under false pretenses of an EEG and put her in that room, video her without her knowledge. Oh, put a commode just out of reach to see if you can tempt her to get over there. So who gives the authority to do something like that? Injection, argumentative, compound. Sustain. Are you, uh, did you, do you work with Kathy Beatty at all, ever? I did in the past. 
not anymore. Correct. Not since you left, right? Correct. And before that, though, was she a PICU uh, social worker? Yes. Were you a PICU nurse? Yes. So you saw her about every day, right? No. How often? Mm, maybe once a week, once every two weeks. And if she had a patient that involved me, if we had the same patient at the same time, then I would. But if I had a patient that Kathy Beattie did, wasn't working with, then... Okay. Uh, so with as stunning as all of this is, I mean, with a 10-year-old my Kowalski throwing around words like this, you, you would have mentioned that to Kathy Beatty, right? Objection, argument, a rule. You can answer. Um, no, not necessarily. Well, wasn't she assigned to Maya and to move between floors with Maya? Um, I, I'm not sure what happened on the floor. I don't know if she was assigned on the floor. I don't have no knowledge of what happens on the floor. Um, I don't know. I didn't recall. I, I don't recall telling her that. I don't recall. You mean when Maya was swearing? Uh, yeah, any of that stuff. Um, I don't recall telling Kathy. I don't know why I would tell Kathy. I would tell Kathy if there was a need for maybe some social services. But, you know, to go around to, and... No, I, I didn't see her. I don't, I don't remember seeing her to do it. Maybe if something came up in conversation, but I don't recall telling Kathy Beatty. And like I said, the people, the, the, the person, the people that were there knew, and that was kind of it. I, I didn't start telling everybody what uh, happened. How many nurses and social workers worked in that PICU at that time? We're talking about the fall of 2016. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Probably... 40 nurses. And there are nursing stations at different points, or just one nursing station? There's different points. We're spread out. Okay. Oh, on the floor, right? Mm-hmm. And so you're telling the jury, after all of this astonishing behavior, it did not spread to every single mm -hmm. nurse and social worker on that floor? Not only... Do I say not? I'm not surprised that it did not. It should not have spread to everybody on the floor. Okay. <laughs> so you don't think anybody else on the floor heard about it? I, I didn't say that. You said everyone on the floor. No, I don't. It, the, the ICU is like a like a, a a dumbbell. There's an area here, and then there's an area here, and then there's like a long hallway. This side doesn't really communicate. This is the east side, this is the west side, and then there's a few rooms down in the middle. No, we don't communicate. So the half of the unit is not going to hear what's going on in this unit, on this side. And, and, and no, there's a lot going on. People have a lot of their patients. They have these sick patients. Some kids are, are I mean, very sick. They're, they're, it's hard to explain unless you're there. I mean, some kids are are on ventilators, some kids are dying, some kids are, are close to that, and yeah, maybe people over here would have heard it, but it doesn't mean that everybody there, no, and, and as a matter of fact, it's, it's, it's something that should not happen, that everybody goes and starts telling everybody what's going on in another patient's room. That's really frowned on, and we don't, we don't, we don't, we well, try not to do know? that. Hmm? Who did know? Say after your care conference. <sighs> I don't know. I think the people who had who knew in the room knew. There was, was a that? few of us. There was like the residents were there. I was there. Um, I know there was the dietitian because after she said that, we looked at each other in shock. The whole room <laughs> just went still. And then, then we moved on. It's an ICU. We moved on. And no, I don't think people told other 
people, a whole bunch of people, but everybody knew in that group, and Dr. Tepper heard it. But no one out of that charted this afterwards. That, okay, Dr. Tepper said something, but out of all those residents and everyone else in that room, no one else charted this in over 1,500 pages of medical records. Do you know why? Yes. Tell me why. Because everybody, it's a need to know basis. ICUs with hospital, all, it's, it's, from our point of view, it's a need to know basis. If they didn't need to know, it didn't need to go in there. The doctor knew, I knew, the charge nurse, when I was charged that day, it, it didn't need to, to be told throughout the hospital and in the, the record. It, it, it's not something we would put in there. The things that we put in there, like I said, is more for communication back and forth if the child ate this or whatever. In, especially like in the beginning as well. Nobody knew that we would be here. And she most certainly said that. I mean, 100% she said that. Um, but we wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily chart it. Uh, not necessarily, there's no need for me to put that in there. Hindsight's 2020, and we look back and say, okay, now we're here. But at the time, nope, it was not something that would go in a chart. Well, did you all tell risk management this, or was risk management already involved? I don't know that. You would have to ask risk management. I don't know when risk management was called. I didn't call risk management. Uh, were you there when Ms. Tepa Sanchez called risk management? I was not. Did you talk to risk management at any point? I don't believe so. I don't recall. Uh -huh. I don't recall talking to risk management. All right. So if Ms. Winton came down, you never talked to her? When who? Wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Ms. Winton. Mm -mm. I don't recall that. Okay. Somehow, though, risk management found out. Did it come to your attention? Mm-mm. see. All right. Well, you charted on numerous occasions that Maya was a 10 out of 10 on pain. Did you not? Um, I would have to see the charting and see what that was. Any of the uh, scores you gave for that? Um, not offhand. I'd have to see it. Okay. Well, um, I'm trying to find the actual number, but you did show. Okay. Um, you did charge uh, Grimace. Frown withdrawn, that ring about. You did uh, chart frequent chin quiver, clenched jaw grimaces. You are a little jackly. We would appreciate it if the witness could see what the scanner says. Read the If she wants it, I certainly will show it to her. I do remember. I do remember when I was doing the, uh, <coughs> the, the nursing admission, the admission assessment, and Mrs. Kowalski was at my side. And when we got to this part with the pain, Mrs. Kowalski is the one who told me, yes, this, that, and I remember that distinctly. So I don't know, so she told me when I first came in, like how does, I mean, we asked all the, uh, you know, the parents, but Ms., this time Mrs. Kowalski was next to me. Usually they're, the parents are like on the couch or something, but, um, and I'll ask the parent, how does the child um, convey pain? Some kids will, you know, bite on their blankie or, or whatever. So we ask the parents so that we know what to look for. And that's where that originated. So Mrs. Kowalski told me when, I, when she first came in, we were checking which boxes to check. 
You've got, I believe, you've testified to about all of those. Is it your testimony now that Beata Kowalski told you to put all those down? And Mrs. Kowalski told me when she first came in, when I asked how does Maya um, exhibit pain, and she went through each one and said, yes, this one, this one, this one, this one. And so then I continued on that that's how she um, exhibits pain. Yeah, I didn't see her frequent shiver, chin quiver. But I know Mrs. Kowalski's like, yes, this was a firm, a firm, this, a firm, this, a firm, this. And so I did. Okay. I mean, I didn't say punch Josh. She told me that that's how she, how Maya uh, has those things. All right. So now you charted out. And if we can pull it up, 1001-1056, the nasogastric tube. <coughs> Got it up. What's a nasogastric tube? It's a feeding tube that goes into the nasogastro, so nasal is the nose, it goes into the nose, and then it drops down into the stomach, and then you're fed only you through that. Okay. So then, what may have happened then is that when Ms. Kowalski walked in, she was a nurse, right? Correct. You're a nurse, right? Right. Ms. Kowalski was very uh, dominant about what was best for her child, right? Objection calls to speculation. Repeat that. Mrs. Kowalski was very dominant about what she wanted for her child, right? What she wanted for her child, yes. Right. And she told you what she wanted for her child, right? Mm -hmm. She told you, a nurse, what she wanted for her child, right? Yes. But you didn't always agree, did you? When Maya first came in... I'm just asking I, you whether I, you agreed or didn't agree, ma'am. Did I agree? What was? What, what, did I ask me the question again? All right. At times, you disagreed with what Ms. Kowalski wanted to do, did you not? Yes. Okay. But she still insisted, right? Yes. And this was on the PICU floor? Yes. Mm -hmm. During the uh, care conference, was Ms. Bagby there? Who? Nina Bagby? I don't know who that is. Do you recall the security people? outside the door during your care conference? I don't recall security outside the, the, the door. You don't recall two security guys standing on either side of the door during that care conference? Well, I was inside, so if they came after I was inside, I don't know, but I don't recall seeing that. No one told me the security was out there. Actually, what happened was that Maya Kowalski was in extreme pain when she came in, wasn't she? Mrs. Kowalski said that Maya was in extreme, that Maya was in extreme pain. It was yes, but you're asking me if I thought Maya was in extreme pain. Um, there were times when Maya's heart rate was so low, she was resting, she's half asleep, and the mother was yelling, actually in my face one time, saying she's in pain, she's in pain. Right. And, right. no, I did not think she was in pain. She was quiet, she was half asleep, and her vital signs were showing on the monitor. So, my, Mrs. Kowalski may have believed, I don't know what she believed, but she said her mind is in pain. And then she asked me, and she says, don't you see she's in pain? And I said to Mrs. Kowalski, no, I don't. 1001-2. Can you just answer the question that's asked? 
Yes. Thank you. 1001-2326, uh, please. Who's Elizabeth Sumner? She was an ICU nurse. Mm -hmm. Experienced nurse or not? I, she was a charge nurse at one time, so I, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see her ranking it at 10 on the pain scale? Yes. And then you go down a little bit more, and there's another 10 on the next entry. One says, like, apparently she was asleep. But on the under over awake and alert, it says 10. See that? And then we go down to Elizabeth Sumner, a 10. Do you see that? Yes. Do you see under Kelly Thatcher, a 10? You see that? Yes. You see then under Kelly Thatcher, an 8? Yes. And I apologize. I said you were in the 10s too, but. Yours was a seven and then a six, right? Yes. And then a seven and a six, right? Mm hmm Okay. So apparently she got in more pain uh, during the time because Sumner and Thatcher were on the eighth the next day, right? Yes. Okay. So would you agree with me that many people felt Maya came in with a 10 on a 1 to 10 scale in pain. One Maya was also, when she came in, Inconsolable, was she not? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say she was. Maya was was yelling. Mm -hmm. Yes. Doesn't it say inconsolable? Well, those are the options they give us. I see. And then. I believe you gave Maya, or excuse me, not you necessarily, but uh, the, the, the care team there gave Maya a number of different medications, right? Yes. Yeah. And those medications included not only the ketamine, but you also gave her tramadol, is that right? And then, um, where's the meds page? I'm sorry. If I can find it, I'll show it. Yeah. He'll find it. All right. In the interim, let's pull up 2045-024. Well, hold on. Hold on for that. What actually happened was Maya received some medications, right? Then you tried to snake a nasogastric tube down her nose, right? I don't recall that. Yeah. And once you tried to snake a tube down her nose, she rebelled, right? Objection to the extent counsel is testifying and not showing the witness the records. I don't recall that. You don't recall having to put somebody else having to help you? hold her down while you snake the tube down her nose? Now that comes back? No. We, we do those a lot. Uh -huh. I, I don't recall uh -huh. that. I, I don't. And in fact, once people started to grab her and put something down her nose, she really went wild, didn't she? I don't recall a feeding tube and putting her feeding tube in her nose. She went wild because you were hurting her. Correct? I don't recall putting a feeding tube in Maya. Okay, well. One zero zero one dash one zero five six.
that's not it. It's uh, it's a two set. It's one zero zero one two seven two two. I apologize. Did somebody else do that? I don't know. Oh. What actually happened here was that Beata Kowalski challenged you, right? Objection argument. It's a... Oh, sorry. We're back. Okay. Uh, please take a look on your screen. Does that say nasogastric tube? Yes. Objection again. Do this stock that has nothing to do with this witness. And her name on the bottom. Can we just go with... Legal objections. Objection foundation. And what's the time? That's her name right there. You can continue, Mr. Anderson. Well, it says I reviewed it. Okay, so you stepped out while they were putting the tube down her nose. I don't. I don't recall doing that. I don't know where the documentation is. Where who put it in? I mean, if I put it in, possibly, but I'd have to see the documentation because this just says. I electronically signed it. Well, how'd your name get on there? Because I, the order came through, but it might not have been done. That if the order came through at 13, I somebody put the order in at 13.04. At 13.19, I saw the order and signed it. But I, that doesn't mean that the tube went in at that time. That means, okay, yeah, I see that there's an order. I don't know when the tube went in. I don't remember doing it. I put hundreds of tubes in, but I don't know that about if I did that or not. I know I signed it, but that's it. Anything else? All right. So once you or someone, while well, you stepped out momentarily, put the tube down her nose or tried to and held her down to do it, Maya went wild. So when you came back in, you saw her flailing and screaming. Right? Objection. Argument. Is that true or false? Foundation. I don't recall that. Okay. And then after that, there were some cursing in the room, but it wasn't Maya, was it? It was other people in the room trying to hold her down, wasn't it? I don't recall any of that. And after that, were you the one that started kind of the narrative that Beata was nuts? No. Weren't you and Kathy Beatty telling everyone on that floor, watch out for this mom, watch out for the kid, they're a little crazy? No. Sorry, Tom. You're right. Nurse Plank, do you remember some questions about pain scores that were entered in the chart? Yes. If somebody puts a 10 down on a pain chart, is that something that the patient reports to the nurse? Um, no. Okay. So. Well, the, the, if you ask, the, if you ask, it depends. If you ask um, the patient, you know, and a, you could ask the patient on a scale of 1 to 10, and then they can tell you that it's a 10. Um, it depends if it's a, if it's a ch small child, then you use different... Um, different methods. Maya would know a scale of 1 to 10, so it's possible, most likely, that at her age she was asked on a scale of 1 to 10. And I think you made it clear, but you don't have any recollection of placing a nasogastric tube down my well, these days. No, I don't. Thank you. Anything further? No, you're on. Jerry?
see you're already packing up, so do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation. Receive no information. Clink, if you could wait outside while we review these questions, we'll call you back in. The jury is out of our presence. Miss Clink's out of our. Just remember, this is not a deposition. I know, but there's a lot of stuff.
Okay, please be seated, members of the jury. I want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and received no information. Is that all correct? You didn't see any sort of media accounts of this case. Is that correct? And no one approached you about this case. Is that correct? Oh, let's go get the witness. I just want to prove to you we're doing this outside the presence of the witness. Nurse Clink, there's several uh, questions from the jury. Have you ever worked with CRPS? Um, no. Do you know how to work with uh, CRPS patients? Is it, I, I can't just answer that in a yes or no. Well, explain what your, the best of your ability. As a bedside nurse, as a bedside RN, my, my our job is, is to follow the physician orders, and we treat as per order. So I don't go out of my scope of practice and do anything differently. I see what the vital signs are. I, I administer the medications. Um, I take care of the, things like her skin or, and things like that. I don't have a special, oh, this you treat them this way or that way. My job is to treat the patient as per physician orders. Was Maya in any pain when she was cussing? Maya did not say she was in pain. Uh, she would get very angry. She would get agitated. And I know kids can get that way if they're in pain. However, Maya was 10, and she was 10-year-olds would tell us if they're in pain or if something hurts them. Um, even if I, I ask Maya, or if you, it's like the pain scale, you can ask her, Maya, I, like, what's your ten, you know, pain, are, what, are you in a pain of a 10? She would, yeah, she would say, yeah, I'm a, she can say I'm a 10 because she's, she's 10 years old, but she never actually said and I remember, she never said, this hurts, I'm hurting, this hurts me. My arm hurts, my leg hurts. She didn't say that. And that's what I thought was so unusual, because a 10-year-old would tell you younger kids would say, you know, my, my leg hurts, my head hurts. <clears throat> but Maya never told me I'm in pain. Did Maya calm down after she got her meds? Um, yes, Maya would calm down after she got her meds. I remember she would go up and down a lot. Those meds are heavy duty. Those meds were strong meds. Um, anybody who is on uh, propofol or ketamine is going to be pretty much knocked out. So, yeah, I mean, everybody, she would respond to pain meds. As a nurse with 20 years experience, did you follow up with anyone if you had such a conviction that meant uh, something, uh, quote, my life is lies, end quote? I think at that time, there, that what I had moved from there. The physicians had known that because I... Uh, we had talked about that. Um, Maya, Maya would shut down. I didn't have her again after that. Maya was, it was hard to, to talk to Maya. Maya would kind of open up when she, when, when she wanted to open up. I didn't ask her again. Things had started to become very difficult in the ICU. It, it was, there was, it, it, it became difficult. I didn't follow up, but I was, hoping because she was still there and they knew that they would, the rest of the team would take over, but I wasn't her bedside nurse. And 
it started, the ICU started to escalate in tension and stress, and it was no way to go back and, and, and to do that. Okay. And I, I, I just couldn't. Hey, the statement, my life is lies, did you report that to a doctor to follow up on, or did you follow up at a later time? I discussed that with the doctors. I think things were starting to... Like I said, things were starting to escalate. Tension was starting to go up. They knew. And my job as a nurse is to report. That's what RNs do. We don't step out of that scope. But I did report. They knew. And everybody, I think that they started to see, well, yeah, she had, couldn't move her legs, but she was all over the bed. So I think the pieces were starting to come together. Um, but they, my job was to tell them that she said that and I put it in the chart to make sure that it's in writing that the team knows and they they were notified and then then they take over from there as a nurse I mean you don't I, I that's not out of my scope and I have to stay in my scope of practice and the doctors take over from there for my reporting and that's pretty much what nurses do we are at the bedside the whole time and we report changes because the doctors are in different places. We're assigned there, and we report things and then hand it off. But, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I wish she had finished that. That was, that was shocking when she said that, and, and I, I wish I had the opportunity to do it. But there is nowhere for me to go from that, unfortunately. Prior to working with Maya, how many children had you cared for uh, with children with CRPS? Um, I don't think, I don't know of any of them uh, that had CRPS um, that would come into an ICU. I worked in ICUs, and so I don't know that they, they would probably be somewhere in the outpatient or and. But I worked with the kids that had pain, and that was my job is to treat pain. So they could have neuropathy from chemo. They can be in car accidents and have trauma. So my job was to deal with the pain and not the diagnosis. They can have whatever diagnosis, but I'm there to take care of them on a holistically um, with their pain, whether or not they have leukemia, a car accident, or CRPS. If they have pain, then I'm there to, to help them with, with that. Okay. In response to the term inconsolable, when you say these are various options, do you have the option to free text? Um, Yes, I do have the option to free text. Um, at the time, that was the first day that she came in, and there was so much going on in the beginning with the, with the medications and the yelling, and the, the, the tension was rising. I didn't go back and, and free text. That, that, could have been, that would have been a, a good idea if I did. I, in hindsight, yeah, I, I should have free text, but those were the options, and there was just so much coming at me that day. I couldn't go back and start changing things because, as it was, it was. It, the ICUs are stressful. They're intense. That's why they're intensive care units. There's alarms. There's all kinds of things going off, and we're used to that. This was way above and beyond in the level of stress, and the yelling. They were swearing. It was, I should have free texted and said what I meant. I didn't, but there was just so much coming at me. It was hard to even stay afloat. Do you remember the position of Maya's feet on admission? No. How many residents were in the PICU on that night? The, that night, I was working on the day shift. On the day shift, there would have been one resident that would have been assigned to her. Um, I don't know which night they're referring to, but I worked on the day shift. 
And when there were the residents in the room when that incident happened where she cursed at Dr. Tepa, that's when there were multiple residents. There was probably two or three residents. During your 12-hour shift, how much is rotation, how much is spent documenting? We spend a lot of time documenting. The amount of documenting that we do on an admission, I mean, we are clicking through pages and pages and pages. It is a lot, and you just try to stay ahead of it. Meanwhile, you're getting orders that are coming in and they're changing. The, you know, the orders are going up, they're going down, do this, you're doing that. Um, so we spent in the beginning, there could be several, I would say, two hours on an admission of just doing the whole admission profile. There's a lot of questions. Do you have a dog? Who lives with you? I mean, there's just so many, and I think that's where I got tripped up by not maybe going in and doing some more documentation because I'm responsible for all just the basic stuff that comes in, and there's pages and pages and pages and then I have to take care of the patient. So after it gets, the patient gets settled in, like the next, that next night, that next day, it gets a little easier because all that intake stuff is very intensive to complete. Have you ever had other kids in extreme pain use curse words? Maybe it's it's not it's not really n not that much really I think not not that often if they're in pain and I and I see that it's m matching up with the monitor and I could see that there's pain issues I could see their heart rate is up their respiratory rate is up like I said I had been I, I I'm very serious about a child's pain it doesn't go to the point where somebody's swearing that they want pain meds because. I see they're in pain and I act on that. That was always one of my things is, is, is making sure that they're not in pain. I'm not gonna wait and say, oh, you know, I'm not gonna give you the meds, wait until I'm done. I act on pain quickly, so it doesn't really happen. It doesn't really escalate it to that point. And to swear, and it was more of, I wanted my effing sedation. That again is, is, is as a nurse, I'm looking at it like, she didn't say she was in pain, and it, she didn't look like she, so that's not, it doesn't typically happen that they swear when they're in pain. It could, but it doesn't typically happen. They get their pain meds when they say, I'm in pain. In your experience, do medical staff have a general sensitivity to direct opinionated parents? I don't know what a direct sensitivity for a direct opinionated parents, but I think all of us in the, I mean, we have all kinds of parents that come in. Direct opinionated is completely fine. You are an advocate for your child and I'm, I'm happy about that. I think a lot of us have that kind of personality where we're, we have a strong personality. To, you have to be to be in an ICU. And I, I'm not upset over it, I, I don't, I, it, this was not that. This was way different. This was very demanding, and the curse words were like kept coming. It was this was different. There's many parents. Parents are very protective of, of, of their children, and they advocate, and that's that's totally cool. That's that's great, and I'm there for that. This was not a direct opinionated. This was the ICU had become. The ICU had become toxic, and that's a lot for an ICU nurse who had been there 16 years in ICUs. This was not like other ICU admissions. And so, no, we don't have a problem with people who are direct. As a nurse, would you not want to chart disruptive behavior that a patient was displaying in her chart? I would just I would dis, um, chart disruptive behavior. It's now when we're looking back. Yeah, this was I had Maya 
just in the first this all this stuff was in like the first admit like hours of admission half hour hour I had no preconceived notions. I didn't have any background to think, oh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's patterns that's starting to form here. This was like completely, um, completely a blank slate. I didn't know about any of this. I maybe after the time would gone, I'd be like, oh, I better put this down. When, I, when Maya said my life's a lie and I'm tired of all the lies, then I did start charting because I was like, whoa, there's, there's something going on here that needs to be looked at. And I need to tell, and I did. And that is when it started. But in the beginning, I had no preconceived notions. I took everything at face value. And then things started to happen. And then you look and you're like, wait a minute, this is not, things are not are not what they seem to be. Something's going on here and it needs to be looked at. Next question. As a rule, if it is not documented, it did not happen, question mark. So in nursing school, and we are drilled on that, and that is true. But that is to the, that really speaks to, did you hang this antibiotic? You can't say, oh yeah, I hung this antibiotic, but I didn't chart it. It's, it's, it's for the patient stuff that you do. If you didn't, um, like I said, give this med, if you didn't do this bath, that kind of stuff is there. If you didn't do it, it's not done because you didn't chart it. This is not the same. This is what somebody else is doing. We are not expected, and it's, it's, it's 12 and a half hours and all of this stuff is going on. I can't chart all of that. So it's not an expectation, at least it wasn't then. And it probably isn't now because it's 12 and a half hours to document what other people are saying. That's different. It's not like hanging the med. Did you give them a bath? Well, if you didn't chart, you gave them a bath, then you didn't do it. Those are two things, different things. That's what I'm responsible as a nurse to perform those duties. That's what that is. So that part is true. Documenting what other people say, that's not in that realm of, of my responsibility. When, I, when Maya said, my life is a lie, I'm tired of all the lies, that I thought I needed to start putting, I needed to document that. Because that was something above and beyond. But typically, no, we don't. And like when, with, the, with Bea, no, I, I wouldn't put that in the chart. That's not what I did. We heard earlier that all children's hospital staff had nicknames for their patients. Can you tell me the nickname you had for the plaintiff? I can say absolutely that's not true. I've not heard of nicknames for patients. I've not heard of that. I did not have, he, I, I did not hear any nickname for Maya at all. I don't even know I don't think, I don't know if I've ever even heard that, that people have nicknames for patients. At least not, I, I don't, I never hear that in the ICU, and I haven't heard it on any of the ICUs where I work where people's like, oh, I call them this thing, I call them this. It's usually, usually, some people will say something if there is, a, oh, yeah, I have 554, meaning I have the kid in 554. That, but people don't, I've never heard people make up nicknames on, on patients. Um, are you saying that uh, either by mouth or by personal message group or by official medical records that for three months only a select few had knowledge of quote ketamine girl end quote? I, I don't know about what everybody else knew. I don't know. Um, from hearing that, sometimes there's so many kids that come in, and if there's something that is um, very distinctive about a patient, somebody will refer and say um, something about, just, a, just so you can remember who this person is. I don't think it's done derogatory, but you have to have some way of remembering out of 
I mean, there's 29 bed ICU. Sometimes we flow to the other units. There's, it's hard to remember, oh, this is John Smith. And of course, now we remember Maya, but that's only because of all of this that happened. Sometimes you have to come up with some way to say, yeah, this was, you know, it, you know what, it, whatever, to designate who that patient was, but not to be derogatory. It's just, you know, if somebody's not gonna remember, you know, Susie Smith. It's, it's hard, some kids have, you know, similar names. So sometimes, from, when, from hearing that, I think somebody may bring that up as a way to identify that person. But no, I, I don't think pe people don't have derogatory names for that, just so that people, I think that's what that is. With all these, quote, team meetings, end quote, taking place to review patient treatment plans, uh, no nurses or doctors commented on the possible validity of CRPS diagnosis and a serious effort to investigate Maya as having CRPS and treating her for CRPS? Well, I think, actually, I know, for I, the ICU had the diagnosis of CRPS. I, I think, I think that um, they went with the diagnosis of CRPS. But the thing is still is that you have to treat, the, you have to treat this child. So if she's in pain, you have to treat her pain. And, and I think that that's what they were doing. I don't think that the ICU, at least I can only speak for the ICU because I was there. I don't know about the floors. But the, the thing was to treat the patient. The meds, those drugs that, that were being demanded are heavy duty drugs. Like you don't see people on these drugs. That's a big deal. So I think they wanted to treat her CPR, CRPS in a different way so that it's safe for Maya and start to bring the drugs down. You can't have a 10 year old in a ketamine coma and on propofol. <coughs> I mean, that's, it, that, that's the drug that Michael Jackson died with. I mean, it's a heavy duty drug. It's complete sedation. Pure speculation and also not responsive to the question. The sustainer is not responsive to the question. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Right. I didn't mean that. Um, strike these comments. I think the jury's going to disregard the lengthy response that was not responsive to the question. I'm sorry. I think the ICU was trying to do CRPS in a safe, um, in a in a safe manner for Maya and treat her her CRPS, or treat her whether it was CRPS, but do it safely. Any follow-up from the defense? Just one, uh, Nurse Clank, have you ever told anybody that Beata Kowalski was crazy? No. Thank you. <coughs> Plaintiffs. Can't see. Can you see why your description, like, make some of your compatriots think that's what you meant? Now, could you see that? No, I don't understand. No, I cannot. You said, you quoted, my life is, what, full of lies, or my life is a lie? What, what is you saying? I didn't say it. I put in a quote. Right. Now, you're trying to interpret that here for the jury, are you not? I put it in a quotes. For, the, for a quote, so it's a quote. Are you aware of the fact that CRPS patients constantly have their diagnosis challenged? Do you know that as a nurse? Objection foundation. Overruled. Um, I would imagine so. And that a 10-year-old child having a, a doctor, a nurse, a social worker, a doctor, a nurse at different places tell them that they don't believe her, she might actually say something like that? I don't know what she was thinking. Well, okay. But can you see how, from Maya's point of view, being told at another hospital, different hospitals, maybe at Johns Hopkins, that there's something wrong with her symptoms, she might in fact feel as though everyone was making out her life as a lie. Objection, also speculation.
sustain. No, no, I sustained it. You don't have to answer. So now, uh, you saw Maya for the first, I think you said 30 to 60 minutes she was in there? Yes. And not after that? No, Did I you was. you see her after that? Yeah, I, I was with her that day. So when you say there's a pattern forming, are you forming a pattern from the first 30 to 60 minutes of this girl's life? I think as an ICU nurse and as people, we start to put pieces together for everything. So yes. Where did you get your degree in psychology? I think as... Do you have a degree in psychology? I sustain the objection. What's the next question? Well, what I'm asking is, it's interesting, don't you think, that none of this ever happened again, that it was never documented again, despite a three and a half month stay? Objection argumentative and misstates the facts in the record. Well, those objections I'm going to overrule. So, as, can you ask the question again? It is unusual, is it not, that none of this type of behavior was ever documented by anyone else the rest of her three and a half month time at Johns Hopkins. Objection foundation. True? Sustained. Having not followed her, you would not know whether this ever happened again or not, would you? I would not know. And Are you aware that, in fact, Maya was checked out after this by a pediatric psychologist at Johns Hopkins? Objection Foundation. Do you know? No, I, I, after she left, no, I don't know. Okay. Have you ever reviewed the Johns Hopkins Patient Bill of Rights? Um, I believe in the beginning, yes. So when Beata Kowalski was telling you that she did not agree with your methodology of treatment, she was well within her rights? I can't answer that. And neither can you answer to know what you're describing means for Maya's overall psychological health or otherwise. Correct? Foundation compound overall. Can you repeat the question? Sure. Based on your 60 to 30 to 60 minutes, you have no idea how anything you testified to really has anything to do with Maya's sociological or psychological makeup. True? I, in those 60 to 90 minutes, I treated the patient based on physician order. I'll take that as a yes. You can answer the question. What I, if Maya had CRPS or anything, I would have treated her the same way. I would have, yeah, on physician order. That's all I have to <clears throat> Anything further? There you are. Anything further? Jury members? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes.
Okay, uh, Nurse Clink. Next question from the jury. So instead of using her room number in a conversation, are you saying, quote, ketamine girl, end quote, is an appropriate way to describe Maya? I can't say it's an appropriate way, no. I, I, I didn't use that term. I can't say it's an appropriate way. I don't know the context of it, and I don't know if it was to say, hey, this is the one I'm referring to. But no, it, it doesn't sound nice. Again, I don't, I don't know the context, and it probably should have been a different way of referring her, and maybe they get into the, the habit of, of trying to use that as identifiers, and we should pro they should probably move away from that. It's probably not very nice. I mean, the next yeah. question from the jury. Do you think Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital should have trained all personnel working with Maya to give her proper care and help staff treat her? I think that we were treating her, I, I knew we were treating Maya with dignity, we were treating Maya with respect, we we're trying to take care of her pain. That's absolutely true. Um, whether or not, I think they kept it open and accept it, okay, she has CRPS or any other differential diagnosis, but I think that in the ICU, at least I speak for that, I, I, we were treating Maya as, treating Maya with her pain, whether it was CRPS or whether it was something else. If she's feeling pain, it needs to be treated, and I think that's what they did. Or we're trying to do. You had mentioned that you may not be well versed in CRPS back in 2016 during the Maya times. Is that correct? Again, it's the same. Yes, I wasn't well versed in CRPS. Um, I started reading about CRPS when it, she started coming through and I was learning about it. But again, still, um, we're there to treat Maya at least from my point of view, we're treating Maya for her pain and her taking care of her needs there, whether it was CRPS, whether it was like neuropathy, nerve pain, or leukemia. We treat Maya for her pain she, and, and go from there. But whether it doesn't matter, at least I shouldn't say it doesn't matter, but we had to treat Maya for Maya. and. If it was CRPS, then it was CRPS or neuropathy or whatever, but treating her pain, and they, that's what I think that they were trying to do. Uh, the next question, did it ever cross your mind that because Maya was, parentheses, as said by past witnesses, in parentheses, more mature than a usual 10-year-old, or that having gone through this pain before, she would have expressed or handled her pain differently. Did that cross your mind? Yeah, I think about that. And I think if kids know their medical conditions, they, and if you give a, a little kid a blue medicine and it tastes terrible, and the next time you come to them with that blue medicine, they're going to cover their mouths. They know what what the deal is. And that's why it was unusual. It, was, it didn't make sense that Maya was saying, I want sedation. I want my F in sedation. Like, she didn't say, oh, here's where my pain is. This is where I normally have pain. And that's what kids will do when they come in. They'll say, yeah, my, like they have issues with the you know, head. or Yeah, my issues are really usually here. I usually have my back aches here. But that was never any of that. And that was very unusual. Kids know what what has happened to them in the past, and then they tell you, we didn't have any, I didn't have any of that, I didn't see any of that. And that was when I was surprised that she didn't convey, hey, my pain is here, because that's what kids tell me. Okay, the balance of that question I can't ask. 
Okay, uh, that concludes the juror questions. Are there any more questions from the defense? From the plaintiffs? May this witness be excused? Okay, thank you, ma'am. Members of the jury, I think this is a good time for our afternoon break. Let's try to keep this to 10 minutes since you all have already had a stretch break. We really haven't. So let's try to keep this to 10 minutes. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. Jury, She uh, has requested to appear by Zoom in the afternoon. The request has been presented as side as an object. I just want to uh, ask the court if that's There okay. is or is not an objection? There is not. And where is she located? She's in Bradenton. Okay. And what's the reason that she's She recovered? advised that she has therapy patients and she would like to not have to rearrange all of them. Then, yes, but you need to get with Ms. Cyback. We did. The, only, the second half of that, Judge, is... The DCF attorney would also like to appear by Zoom. Is that acceptable? I don't think so. It's not acceptable to me to have somebody there where we can't keep an eye on what's going on. They'd be in different, diff they're not in the same room. They'd be in different offices. But I, I had to ask, they asked me to ask. So. Well, if they are different locations. There are different locations, so they're not going to be in the same room. Yeah, but I just think it's a little different than having your lawyer and the personal lawyer in the denier versus, I mean, I mean, out in the gallery rather than up there next to you. They're uh, not going to be in the same room. I think I think who, the DCF who, lawyer is actually in Tampa. Who They're not going to be in the same. Is it a, is it a DCF lawyer? DCF lawyer. That's what I'm saying. They're in Tampa. They're not even in the same city. Let's just have them. Come by Zoom. Okay, thanks. Okay. I'll, I'll get that email to you. To Let's try episode. to take l less than 10 minutes.
Your Honor, I know we only need to bring the jury in. I think they've got a, a change of plan, uh, but uh, they're going to read Kornberg instead. Um, uh, we we are wondering about Detective Graham tomorrow. You're you're, you're packing your bag. <laughs> well, I'm, he doesn't I, want to stay for the I realize of Dr. Kornberg for reading. He's I'm about, interesting. He's about to abandon me, but before he does so, we'd like to have a discussion about one of their witnesses tomorrow, so he can leave. This is what's going on? And I thought we were going to do the discussion, Dr. Gra or Detective Graham, after we let the jury go home for the day. I think I'll stay. You know. It's probably an hour less. I'll read fast. All right. No, you won't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will read loud and slow. <laughs> Judge, to be clear for the record, we are not calling our next nurse just because of the time. So we're going to read the deposition of Dr. Longberg. Unfortunately, there's no video. So I'll play the part of the attorney, and Mr. Shapiro will be Dr. Longberg. Okay, well, just... Remember, you got to do different voices. <laughs> we have different voices. Wigs. We got the no. wigs. Okay. Are, are we ready to bring in the jury? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, let's bring in the jury. Next time, we'll pack it up. I was almost out of here. That's okay. I was going to give Miss Lawrence your seat. <laughs> she, yeah, she's coming up. Okay, please be seated. Members of the jury, I want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and received no information. Is that all correct? Correct. And uh, no one approached you about this case. Is that correct? Correct. And has anyone seen any media coverage about this case? No. Ms. Corrells, uh, call your next witness, please. Uh, yes, Your Honor, we're going to call Dr. Paul Kornberg's MD by deposition. No wigs, but different voices. <laughs> Deposition taken on November 20th, 2019. Uh, the witness, after being first duly sworn on oath, was examined and deposed as follows. Could you tell us your name, please, sir? Uh, Paul Brian Kornberg. And what is your occupation? I'm a physician. I specialize in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Tell me, well, let me kind of ask you a few questions about your background and training. Where did you go to undergraduate school and medical school? I graduated from the University of California at Berkeley in 1989, and then I attended medical school for a year at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And then I trained at the University of Miami because my wife was a student down there, and I graduated with an MD in 1994. And where did you go from there? After medical school, I was in residency program at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. That was a combined residency of both pediatrics and physical medicine and rehabilitation, so a five-year program. I completed that in 1999, and then I entered a master's degree while I was there in rehabilitation technology, and that's when I completed my training, and then I got a job after that. And your job was here? Actually, no. My first job was at Eastern Virginia Medical School as an assistant professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and that was in Norfolk, Virginia, and I was there for about three years. And then I came here in July 2002, and that's when I took a position with this group. And are you board certified? I am board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Are you board certified in pediatrics? I'm not anymore. When I was initially, but I didn't renew my certification when it expired after, I believe it was a seven-year certification. And do you hold any academic appointments presently? I'm officially an assistant professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation at the University of South Florida. And what medical staffs are you a member of? <coughs> Which, like hospitals, am I at staff at? Yes, sir. I'm at medical staff at St. Joseph's and St. Joseph's Children's Hospital of Tampa, 
where I'm the Medical Director of Pediatric and Adult Rehabilitation. I'm on staff at Tampa General Hospital, where I'm the Medical Director for Pediatric Rehabilitation, and I'm also on staff of what's now Advent Health Tampa, although without any fancy titles. What is the scope of your practice here in Tampa? Well, as a physiatrist, or physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist, I work primarily with children and adults because of the nature of our group with a focus on rehabilitation medicine, trying to help people be as independent as possible as they can be in their lives, trying to help reduce complications that we know they may be at risk for due to their underlying conditions, trying to, you know, in physiatry, there's a broad scope of things that we might also address other than function. Sometimes it has to do with musculoskeletal pain, injury, rehabilitation from injuries, or things of that sort. So I work with a variety of different types of diagnoses. And I work with, you know, ages from infants to geriatrics in a variety of manners. Seeing both patients in the outpatient setting here in this office, and I also have a clinic twice a week at St. Joseph's Hospital. And then I do inpatient care where I perform consultations at both St. Joe's and Tampa General Hospital, and sometimes at Advent Health. And I have a patient population at Tampa General Hospital that's admitted under my care for an inpatient intensive rehabilitation to oftentimes that's a child that's recovering from some sort of injury or illness, rendered them less independent than what they used to be at their baseline. Do you have occasion to treat patients with chronic regional pain syndrome? I do. Uh, it's not something that I see commonly, but I'd say it's something that I've seen over the course of my career, you know, probably maybe on the average one, one to two patients a year, something like that. You see that in the pediatric as well as the adult setting? Yes. I mean, I do more work with children, so I would say I see that more with children. Okay. Because of the nature of that population. That uh, of the nature of that population that I serve. We're here today about a patient by the name of Maya Kowalski. Yes. Do you, do you remember her? I do. I do remember. It's been, I think, four years or so since I've seen her but I do remember her case to a degree. I mean, I would obviously need to rely on her records to help me, but I do remember a bit of the, the time we spent together when she was at the hospital, at Tampa General Hospital, for inpatient rehabilitation. What is your role at Tampa General Hospital in the, I guess you work in the rehabilitation center? Well, the rehab center. And let me know if I'm talking too fast because I have that habit. The rehab center is really geared towards adults. So for children that need inpatient rehabilitation, we do that within the General Pediatric Medical Center. So it's in the General Pediatrics area of the hospital. Then we receive the same types of services, but it's in more of a family-oriented environment where we have pediatric nurses, child life and playrooms, and teachers and child psychology and things like that. So my role there, rehabilitation, is a team sport. There's a lot of different specialists that are involved. And part of that rehabilitation often, and it depends on the needs of the child, or the adults in that case. But oftentimes there's a variety of team members that include physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, nurses, psychologists, social workers, child life therapeutic recreation, and sometimes there's also an additional medical specialist that are involved as well. So as a physiatrist, you know, we're kind of like the team leader. We kind of look at the big picture and try to help out with the coordination of the care for the individual. In the hospital, I'd say that's the kind of role that I play. I mean, there's a lot of people that help to achieve our goals, and I try to help coordinate in that process. But at the same time as a physician, I sometimes will do diagnostic testing or prescribe medications or prescribe specific treatments or consult other specialists or other, phys other physicians to help in the care of a child. Page 13. Were you her admitting physician? I was her admitting physician. At Tampa General Hospital, I have the benefit of working with a nurse practitioner. At the time, it looks like Bonnie Rice was a nurse practitioner on my service, working with me closely. So as you see her name on here, Bonnie performed, usually the nurse practitioner performs the bulk of the documentation. Then I add into that. Sometimes if I'm not around, my partners will cover for me. So there should be a physician involved every day. So, uh, but I was involved in the admission process as reflected in the notes here from her admission history and physical dated July 30th of 2015. So would you have gone over, well, let me back up. You said Ms. Rice is the ARNP. There's she, ARNPs on the service? She is on, yes, yeah, she's the ARNP that works directly with me in pediatric rehabilitation. So she would be, you know, stationed at the hospital all day and seeing the patient as kind of like a frontline contact 
where I'm there every day for portions of the day, but I'm also running to other hospitals and I'm usually doing clinics. Usually at that time, I was probably doing clinics five days a week. There were times, this was a little bit of a, there were other things. I'm not sure if I was around all of the time, but there were other things going on outside of my medical practice that took me away for work for a little bit. So I'm not sure if there were other doctors covering, but she was stationed there as a full-time job. So she was the most directly involved with the patients. So she would have taken the history and done a physical, and then you would have replicated that? Is that what I'm understanding? Well, I mean, I go through the same process. I mean, I review the records. I review information. If there's family that can provide additional information, I'll tend to go over those things as well. I'll review records before a child is admitted to understand what their situation is to the best of my ability <laughs> and to see if they seem appropriate to even bring into an inpatient rehabilitation setting. So that's part of the history gathering is both the review of records, communication with the family, communication with the child, if they're able to provide history. And then I perform my own physical exam uh, as well. I don't document everything all over again in redundancy, but whatever you know, I've commented here, you can see how well it correlates with what I've documented. Well, let me just ask you, generally, what history you took when you admitted Maya on, I think it's July 30th, 2015. Well, I mean the history as reflected in her admission note that I signed off on and amended, you know, reflected that she had previously been treated for asthma exacerbation, had been treated with several courses of steroids in the few months preceding her admission. She had multiple trips to the emergency room at All Children's Hospital, and she developed weakness subsequent to one of those treatments with steroids. And the symptoms resolved over a day or 24 hours. And then she was admitted to All Children's on July 7th for what appeared to be another asthma exacerbation and was treated again with steroids. And then she had increased weakness, had been evaluated by neurology, and had, according, again, this is a summary, you know, of a lengthy hospital record and potentially other information. So I'm sure there's more to the story than all of this. But there was a diagnosis of steroid myopathy that was entertained. I don't know that was something I personally was able to confirm, but that was the history presented to me. She continued to have significant weakness and pain and was having difficulty, you know, functioning performing normal activities for a child her age, which eventually brought her into the hospital with me for rehabilitation. And then it looks like she was seen at some outlying hospitals too, up in Chicago, and was being treated with steroids due to adrenal insufficiency and hydrocortisone. So again, I'm just kind of referring to the documentation here. The history suggests that she had a normal CPK. How is that significant, or is that significant in terms of a myopathy diagnosis? I mean, usually I would anticipate CPK is an enzyme that's released from the muscles when they're inflamed or damaged. So I would think if you have an active myopathy that you would see an elevated, elevated CPK. And I'm certainly not an expert in the diagnosis of myopathy. And I'm not sure what, you know, the sensitivity or specificity of a normal CPK is, if that would exclude a diagnosis of steroid myopathy or not. I couldn't comment on that. But certainly, if we saw an abnormal CPK, it would raise my suspicion that there's some sort of muscular process going on, that this chemical is being released from those muscle cells. Page 19. So if you'd like to take a minute and look at your note, that would be fine. But I was going to ask you next what your physical examination of Maya upon admission consisted of and what it revealed. Well, the general examination that was documented by Dr. Rice, Bonnie Rice is a doctorate, was, you know, Fairly unremarkable in terms of like her heart, her lungs, her abdomen, her general appearance. She was having some distress, Bonnie documented here, with any activity at the bedside and was crying and moaning through most of the exam. She was observed rolling from her back to her stomach without assistance, stretching her legs out fully. She would wipe away her tears with her right hand. She became very upset when asked to sit at the edge of the bed. And what else is going on here? She required assistance to get up to sitting at the edge of the bed. She was complaining of generalized pain and a headache. She was oriented to time, place, and person, but refused many activities that Bonnie had suggested to her. Her examination demonstrated some inconsistencies that suggested a psychological component to her current disability. I said she was observed to feed herself cookies independently, but then when asked to grasp an object, she could not demonstrate commensurate strength and started to cry and turn her head away. Um, I'm going to ask that it be marked as Exhibit 2 to the deposition. Does the history and physical accurately summarize the first encounter that you and Ms. Rice had with Maya on admission to Tampa General? 
to the best of my recollection, I don't have anything that would suggest otherwise. Was there any indication that there were differences in skin temperature on one part of her body as opposed to others? I don't think that was documented here, so I don't think I could comment on that. Was there any indication of differences in color in one area of her body as opposed to others? I don't see anything of that documented. I can, you know, despite the fact that this is quite a few years ago, there was nothing of that nature that I appreciated in any of my examinations of her that I recalled. But I don't recall ever really appreciating any color differences or temperature differences. Those would have been something that would have been documented because that's an abnormal finding. Were you able to appreciate any areas of alopecia or hair loss? That I do not recall, and I don't have documentation to suggest that. Nothing that I appreciated significantly enough to document, but I wouldn't venture to say that it couldn't have been present. After you and Ms. Rice saw Maya and did your initial evaluation of her in terms of the history and the physical examination, did you arrive at some, at some impression about what her diagnosis was and or what the plan of therapy might be? Well, in terms of the findings and the diagnosis that I could ascribe at the time she appeared she had some weakness, listed in her diagnosis as quadriparesis, meaning weakness of all of her extremities, gait disorder, meaning an inability of, or an abnormal ability to walk, to ambulate, an impairment of her activities of daily living, things like dressing, bathing, hygiene, and grooming. I don't know that I had anything to actively say that she had muscle infl inflammation, like abnormal CPKs and things like that. And then possible adrenal insufficiency. Again, this was some information that had been provided to us and that she actually was being treated for. And then pain and anxiety. And I noted that there were some, in addition to whatever else was going on, some psychological component that was reflected in her. You know, degree of distress and the inconsistencies in her performance of activities, depending on if, you know, who was doing it. When it was, you know, how much she wanted to cooperate or the activity that was presented. That, that she was, for example, doing things on her own that she couldn't replicate for me when I asked to do them when she was more consciously thinking about them. And what was your plan of therapy at that point? Well, I mean, it says here to begin comprehensive rehabilitation, including neuropsychology, integrative medicine, physical and occupational therapy, kind of medical just monitoring and making sure she was medically stable, nursing involvement for safety precautions, and medication administration and education. Social services and case management to help with basically discharge planning and any equipment needs. A dietitian to optimize her nutritional status, getting a hospital homebound teacher to help with school integration, and having the neuropsychiatrist work with her. In general, you know, with rehabilitation, the whole process of admission begins with evaluations by all these different specialists on the multidisciplinary team to assess where a patient is currently. You know, what's her level of function now, physically and emotionally and cognitively? And then moving forward from there, once we identify what their deficits are, then we establish goals to try to work towards those. Did you, enter 26, sorry. Did you entertain any suspicion that this patient had complex regional pain syndrome or reflux sympathetic dystrophy? I don't recall that being on my diagnosis that was on my differential or on my radar at that time. So my next question was, why would that be? Why would that not be on my differential? Yes, sir. Well, I didn't identify any history or symptoms that I felt were consistent with that. I know it can present in a variety of different ways, but it, that was not something that seemed to be consistent, at least with the history that was available to me or her physical examination. Do you recall what this patient's hospital course was? Well, I mean, I had the benefit of reviewing discharge summary yesterday. I went back into the hospital notes just to help refresh myself because it had been a while. And, but I do recall without having to look at that, that this was not an easily predictable course of recovery and that her performance continued to be variable throughout the stay. So that you know, again, inconsistencies, I would say were the most notable thing about her hospital course and in her response to therapy. Oftentimes, again, every child is different, every underlying problem is different, but it's a little bit easier for me to predict how someone's going to respond to an injury, let's say, if you have a fractured hip, or spinal cord injury, or even a brain injury, that they'd be quite diverse too, but there is a typical kind of course of recovery. Not everyone reads the book, so it's not always like that, and we deal with a lot of people that don't read the book and have atypical courses. But as I recall, her performance varied quite a bit from day to day, depending on the therapist, depending on her mood, I think there was some variability depending on family members being present or not present. 
In the discharge summary on the next to last page, I note that there is an indication that the patient should stop taking certain medications, including acetaminophen, clonidine, diazepam, hydrocortisone, and oxycodone. Is that correct? Yes. But again, the general idea, at least in my approach, is to minimize medications that aren't clearly of benefit. So if some of the medications that were discontinued by the time she had been discharged on the list of stop taking medications is diazepam, which is Valium, which is a sedative and reduces anxiety, but can have negative consequences, sedation and tolerance and dependence and addiction and things like that. So when she came to the hospital, she was two and a half milligrams every six hours. And by the time she left, she was off of that. We also had recommended stopping, well, Tylenol. That's more of an over-the-counter, though I think that's not really the case because I do start to see Tylenol. So she was allowed to take Tylenol as needed for pain. Maybe we changed the dose. We also had her off steroids. I believe we also had endocrinology see her, if I remember correctly. So when she was admitted to the hospital, she was taking, it looks like hydrocortisone, either 5 or 2.5 milligrams. It might have been on alternating days. But by the time she left, she was taken off that based on the endocrinologist's recommendation. What else? She was also stopped taken off oxycodone, which is the narcotic pain medication. Obviously can help with pain, but can also have ne negative consequences. So those were the things that were discontinued. There were several medications that we started that we recommended to be continued after her discharge. What medications did you continue? Well, medications that she was not taking when she came in that were recommended when she left were baclofen, which is a medicine for muscle spasticity. It looks like 10 milligrams twice a day. And then she could take an extra 5 milligrams if she needed to three times a day for muscle spasms. She was also recommended to take Pepsid, which is something she was admitted on. It's an acid blocker for the stomach. She was recommended to continue with Prozac, Fluxodidine, and was recommended by the physiatrist. And then ibuprofen, which is obviously Advil or Motrin, something for pain, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So was there any, by the time of discharge, had she been weaned off of narcotics and similar medications? Off both of the narcotics and the Valium, the benzodiazepines, <laughs> yes. And what was the discharge diagnosis at this point? Again, one of the pluses and minuses of an electronic medical record system, you know, this is populated list of problems in the hospital. So that lists the history of steroid-induced myopathy resolved by the time of admission was documented, gait disorder, impairment of daily living and mobility, asthma, psychological factors affecting physical condition, suspected conversion disorder versus factitious disorder versus others, anxiety disorder, and myalgia. Was there a point in time in which the family or the mother was opposed to discharging Maya? Well, I do recall again, I do remember a little bit about this, and I recall reading about it at the very end of this day. She was complaining of some headaches, and the mother wanted her to undergo more testing at the time. And I think that maybe vision was a concern about her eye. We actually had an eye doctor, an ophthalmologist, evaluate her. And her, neurologi her neurological exam and her symptoms didn't, at that time, I didn't feel warranted further imaging studies of her brain. So we had recommended an outpatient MRI of her brain, but I think that there was a little bit of a holdup. I don't know if I kept her in the hospital an extra day or not, where the mother wanted to keep her some more testing after she'd already undergone, you know, extensive testing, both diagnostic testing, imaging, but also a lot of the clinical testing by all members of the team that were caring for her. But, but there's, there's, sorry. That's right. But there's a sentence in here that says, quote, inpatient psychiatric care recommended to mother when we spoke earlier this week but unfortunately, there are no programs near her home, so this was not felt to be feasible, end quote. What was the purpose of that recommendation? Well, it seemed to me like Maya's mental health was a primary issue that was impeding her progress and functional recovery. And as such, she, wasn't, she didn't respond to the type of rehabilitation regimen, or at least she didn't respond as well as I would have liked, by any means to the type of treatment that we could offer, and I felt like ongoing psychiatric care would be an important component. Were there recommendations made for outpatient psychological or psychiatric care? Certainly. And did you have a specific recommendation in terms of how much or how frequently or from whom those that should be gotten? Well, in terms of how frequently, we recommend intensive, like an inpatient psychiatric program if that were available. Was there also a recommendation for physical, sorry, physical therapy? I believe so. 
And given her ongoing limitations, I mean, when she left the hospital, she was still requiring a significant amount of assistance. We have here, you know, she wasn't really able to walk. She needed assistance even moving around in bed for the most part. So yes, we recommended ongoing physical therapy after discharge, likely occupational therapy as well. Was there any point at which you could identify an organic or physiologic reason for her muscle weakness and inability to walk? I don't think I, again, I would defer to the documentation. And if you point me out to something, I can comment on it. But I don't recall identifying a specific physiologic organic explanation for her functional limitations, no. I can represent to you I didn't see one in the chart. That's why I'm asking. Right. I don't recall having a good explanation that I understood from a physiologic standpoint to explain her functional limitations. At the time of discharge, did you consider the possibility of chronic regional pain syndrome or reflex sympathetic dystrophy? I don't believe so. And why was that? Again, to the best of my recollection, I don't think I appreciated a history or symptomology that I would attribute to that diagnosis. Okay. And you know, it didn't, she didn't present in a manner, and I know that can be a different type of presentation depending on the individual, but it wasn't consistent with any presentation of CRPS that I'd seen or read about before. Did you consider referring this patient to a CRPS specialist of any sort? That was not in the recommendations listed under discharge instructions. And again, without that being something that I consider to be an underlying diagnosis, I don't think I would have made a referral of that nature. Across by Mr. Anderson. Dr. Kornborg, I have a timing issue, so counsel has been gracious enough to allow me to do a cross a little earlier. So I'm just going to be here for a little while, and then I'm out. And I'm Greg Anderson, and I represent, I represent the Kowalski family. And I believe we've got a little bit of updating for you about what happened in this case. I've handed you Exhibit 4, which is an article called The Budapest Criteria for Complex Regional Pain Syndrome, The Diagnostic Challenge. And it's in the Journal of Anesthesiology and Clinical Science Research. And I'm asking you to turn to page three of that report. It is not bait stamped. And the top, there's a listing of the Budapest criteria. Do you see that on table one? I do. And are you familiar with the Budapest criteria for complex regional pain syndrome? Not specifically, no. How about the Orlando, the prior 1983 Orlando criteria? for complex regional pain syndrome. I'm not familiar with the name itself. I'm familiar with the symptoms that are listed here in the presentation, but I'm not familiar with them being attributed to the name Orlando or Budapest necessarily. So you're not a, you haven't made complex regional pain syndrome a focus of study, would that be fair to say? That's true, to say. yes. And how about, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and about how many pediatric patients have you had with complex regional pain syndrome? Well, I would say probably after completing my residency, and now it's been about 20 years, I would say probably in that time it's been, I said, maybe one to two a year, but I think that's probably more like 15 to 20 patients in the course of 20 years, something like that, you know, overall. All right, so maybe one a year? Something like that. And it's, it can be diffuse pain. It can be localized pain. There's a couple of different categories of CRPS, is there not? I would have to, again, I'm not an expert in CRPS. I would defer to the literature about that. The only time I've been exposed to patients with an underlying problem has been a localized phenomenon, not a general one, not a generalized one. But again, that's just in my experience. Page 45. Do you treat CRPS kids different when they come in with pain from somebody who, say, is recovering from a brain injury or recovering from something else? Oh, certainly. But in any event, you treat it different? Yes. From? A, a physiatry point I'm of sorry. view. From a physiatry point of view or physical therapy point of view, I guess? Sure, sure. And again, it depends on how they're presenting and what their limitations are. I mean, if I have a patient with CRPS that was unable to perform, that was unable to function and to get dressed, then I might use many of the same principles we would use with a patient that had a different type of, let's say, injury to help them regain their independence. With physical therapy and occupational therapy and education, maybe equipment to help them function better, but at the same time trying to control their pain, trying to control the, the, the psychological symptoms that you would see with somebody that has severe pain, which is always an issue with people that have chronic pain and things like that. Sure. And I can provide you with the documentation, the histories of ACH and Lurie's if it's necessary, but I advise you that this muscle weakness that eventually put her into the wheelchair, Maya into the wheelchair, came on very quickly in the space of a week or so. 
and that began, I think the date is July 3rd or 4th, before you saw her. You saw her for the first time on what, July 30th? Yes. And at that time, she had already been to two different hospitals with concerns about this, right? That's my understanding, yes. And the doctors there, I think there were admissions involved, came away with this steroid myopathy related to the drug she was getting for her asthma. Is that right? That's my understanding. So when she was presented to you, two hospitals had already, the doctors at two hospitals, had given you their thoughts of what it could po possibly probably be. Is that right? I'm sorry, what's the question? The question is, by the time you saw her, or when you first saw her, you had two different hospitals that had given you an impression, a working diagnosis, I guess, right. of this steroid-induced myopathy, right? Correct. And complex regional pain syndrome is a disease that takes a little while to develop, does it not? Yes, I would say it evolves. There's different stages of it, yes. And so when you saw her, you were seeing her fairly, if it was, and for this purpose, we'll just say it was, if it was CRPS, you were fairly early into the stages. Would you say that? If... I guess if the onset was in the month of July, and then I, I saw her later at the end of July, then yes, that would be more in the early stages, I would think, of the development of something like that. Page 53. So did she have a decreased range of motion from whatever cause in any of her limbs? I think I would have to look at the therapy assessments. You know, it's very, one of the challenges in caring for Maya during her rehab stay is, again, I mentioned, you know, her inconsistent manifesta manifestations and her inconsistent complaints. Well, then you go down under, and so the symptoms must report at least symptoms in three of the four categories. Do we have that here, in that she had hyperesthesia, elodynia, and some, from whatever cause, decreased range of motion, if in, if in fact there was a decreased range of motion? I mean, this is, this is a very concrete, specific question you're asking me. And, you know, unfortunately, there was nothing concrete and clear about Maya. So I'm not sure how to answer that, really, because, you know, if she had hyperesthesia or allodynia, it should have been something that was reproducible and consistent. But I don't recall anything about her presentation being consistent. I would have loved to have seen something specific like that, that I would have been able to say, hey, you know, and again, temperature, temperature changes and color changes, those are the things that I look for. And the lack of their documentation kind of, you know, I know they weren't there, otherwise I would have documented it. I certainly wouldn't interpret the findings that I recall and the findings that at least I've seen in the recent past and today to be to allow me to make the diagnosis of CRPS based on these criteria because I don't think I ever saw a consistent. And that was one of the things is there were many times I remember that I could, we could do things with Maya and she would tolerate them just fine and then there were times she wouldn't. So I didn't see a consistent allodynia or hyperesthesia or any recollection of temperature or color asymmetry or any consistency with range of motion limitations. Page 60. This child had her feet turned in towards each other, did she not? The documentation does reflect that when she was doing that, but there were times when she wasn't as well. But yes, I know there are. I'm just looking at a note that she would posture her foot into plantar flexion and inversion. Whether that's dystonia versus volitional, I couldn't separate the two. The fact that it wasn't consistent makes me, you know, question whether it really was dystonia or not, but I couldn't exclude that. Page 62. I'll represent to you, doctor, and this was taken off of a Facebook page. It's been produced to the defendant, and it is Maya under general anesthesia. Do you note there her feet turned in with two toes just about touching? I mean, the picture demonstrate, demonstrates her foot and ankle in that position, yes. Would that mitigate against this being a volitional thing as opposed to dystonia? You know, this is a static picture. This doesn't tell me anything about that, really. You know, so there's no way to look at a picture and say this is dystonia or this is a resting posture. You know, again, I can't interpret this to reveal one versus the other. Well, if it's a resting posture, that means the child would be relaxed. Are you saying she would relax her feet into that position? Well, I can't. With the toes pointed towards each other? I can't tell if she's relaxed or not relaxed by a photograph. You know, when we sleep, all of us are, and when we're supine and relaxed, all of our feet will tend to go into, into an equinus position. Now, I don't know the specifics of what her ankle range of motion was at that time, but again, I can't interpret a photograph to re rep reflect dystonia versus gravity versus just positioning. If someone's anesthetized, they're going to be in whatever position they're put in, and then gravity will encourage. So again, I mean, it certainly it could be dystonia, 
The only way to know would be to either have electrode sensing or muscle activity. Dystonia means a sustained muscle contraction. And even my patients with dystonia, when they're undergoing, I mean, I have patients that I treat for dystonia. When they have to undergo surgery, they're anesthetized and their dystonia is controlled. So I, I would think that if she was under general anesthesia, whether she had dystonia or not, she should be relaxed. But again, I can't interpret whether her muscle is contracting or forcing her into this position, or if it's just this position she's in based on a photograph. It's the muscle activity piece that doesn't tell us. For lack of a better term, that level of pigeon-footedness with the two angles turned to the point where the feet touch each other, that is not a natural position, is it? But if someone has limited range of motion in their ankles, it certainly could be their natural position. But again, if someone is anesthetized, if they put you in a position that gravity will maintain, then the position that you're going, that's the position you're going to be in. And I can't speak to this being, you know, normal versus abnormal. There's a lot of different factors depending on her range of motion, the torsion of her ankles and her tibias. The issue of her keeping her feet in that position volitionally was an ongoing issue, according to your records here, right? Right, right. I think that was a recurrent thing that we saw, you know, frequently. Right. And I didn't, again, have an understanding that the note that I just read to you expressed my opinion that it was more likely volitional than dystonia, based on the inconsistency and the fact that she was able to break it and reposition her foot when she was sitting in a wheelchair, and her feet would nicely be on the footrest and things like that. But it was happening on and off. Yes, I do recall that during our hospitalization. Okay. And, and, and that is a concern because, you know, her examination made, it was very difficult because of her level of pain and her variability in presentation to try to come up with a great understanding of exactly what was going on. Well, Jack Kowalski just gave a deposition and described an incident involved whether or not this was dystonia, involving whether or not this was dystonia, in which you were working with her and with her ankles, and I guess there was some frustration there, and perhaps in jest or whatever, you had told her, look, you've got to straighten out, or to the effect that you've got to straighten out these ankles, or we're going to have to break your legs and straighten them out ourselves, or words to that effect. Did that ever happen? I don't think I would ever tell a child I'm going to break their legs. I mean, I have said if you... If there was a concern that I think that was documented, and I think her mother had stated about contractures or losing flexibility in your ankles, I mean, if you persistently posture any part of your body in a certain position, then you can get stiff in your joints. And again, that could result in a need for surgery to regain flexibility. Typically, it doesn't involve breaking anything. Usually, it's a muscle surgery, a tendon surgery, things like that. So no, I would not have said anything about breaking legs. That wouldn't have come out of my mouth. Page 69. Would you agree with me that under that description there, the Budapest criteria, as taken from this empirical study, I think would be the best way to put it, that under motor trophic, she did have some of the symptoms there, the decreased range of motion, motor dysfunction, weakness, tremor, and we'll just call it in dispute about dystonia. Like you said, the dystonia, I'm not sure about. I can't comment about trophic changes because I didn't document that. I don't recall seeing them. If they consistently show weakness, then you know they're weak. But my recollection was that Maya's presentation was variable. And there are times that she could do things, and then there are times that she could, and then you go to ask her to do something, and then she couldn't do it. And that makes it very hard for me to interpret. Well, what's weak and what's volitional, maybe even isn't the right word, because I think some people can't do things. I don't think they're necessarily doing it on purpose, but they can't do it for, you know, other psychological reasons or manifestations. Page 73. And then number four is that no other diagnosis can better explain the patient's signs and symptoms. Was there ever in any of the Tampa general records that you've been through or are familiar with ever a differential diagnosis made of what exactly Maya had? I think, you know, the only thing that comes to mind is some of the psychological diagnoses that were documented. And I'm not sure that the psychiatry note and the neuropsychology note suggests. I know, I think in the discharge summary, it comments on a question of conversion disorder or factitious disorder. You know, those types of things, I think could present in that way. I don't think that's necessarily any better explanation than anything else. I don't think there's any way any other organic diagnosis could explain her symptoms. I don't have any other 
any organic diagnosis that would manifest so inconsistently where she would be able to do something at one moment and then not the next, or would go limp all of a sudden and then not. So I don't have any other medical diagnoses other than a psychological one that might explain her presentation. 77. Let me rephrase that. As a scientist, which doctors are in part, and also artists in part, would you agree with me that it is at least a possibility that this child had complex regional pain syndrome, developing complex regional pain syndrome? In my experience, I don't think her symptoms, I mean, you're saying is it possible? Gosh, a lot that's possible. I wouldn't say that it's impossible, but I think regional means regional. And I don't think there was any kind of region of her body that I could say that this is where her pain is. It was global, where she seemed to complain. You know, it was her back, her arms, her legs. So at least to my understanding of the syndrome of CRPS, I don't think that her presentation was consistent with that. Page 82. Nothing in your record indicated any signs of medical of child abuse or neglect by the parent, did you? I don't recall any observation consistent with that. I don't know if there's anything documented that would suggest that, because that would have been brought to my attention and something that we would have had to address. But I don't recall ever seeing anything of that nature, no. And similarly, in this entire admission, there's no mention by anyone, including neurologists, psychologists, and yourself, of much housing by proxy or any fictitious disorder by proxy or anything like that. I don't recall anything being documented of the nature or discussed during the admission. I know that the mention of factitious disorder by Maya, not by proxy, was a consideration that was documented, but I don't think anybody attributed something to another family member. And doctor, I've noted in the take a look at, and here I've got them, I'll mark them as six. I think we can Thank you. Skip. Okay. Does this appear that this, I'm sorry, Ms. Sturdle. Does this appear that this was under the care of Marissa Higgins? This date here, August 7th, 2015, at 445? Yes, she's the one who drafted the note. And through the notes, there were some comments about whether or not the child made more effort with one parent or another parent, right? I don't know if you're referring, at the very end of the note here, it says, patient demonstrates improved participation during today's treatments, but require frequent rest breaks and redirection due to increased pain. Patient was more willing to try standing with mother present in the room. Does that indicate to you that Maya was willing to try more things with mom there? That's what the physical therapist thought. Let me show you what we'll mark as seven, and that's TGH 245 to 248. And this is again with Marissa Higgins. Okay. And this looks like physical therapy, or is it occupational? I can't tell. Which is it here? Th this is Marissa, so it's physical therapy. And it looks like it happened August 13th at 4.20 p.m., and under general observations there it says... Patient's mother present for a second half of physical therapy. Center of the page. Where, where does it say that here? On which page are we on? The first one, page 244. Oh, yes, I see. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. So mom present for second half of PT, and then under other, what does it say? Demonstrated improved motivation when mother was present in the room. Page 91. And in particular, the dystonia, I'm sorry, in particular, the dystonia or the talk of the dystonia and the allodynia, those types of things that you were talking about today against the backdrop of your familiarity with those things in your specialty. You still believe that the primary issue here with regard to Maya was a psychological or psychiatric or psychogenic feature, correct? Yeah, that was the most, that was the most significant manifestation of her symptoms or her clinical issues. There may have been something physiologic or something other than that, but that was the thing that really clouded the assessment of anything else. Because of her tolerance of activities and the variability in the tolerance of her activities and things like that, that I would say was the biggest part that I could identify. And the variability that you just mentioned and the inconsistencies you talked about today, that was a key issue for you with regard to not being able to identify a physiologic source of Maya's pain correct? Sure. I mean, again, it's very challenging when we're trying to help Maya to, let's say, you know, learn to stand and then to walk or to dress herself when we see her performing an activity on her own. And then when we ask her to do the same thing, then she demonstrates that she can't. When we just saw her doing, you know, something very similar. So it makes it very hard to try to help her for whatever reason that may be. And that's why I felt that physiological and psychiatric, that's why I felt that psychological, 
psycholo- psycho- psychological in- psycho- yeah I'll show you. <laughs> Sorry. almost got it. so that makes it very hard to try to help her for whatever reason that it may be and that's why I felt that psychological and psychiatry involvement was very very important things in trying to improve her condition page 98 and you mentioned the input from the various team members the interdisciplinary team members what team members were involved here Physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychology, child life, and social services. And so not only you, doctor, but nobody on any of the other teams that we just talked about suspected or referenced a concern for CRPS. Is that right? Not to my recollection. On page 11 of your discharge summary, again, it's page 12 on TGA Bates. It's about halfway down, maybe two-thirds of the way down. I'm sorry, may have a third of the way down. You reference, it says... Maya made significant functional improvements over the period. Do you see that? Yes. And so I'll read it. It says, quote, Maya made significant functional improvements over the period when she did not have a rooming in parent, end quote. Yes. What's the import or significance of that statement? Well, I don't want to read too much into this, but I mean the statement itself would suggest that Maya performed better when her family wasn't around. Page 103. Would you mind just reading that into the record for us? It says, quote, she had an episode of symptoms, drooping right eyelid, blurred vision, migraine type headaches, and that prompted evaluation by a pediatric intensive care unit resident, as well as ophthalmology, close quote. And if you would, just for my benefit, just read the next two sentences. Okay, so, quote, neurology aware and did not recommend further diagnostic studies. Symptoms were resolved the following day and for the remainder of the stay. However, on the day of discharge, mother demanded further diagnostic studies, demanding a CT of her head for these persistent, blurry vision and headaches, close quote. And I lied to you, doctor. One more sentence. Quote, Maya has not demonstrated nor complained of these symptoms over the past 72 hours, but reported these to mother at the time that she'd been having these, close quote. And the same question as I asked you before about that first sentence we read on a little bit ago. What's the import or significance of documenting that in this portion of the discharge summary? The information that was being offered to us, the subjective information about my symptoms was, you know, variable. And she was telling us one thing and telling her mom something different. And so it made, you know, we tried to assess her, the neurologist, the ophthalmologist, and the ICU resident were responding to her. But the report of symptoms was challenging depending on, you know. I'm sorry, it was changing. I'm sorry. But the report of symptoms was changing, depending on, you know, who she was talking to, things of that sort. Inconsistencies are significant as far as when you're trying to approach, especially a team approach to treat a patient, correct? Sure. I mean, just to make a diagnosis, you know, a consistency of symptoms will certainly help us. And that inconsistency is, makes things a lot cloudier and also raises a lot of questions of, you know, why are these inconsistencies there? And that led to the discussion we had earlier about my concerns for her mental health and the need for psychology and psychiatry to be further involved. Doctor, I have a note here. It's page 335 of the hospital note, but it's TGH 336, though. Do you have that in front of you? Yes. It's a progress note from Dr. Kornberg dated 8715 at 1042 a.m.? Yes. Do you have that? Uh, Yes, I have it in front of me. Doctor, under subjective there, and I won't ask you to read any more, doctor, because it's only about a sentence, but you do, it's documented there, Maya's C slash O, and I believe that C slash O means complaints of? Yes. Maya's complaints of pain have escalated as well since her mother is at bedside. Do you see that? Yes. Is there a reason that you would have made reference to that in this particular note? And I would suspect that this portion of the note was again drafted by Dr. Rice, my nurse practitioner. Just that Maya would, you know, complain more about pain when her mother was present, which, you know, kids will perform differently where they may focus on a parent, and sometimes that's why we need to have parents away from them in therapy, so they focus on therapy and things like that. But it seems like this would suggest that she would complain more about pain when her mother was present. Ms. Carlos, let me, before you start the next question, are we close to the end, or how much? Just... Because I'm going to need to take a break here very soon. So I would say 10, 5 minutes, 10 minutes. Five there's 10 just, minutes? Yeah, we're almost done. Okay. I think we can make 5 or 10 minutes. Go. We good? Okay. All right, 
I think your answer continues. But it, yeah. Page 107. But it seems like that would suggest she would complain more about the pain when her mother was present. It, and is that in isolation? Is that something that could be congruent or commensurate with a conversion disorder or a fictitious disorder from your experience? I don't know that I would link those two. I would just say it's something that's a manifestation of a child and parent relationship. You know, a child is often in this dependent position and the parent is there to help them. So it's not unusual. It's kind of what I was alluding to a second ago, is that when the parents are around, the children may be more focused on the parent and they may be more likely to voice a complaint when the, than when the parent is present. We see this in other cases and that's why sometimes we need to keep the parents like out of the therapy gym so the kid ends up focusing better and accomplishing more in therapy. So it's not something I would specifically say, at least in my experience, would be, you know, more consistent with any sort of mental health disorder or conversion disorder or factitious disorder, but rather something that we just see in a child-parent relationship. Fair enough. Would it be fair to say that based upon what you just testified to, that that might be one of the reasons why if you can separate the parent and child, it allows you as the attending physician or the provider to test the consistencies and inconsistencies of the patient? Yes, sometimes it gives us a better picture of what the patient is capable of, and that's not always the case. Sure. But you know, there are children that won't perform unless the parent is there, but it's something that we deal with often, that kind of the influence of the parent's presence as a positive or a negative, depending on the child. Page 111. Doctor, let me harken to your discharge summary once again, and particularly page 11. It's TGA Bates stamp 12 with the discharge summary, page 11. There's a passage near the top of the page, third line down from that, that says, quote, the neurologist ordered an EMG slash nerve conduction study that was normal, paren of note, despite Maya's inability to tolerate tactile stimulation to her arms and legs throughout her stay, she had absolutely no difficulty tolerating the electrical stimulation and needle insertion into multiple muscles of arms and legs, close paren, end quote. How is that significant? Again, that's another reflection of just the inconsistency in her presentation and her symptoms that were reported. That she could, you know, tolerate something that would, you know, typically be painful, uncomfortable procedure very well. Whereas there were times that she couldn't tolerate us, you know, touching her or, <clears throat> you know, certain activities with any therapy that wouldn't have been expected to elicit any pain. Okay. So that's just another documentation of that inconsistent presentation. Could you describe for us what a nerve conduction study and EMG consists of? Sure. A nerve conduction study involves putting electrodes, like little stickers, on the skin overlying certain nerves. And then with the device, you can apply an electrical stimulation. So it feels like a shock. And then you can measure through those electrodes the strength, the speed of the signals being sent through the nerves. So that's something that's, you know, it depends on the person. It's not usually intolerable, but it's uncomfortable. And that's one of the parts of the test. <clears throat> then the EMG, or the electromyography, involves putting needles into the muscles themselves and getting feedback on a screen and auditorily of the electrical activity within those muscles. So that's, as you can imagine, it feels like a needle being put into your arm or your leg or into a muscle. And both of those things are inconsistent with the hyperesthesia? Well, I would think that if somebody had hyperesthesia and hypersensitivity to pain, that, you know, this would be even more painful rather than less, you know. And with tolerate the, tolerating those procedures, the EMG and nerve conduction study, would tolerating them without complaint also be inconsistent with allodynia? It would be. Yes, I would expect, again, heightened pain response with the allodynia with the hyperesthesias rather than tolerating something like that easily. And then the indication here is that there is volitional movement of all four extremities, but performance is highly variable, particularly when asked to move for a medical exam. Is that part of the inconsistency that you've been referring to? Sure. Similarly, when, to when I saw her, you know, using her hands to do something with her phone or whatever I had, we talked about earlier, and then I asked her to squeeze my hand, and she couldn't demonstrate the strength she was using when she was playing when I asked her to specifically show me that. Just another, again, inconsistency in performance. And the next sentence of that indicates, and quoting, quote, Maya was functionally worse across all domain with mother present and assisting, end quote. Does that go back once again to the question of Maya not performing as well when mother was present? That is what that would suggest. Yes, I mean, I don't know specifically what Bonnie, Dr. Rice, was referring to, but yes, it would suggest that Maya was more dependent and less capable when her mother was present and trying to help her. Looking at your note of August 7th again. Sorry. 
page 335, is there a reference in that note as well to Maya's pain complaints escalating since the mother was at bedside? Yes, it says Maya's complaints of pain have escalated as well since her mother is at bedside. Mom requests oxycodone specifically. Discuss with mom that it's better to ignore Maya's moaning and only give her analgesics if she asks. We also want to encourage her to take ibuprofen and only resort to the oxycodone for severe pain. You mentioned earlier that you're fairly conservative with pain medication. If this patient were, well, you mentioned also that you had had a number of patients referred to you with CRPS. I have, yes. In my experience with CRPS, it's always involved a limb, you know, a single arm or a single leg, or, you know, hand or foot or something like that. So there's usually weakness, there's pain, there's often sleep disruption. So there's often an element of a mood disorder, whether it be anxiety because of pain or some degree of depression symptoms or a combination of the two. So pain control and using medication to help improve pain control, I think is very important. And sometimes we also, I also prescribe medication to help with sleep and pain. And there are some medications that can serve both purposes. And with the pain better controlled and the focus of my treatment approach involves rehabilitation interventions like physical therapy to perform stimulation to the extremity, weight bearing, range of motion, strengthening, using modalities like heat or ice or contrast baths, using electrical stimulation like a TENS unit or something different type of electrical stimulation. So there's a role for medication, but for me, I think the medications play a limited role. And it's really the other interventions with the use of the extremity and the weight bearing that tend to really help those symptoms resolve. But without the medications, sometimes the patient can't tolerate the therapy. Page 120. So in your experience, is the treatment of CRPS in the pediatric setting a multidisciplinary activity? Absolutely. And one thing I didn't include in my common recommendations is getting psychology involved, you know. And it's not necessarily, it may be to help address symptoms of anxiety or depression, but it's also to teach the patient and the family methods to try to control pain without medication, you know, non-pharmacologic managements of pain. Going back to your notes for a moment, looking at your note of August 10th, there seems on page 310 there is, well, let me just point it to you. Under the physiatry portion of the plan, the first sentence of that. It says, quote, reports of mom being resistant to medication reduction. Dad states that he had discussions with mom and she's agreeable for now. Limit medical conversations in the room. Steroid wean completed. Further wean off Valium today. We'll discuss the necessity of repeat serum cortisol levels with Dr. Kornberg in, plan of care, in continued plan of care. This centers on positive reinforcement, structure, and boundaries. Maya continues to make steady progress with this plan of care. Page 124. Doctor, we've gone back and forth a lot today, but with everything you saw through this, would you agree that mom and dad Kowalski cared about their daughter and were do, doing everything possible to help her? I think that requires me to take a step beyond what I'm able to say I know. I mean, I don't, I can say that I never got the impression in my interactions with the family that they were doing anything to the contrary of that. But I don't think I've had enough exposure to them or know them well enough to say that they were doing everything possible, you know, to help them. Again, but I didn't see anything that would suggest that that was not the case. So, Doctor, what can we say is you didn't see any indication that this, these parents were trying to, either one of them were trying to abuse this child, did you? I didn't see any. I didn't see any evidence of that in my interactions with them, no. That would conclude the deposition there. Okay, members of the jury, I think this is a good place for us to stop today. Gentlemen, we approached just very briefly. Um, can we do it after we let the jury go? I, yes. So, members of the jury, I do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. And we'll see you tomorrow. We see that. <laughs> okay, uh, the jury's out of our presence if you all want to come up now. Oh, it's not.
It was just, I was just looking for a similar instruction to Bonnie Rice about the dates of the TGH admission, just like we did yesterday, so they'd have some, yeah. just they'd be there. oriented. And yeah. I think, I think uh, Ms. Cross had the same plan, but that's okay. Maybe we can publish records. We can do that uh, first thing tomorrow. Um, question, uh, are we going to want to do, I know we got the Detective Graham issue, you, are we going to do more exhibits tonight? Do you want us to come in? Knowing that we're going to go until 6 tomorrow, do you also want to come in at 8.15 tomorrow, or do you want to work tonight? Um, Judge, well, I would only say that um, I think the medical records council was going to look at tonight to see if there were, as to which ones were not already in, and we wanted to look at that one medical record. I think tomorrow's better. That's what I'm saying. Okay, so tomorrow at 8.15, and then we'll get here at 8.15, we'll do records, and after the jury leaves for the day, we'll keep doing records. All right, so. And exhibits. Okay. I, I'm hearing the, I'm hearing your honor. We're trimming the sales. What, what's the detective grand issue? Just Did you need to take a break, your honor, before we do the Well, I'm trying to figure out how long this is going to be. I'm going to guess, I don't know, I'm going to guess it's a 10 to 15 minute argument. But that's just a swag. What do we what do we have? Oh. So why don't we do do um the the detective gram now? I'm just gonna stand because I've been sitting way too long. So Your Honor, uh, I think they told us just before lunch that they intend to call Detective Graham tomorrow. Uh, we Previously filed a motion in limine to exclude her interview altogether for various reasons. At DEN 2531, the court entered an order um, limiting the, the use of Detective Graham's interview uh, for really any purpose except for impeachment, which the defense attempted to use with Jack Kowalski. And, and so... And then the order further stated that if they wanted to offer Detective Graham for any other purpose, they had to specifically seek permission outside the presence of the jury. Um, I can continue with my argument against it, or we can give them an opportunity to. Well, I mean, my order is at DIN 2531. So, I mean, I, I remember reviewing and listening to Detective Graham and... I think the issue is what they're going to seek to elicit from him. And I mean, I guess the, these are statements by Jack Kowalski. So we've got an exception to the hearsay, but otherwise the, it's a hearsay conversation. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, I plan on calling D Detective Graham, uh, just briefly walking her through her education and training, uh, and then establishing that she sat down for a conversation with Mr. Kowalski. Uh, and during that conversation, I had intended to elicit about six to eight statements that were made uh, as submissions by party opponents. I have the audio that I'd also like to play in conjunction with. I'm happy to preview all of those with your honor so you can, before we do it in front of the jury, so that that way... We what, can... what are the statements that we're talking about? Um, if I can pull up my outline, I can tell you specifically if you'd like to know that. Ms. Crowell's, uh, was there a, because it looks like we used about 55 minutes for that. Is there a percentage that she can uh, give me? I can count the pages and we can divide it up. I think it's usually a minute page kind of thing. Well, I mean, is it like two-thirds, one-third, 75%, 25%? Just give me the rough approximation. Yeah, I'll give, I, I'll, I'll give you a rough draft. Just give me one second. I'll, it's highlighted different colors, so I can give you a Thanks, Mr. Shapiro. Yeah, I apologize. I don't have the exact transcript with me, but there was a statement about uh, that uh, Mr. Kowalski made where he told Detective Graham he did not think it was in um, Maya's best interest that Mrs. Kowalski was calling the hospital. Um, the statement that he observed Maya's pain levels to be different depending on who was in the room. Um, 
the statement about Mrs. Kowalski making inappropriate uh, comments on the phone during supervised calls. Um, Are you saying say that one more time? Yeah, there was a there was a statement that uh, Mrs. Kowalski was making talking about inappropriate subjects with Maya during the supervised calls, including talking about the medical care and the lawyers. This might be a little bit easier to do with the transcript, but that's the subject. Um, and then a statement about that if Maya came home, he would have his wife move out. So there's about a half dozen and If statements. Maya came home, what? That he would have his wife move out. We don't believe that those statements are relevant to any pending claim in this lawsuit. The, the police interview, the detective's interview in the hospital, mm -hmm. was not part of our negligent infliction claim, which Jack no longer has. It's not part of our intentional infliction claim. It's not part of our medical malpractice claim, our battery claim, or our false imprisonment claim. So it doesn't go to any pending issue in this lawsuit. It's it's uh, part and parcel of the Chapter 39 proceeding, uh, so we object on all those bases. Uh, and 403, additionally, I don't believe uh, Jack Kowalski representing uh, what Beata Kowalski may or may not have done qualifies as a party admission. And I'll, I'll point out additionally that um, we did have at one time malicious prosecution claim, abusive process claim, and Chapter 39 false reporting, all of which were uh, dismissed on summary judgment. So with those no longer in the case, we don't see how this is relevant. Your Honor, I know you're looking. Some of this might be easier if I can give you the page lines, because none of this is a mystery. You can actually see... What the, what the audio is going to sound like. Well, the audio is not in evidence, right? Uh, no, and I don't plan on putting the whole audio in evidence, but um, I can do it either way. I thought that I think it is a, uh, a statement by a party opponent, and I did plan on playing the audio in conjunction with their answer. I'm obviously not going to move the audio in evidence, but I believe I can publish the, well, I do believe I can publish the audio and move it in evidence in that regard, yes. Well, you're not publishing anything unless it's in evidence. Right. I apologize for the statement. Yes, I do believe we can move the audio with the evidence as a statement by a party opponent. Clips of the audio. I do not plan on putting in the two-hour plus interview. I was going to select, like I said, somewhere between five to seven clips in total. There was, there was one other one in addition where, and it's very important to our case, where Mr. Kowalski had told Detective Graham that he was in favor of staying at All Children's Hospital after that team meeting that was described, I believe, by Nurse Quink and Dr. Tappa on October 11th, where he says, I was in support of staying. Um, so that would be the other one that I would uh, tend to elicit. I don't know if Your Honor wants to go through each one with page line. I can have someone try to pull it up or what your preferences are to do in the morning. I, anything else, Mr. Whitney? <laughs> Yeah, it's the stigma of having a police officer come in. So well, that adds to the it, it's the veneer. Additionally, for the appear here on the stand to, to buttress this argument that Mr. Kowalski was doing something improper. And we had not explored yet the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Surreptitiously recorded. Um, so, well, he, he, here's where I'm at. The statements are statements against against the interest. They go to issues that remain in the case, and they are relevant. So, uh, certainly, you're going to be able to call the detective and elicit those statements. We can talk about the clips in the morning, but the plaintiffs will be able to cross examine as to whether this was done covertly, not covertly, you know, that she was wearing guns and all, all of that stuff on cross-examination. But yes, you will be able to elicit those statements. Anything else? Uh, 
We may ask for a proffer because it's going to get very dangerously close to Chapter 39, dependency proceedings territory. And we, the dependency proceedings are full of party admissions by the hospital, which we haven't been allowed to explore. We think this is part of the Chapter 39 process. Well, I am confident uh, there's going to be very specific question and answer page and line or, or, or pieces of the clips that we'll be able to have in isolation um, and then we can call it, but, but generally speaking, what Mr. Shapiro was describing will be uh, allowed as uh, statements against interest, um, and so it's an exception to the hearsay. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, does the defense know if Detective Graham or Patrolman Graham will appear in uniform? If so, we'd object. Oh, no, I don't think she is. She's retired since March of this year. I don't know if she says you're for my time to come dress professional. Well, I think she's coming in with us or something like that. Okay. Anything else? Uh, we, uh, we, had, we had additionally the curative instruction I tried to bring up earlier regarding the... Have it written out. I'm sorry? Have it written out and we can... It's, it's, in, it's, in, our, it's in our motion. Uh, I'm sorry. We'll bring it in tomorrow. Have it written out. We'll do. Uh, Judge, I'm going to suggest that um, it was 80% defense and 20%. Are you guys going to go Dr. Kohlberg? 80-20. Fine. Yeah. Are, are you planning on playing tomorrow? Walford? No, I don't believe so. Okay. So, so for, for that 15 minutes and 40 minutes? Yes. Is that 80 20? No, no, I'm going to try to get out of here a little earlier tomorrow. We'll, we'll do 10 and 45. Thank you. That? Appreciate that. We'll, we'll, we'll shave that five minutes there for you, Mr. Whitney. Uh, we might need it. That, might? Just, I was trying to pull the hook on Mr. Anderson several times, so we, we appreciate the five minutes. No, it, because I did not cross on the second witness. <laughs> <laughs> so that means. The timing um, today, plaintiffs use an hour, 40 minutes. That puts you at 48 hours, 15 minutes. Defense use three hours, 15 minutes, which places you at 22 hours, 50, or sorry, 22 hours, five minutes. Okay, and what was the next thing, Mr. Anderson? Oh, uh, I was going to try to get out of here early. It's my daughter's 12th birthday, and uh, I haven't seen them in a very long time. So I was just trying to figure out what was going to happen in the afternoon. And was there any chance that Officer Graham can make it earlier? Are we doomed to after I, lunch? I don't know the answer to that. I was playing Dr. Kornberg. <coughs> as I leave court, I will call her decision. Yeah, as she's I've retired. got a meeting at lunch, so we there's... We've got to take lunch tomorrow, but I'm serious, 8.15 tomorrow, and then we're going to go until 6 o'clock, and then we're going to start assessing as to whether we're going to be coming in early, whether we're going to do nights, weekends, but we've got to pick it up. Your Honor. And I, I know you all need time to prepare, but we made a commitment to this jury as to the last day. And we need to keep that. One additional issue, if I may. The court pointed out that yesterday we displayed Exhibit 2571005 uh, and 2571004. Uh, 005 at the time was not in evidence. Uh, I discussed this with defense counsel. It's really just a close-up of 004, but we'd like to move 005 into evidence to clean that up. Was there any objection to that? No, no objection. So after the 45-second lineup, uh, it's no objection. So what number are we admitting in? 257-005. Okay, so admitted. Yeah, Make it so. Feet in the wheelchair. Anything else? I dare ask. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. Okay. 8.15 tomorrow morning. See you there.